Brienne. They came upon the first corpse a mile from the crossroads. He swung beneath the limb of a dead tree, whose blackened trunk still bore the scars of the lightning that had killed it. The carrion crows had been at work on his face, and wolves had feasted on his lower legs where they dangled near the ground. Only bones and rags remained below his knees. Along with one well-chewed shoe, half covered by mud and mold. "'What does he have in his mouth?' asked Padrick. Brienne had to steel herself to look. His face was grey and green and ghastly, his mouth open and distended. Someone had shoved a jagged white rock between his teeth. A rock or... "'Salt,' said Septon Maribald. Fifty yards farther on they spied the second body. The scavengers had torn him down, so what remained of him was strewn on the ground beneath a frayed rope looped about the limb of an elm. Brienne might have ridden past him unawares, if Dog had not sniffed him out and loped into the weeds for a closer smell. "'What do you have there, Dog?' Sir Hyle dismounted, strode after the dog, and came up with a half-elm. The dead man's skull was still inside it, along with some worms and beetles. "'Good steel,' he pronounced, "'and not too badly dented, though the lion's lost his head. "'Pod, would you like a helm?' "'Not that one. It's got worms in it.' "'Worms wash out, lad. You're squeamish as a girl.' Brienne scowled at him. "'It is too big for him. He'll grow into it.' "'I don't want to,' said Padrick. Sir Hyle shrugged and tossed the broken helm back into the weeds, lion crest and all. Dog barked and went to lift his leg against the tree. After that, hardly a hundred yards went by without a corpse. They dangled under ash and alder, beech and birch, larch and elm, hoary old willows and stately chestnut trees. Each man wore a noose around his neck and swung from a length of hempen rope, and each man's mouth was packed with salt. Some wore cloaks of grey or blue or crimson, though rain and sun had faded them so badly that it was hard to tell one colour from another. Others had badges sewn on their breasts. Brienne spied axes, arrows, several salmon, a pine tree, an oak leaf, beetles, bantams, a boar's head, half a dozen tridents. Broken men she realized, dregs from a dozen armies, the leavings of the lords. Some of the dead men had been bald and some bearded, some young and some old, some short, some tall, some fat, some thin. Swollen in death, with faces gnawed and rotten, they all looked to the same. On the gallows tree all men are brothers. Brienne had read that in a book though she could not recall which one. It was Hyle Hunt who finally put words to what all of them had realized. These are the men who raided salt pans. May the father judge them harshly, said Maribald, who had been a friend to the town's aged Septon. Who they were did not concern Brienne half so much as who had hanged them. The noose was the preferred method of execution for Beric Dondarrion and his band of outlaws, it was said. If so, the so-called Lightning Lord might well be near. Dog barked, and Septon Maribald glanced about and frowned. Shall we keep a brisker pace? The sun will soon be setting, and corpses make poor company by night. These were dark and dangerous men alive. I doubt that death will have improved them. There we disagree, said Sir Hyle. These are just the sort of fellows who are most improved by death. All the same, he put his heels into his horse, and they moved a little faster. Farther on, the trees began to thin, though not the corpses. The woods gave way to muddy fields, tree limbs to gibbets. Clouds of crows rose screeching from the bodies as the travelers came near, and settled again once they had passed. These were evil men, Brienne reminded herself, yet the sight still made her sad. She forced herself to look at every man in turn, 
searching for familiar faces. A few she thought she recognized from Harren Hall, but their condition made it hard to be certain. None had a hound's head helm, but few had helms of any sort. Most had been stripped of arms, armor, and boots before they were strung up. When Padrick asked the name of the inn where they hoped to spend the night, Septon Meribald seized upon the question eagerly, perhaps to take their minds off the grisly sentinels along the roadside. The old inn, some call it. There has been an inn there for many hundreds of years, though this inn was only raised during the reign of the first Jehiris, the king who built the king's road. Jehiris and his queen slept there during their journeys, it is said. For a time the inn was known as the Two Crowns in their honor, until one innkeep built a bell tower and changed it to the Bell Ringer Inn. Later it passed to a crippled knight named Long John Heddle, who took up ironworking when he grew too old to fight. He forged a new sign for the yard, a three-headed dragon of black iron that he hung from a wooden post. The beast was so big it had to be made in a dozen pieces, joined with rope and wire. When the wind blew, it would clank and clatter, so the inn became known far and wide as the Clanking Dragon. "'Is the dragon sign still there?' asked Padrick. "'No,' said Septon Maribald. "'When the smith's son was an old man, a bastard son of the fourth Egon, rose up in rebellion against his true-born brother, and took for his sigil a black dragon. These lands belonged to Lord Darry then, and his lordship was fiercely loyal to the king. The sight of the black iron dragon made him wroth, so he cut down the post, hacked the sign to pieces, and cast them into the river. One of the dragon's heads washed up on the quiet isle many years later, though by that time it was red with rust. The innkeep never hung another sign, so men forgot the dragon and took to calling the place the River Inn. In those days the trident flowed beneath its back door, and half its rooms were built out over the water. Guests could throw a line out their window and catch trout, it said. There was a ferry landing here as well, so travelers could cross to Lord Haraway's town and white walls. We left the trident south of here, and have been riding north and west, not toward the river, but away from it. Aye, my lady, the septon said. The river moved. Seventy years ago it was. Or was it eighty? It was when old Masha Heddle's grandfather kept the place. It was her who told me all this history. A kindly woman, Masha. Fond of sour leaf and honey cakes. When she did not have a room for me, she would let me sleep beside the hearth and she never sent me on my way without some bread and cheese and a few stale cakes. "'Is she the innkeep now?' asked Padrick. "'No. The lions hanged her. After they moved on, I heard that one of her nephews tried opening the inn again, but the wars had made the roads too dangerous for common folk to travel, so there was little custom. He brought in whores, but even that could not save him. Some lord killed him as well, I hear. Sir Hyle made a wry face. I never dreamed that keeping an inn could be so deadly dangerous. It is being common born that is dangerous, when the great lords play their game of thrones, said Septon Maribald. Isn't that so, dog? Dog barked agreement. So, said Padrick, does the inn have a name now? The small folk call it the Crossroads Inn. Elder brother told me that two of Masha Heddle's nieces have opened it to trade once again. He raised his staff. If the gods are good, that smoke rising beyond the hanged man will be from its chimneys. They could call the place the Gallows Inn, Sir Hyle said. By any name, the inn was large. Rising three stories above the muddy roads, its walls and turrets and chimneys made of fine white stone 
It glimmered pale and ghostly against the gray sky. Its south wing had been built upon heavy wooden pilings above a cracked and sunken expanse of weeds and dead brown grass. A thatch-roofed stable and a bell tower were attached to the north side. The whole sprawl was surrounded by a low wall of broken white stones overgrown by moss. At least no one has burned it down. At salt pans they had found only death and desolation. By the time Brienne and her companions were ferried over from the quiet isle, the survivors had fled and the dead had been given to the ground. But the corpse of the town itself remained, ashen and unburied. The air still smelled of smoke, and the cries of the seagulls floating overhead sounded almost human, like the lamentations of lost children. Even the castle had seemed forlorn and abandoned. Gray as the ashes of the town around it, the castle consisted of a square keep girded by a curtain wall built so as to overlook the harbor. It was closed tight as Brienne and the others led their horses off the ferry, nothing moving on its battlements but banners. It took a quarter hour of dog barking and Septon Maribald knocking on the front gate with his quarterstaff before a woman appeared above them to demand their business. By that time the ferry had departed and it had begun to rain. I am a holy Septon, good lady, Maribald had shouted up, and these are honest travelers. We seek shelter from the rain and a place by your fire for the night. The woman had been unmoved by his appeals. The closest inn is at the crossroads to the west, she replied. We want no strangers here. Be gone. Once she vanished, neither Maribald's prayers, dog's barks, nor Sir Hyle's curses could bring her back. In the end, they had spent the night in the woods, beneath a shelter made of woven branches. There was life at the crossroads inn, though. Even before they reached the gate, Brienne heard the sound, a hammering, faint but steady. It had a steely ring. A forge, Sir Hyle said. Either they have themselves a smith, or the old innkeep's ghost is making another iron dragon. He put his heels into his horse. I hope they have a ghostly cook as well. A crisp roast chicken would set the world aright. The inn's yard was a sea of brown mud that sucked at the hooves of the horses. The clang of steel was louder here, and Brienne saw the red glow of the forge down past the far end of the stables, behind an ox cart with a broken wheel. She could see horses in the stables, too, and a small boy was swinging from the rusted chains of the weathered gibbet that loomed above the yard. Four girls stood on the inn's porch watching him. The youngest was no more than two, and naked. The oldest, nine or ten, stood with their arms protectively about the little one. Girls, Sir Hyle called to them, run and fetch your mother. The boy dropped from the chain and dashed off toward the stables. The four girls stood fidgeting. After a moment one said, We have no mothers. And another added, I had one, but they killed her. The oldest of the four stepped forward, pushing the little one behind her skirts. "'Who are you?' she demanded. "'Honest travelers seeking shelter. My name is Brienne, and this is Septon Maribald, who is well known through the Riverlands. The boy is my squire, Padrick Payne. The knight, Sir Hyle Hunt.' The hammering stopped suddenly. The girl on the porch looked them over, where is only a ten-year-old can be. I'm Willow. Will you be wanting beds? Beds and ale, and hot food to fill our bellies, said Sir Hyle Hunt as he dismounted. Are you the innkeep? She shook her head. That's my sister Janie. She's not here. All we have to eat is horse meat. If you come for whores, there are none. My sister run them off. We have beds, though. Some feather beds, but more are straw. And all have fleas, I don't doubt, said Sir Hyle. Do you have coin to pay? Silver? Sir Hyle laughed. Silver? 
for a night's bed and a haunch of horse. Do you mean to rob us, child? We'll have silver, else you can sleep in the woods with the dead men. Willow glanced toward the donkey and the casks and bundles on his back. Is that food? Where did you get it? Maidenpool, said Maribald. Dog barked. Do you question all your guests this way? asked Sir Hyle. We don't have so many guests. Not like before the war. It's mostly sparrows on the roads these days. Or worse. Worse? Brienne asked. Thieves, said a boy's voice from the stables. Robbers! Brienne turned and saw a ghost. Renly! No hammer blow to the heart could have felt her half so hard. My lord? She gasped. Lord? The boy pushed back a lock of black hair that had fallen across his eyes. I'm just a smith. He is not Renly, Brienne realized. Renly is dead. Renly died in my arms, a man of one and twenty. This is only a boy. A boy who looked as Renly had the first time he came to Tarth. No, younger. His jaw is square, his brows bushier. Renly had been lean and lithe, whereas this boy had the heavy shoulders and muscular right arm so often seen on Smith's. He wore a long leather apron, but under it his chest was bare. A dark stubble covered his cheeks and chin, and his hair was a thick black mop that grew down past his ears. King Renly's hair had been that same coal black, but his had always been washed and brushed and combed. Sometimes he cut it short, and sometimes he let it fall loose to his shoulders, or tied it back behind his head with a golden ribbon, but it was never tangled or matted with sweat. And though his eyes had been that same deep blue, Lord Rennie's eyes had always been warm and welcoming, full of laughter, whereas this boy's eyes brimmed with anger and suspicion. Septon Maribald saw it too. We mean no harm, lad. When Masha Heddle owned this inn, she always had a honey cake for me. Sometimes she even let me have a bed, if the inn was not full. She's dead, the boy said. The lions hanged her. Hanging seems your favorite sport in these parts, said Sir Hyle Hunt. Would that I had some land hereabouts. I'd plant hemp sell rope, and make my fortune. All these children, Brienne said to the girl Willow, are they your sisters, brothers, kin and cousins? No. Willow was staring at her in a way that she knew well. They're just, I don't know. The sparrows bring them here sometimes. Others find their own way. If you're a woman, why are you dressed up like a man? Septon Maribald answered, Lady Brienne is a warrior maid upon a quest. Just now, though, she is in need of a dry bed and a warm fire. As are we all. My old bones say it's going to rain again, and soon. Do you have rooms for us? No, said the boy Smith. Yes, said the girl Willow. They glared at one another. Then Willow stomped her foot. They have food, Gendry. The little ones are hungry. She whistled, and more children appeared as if by magic. Ragged boys with unshorn locks crept from under the porch, and furtive girls appeared in the windows overlooking the yard. Some clutched crossbows, wound and loaded. They could call it Crossbow Inn, Sir Hyle suggested. Orphan Inn would be more apt, thought Brienne. What? You help them with those horses, said Willow. Will, put down that rock. They've not come to hurt us. Tansy, Pate, run get some wood to feed the fire. John Penny, you help the Septon with those bundles. I'll show them to some rooms. In the end, they took three rooms adjoining one another, each boasting a feather bed, a chamber pot, 
and a window. Brienne's room had a hearth as well. She paid a few pennies more for some wood. Will I sleep in your room or Sir Hiles? Padraig asked as she was opening the shutters. This is not the quiet aisle, she told him. You can stay with me. Come the morrow, she meant for the two of them to strike out on their own. Septim Narabald was going on to Nutton, Riverbend, and Lord Haraway's town, but Brienne saw no sense in following him any farther. He had dog to keep in company, and the elder brother had persuaded her that she would not find Sansa Stark along the trident. I mean to rise before the sun comes up, whilst Sir Hyle is still sleeping. Brienne had not forgiven him for High Garden, and as he himself had said, Hunt had sworn no vows concerning Sansa. Where will we go, sir? I mean, my lady. Brienne had no ready answer for him. They had come to the crossroads, quite literally, the place where the King's Road, the River Road, and the High Road all came together. The High Road would take them east, through the mountains to the Vale of Arran, where Lady Sansa's aunt had ruled until her death. West ran the River Road, which followed the course of the Red Fork to River Run, and Sansa's great-uncle, who was besieged but still alive. Or they could ride the King's Road north, past the Twins and through the Neck with its bogs and marshes. If she could find a way past Moat Caelan, and whoever held it now, the King's Road would bring them all the way to Winterfell. Or I could take the King's Road south, Brienne thought, I could slink back to King's Landing, confess my failure to Sir Jamie, give him back his sword, and find a ship to carry me home to Tarth, as the elder brother urged. The thought was a bitter one, yet there was part of her that yearned for Evenfall and her father, and another part that wondered if Jamie would comfort her should she weep upon his shoulder. That was what men wanted, wasn't it? Soft, helpless women that they needed to protect. Sir, my lady, I asked where are we going? Down to the common room to supper. The common room was crawling with children. Brienne tried to count them, but they would not stand still even for an instant, so she counted some of them twice or thrice, and others not at all, until she finally gave it up. They had pushed the tables together in three long rows, and the older boys were resting benches from the back. Older here meant ten or twelve. Gendry was the closest thing to a man grown, but it was Willow shouting all the orders, as if she were a queen in her castle and the other children were no more than servants. If she were highborn, command would come naturally to her, and deference to them. Brienne wondered whether Willow might be more than she appeared. The girl was too young and too plain to be Sansa Stark, but she was of the right age to be the younger sister, and even Lady Caitlin had said that Arya lacked her sister's beauty. Brown hair, brown eyes, skinny. Could it be? Arya Stark's hair was brown, she recalled, but Brienne was not sure of the color of her eyes. Brown and brown, was that it? Could it be that she did not die at salt pans after all? Outside, the last light of day was fading. Inside, Willow had four greasy tallow candles lit and told the girls to keep the hearth fire burning high and hot. The boys helped Padrick Payne unpack the donkey and carried in the salt cod, mutton, vegetables, nuts, and wheels of cheese, whilst Septon Maribald repaired to the kitchens to take charge of the porridge. Alas, my oranges are gone, and I doubt that I shall see another till the spring, he told one small boy. Have you ever had an orange, lad? Squeezed one, and sucked down that fine juice? When the boy shook his head no, the septon mussed his hair. Then I'll bring you one, come spring, if you will be a good lad, and help me stir the porridge. Sir Hyle pulled off his boots to warm his feet by the fire. When Brienne sat down next to him, he nodded at the far end of the room. There are bloodstains on the floor over there where dog is sniffing. 
They've been scrubbed, but the blood soaked deep into the wood, and there's no getting it out. This is the inn where Sandor Clegane killed three of his brother's men, she reminded him. Tis that, Hunt agreed. But who is to say that they were the first to die here? Or that they'll be the last? Are you afraid of a few children? Four would be a few. Ten would be a surfeit. This is a cacophony. Children should be wrapped in swaddling clothes and hung upon the wall until the girls grow breasts and the boys are old enough to shave. I feel sorry for them. All of them have lost their mothers and fathers. Some have seen them slain. Hunt rolled his eyes. I forgot that I was talking to a woman. Your heart is as mushy as our septon's porridge. Can it be? Somewhere inside our sword's wench is a mother just squirming to give birth. What you really want is a sweet pink babe to suckle at your teat. Sir Hyle grinned. You need a man for that, I hear. A husband, preferably. Why not me? If you still hope to win your wager, what I want to win is you, Lord Selwyn's only living child. I've known men to wed lackwits and suckling babes for prizes a tenth the size of Tarth. I am not Rennie Baratheon, I confess it, but I have the virtue of being still amongst the living. Some would say that is my only virtue. Marriage would serve the both of us. Lands for me, and a castle full of these for you. He waved his hand at the children. I am capable, I assure you. I've sired at least one bastard that I know of. Have no fear, I shan't inflict her upon you. The last time I went to see her, her mother doused me with a kettle of soup. A flush crept up her neck. My father's only four and fifty, not too old to wed again and get a son by his new wife. That's a risk, if your father weds again, and if his bride proves fertile, and if the babe's a boy. I've made worse wagers, and lost them. Play your game with someone else, sir. So speaks a maid who has never played the game with anyone. Once you do, you take a different view. In the dark, you'd be as beautiful as any other woman. Your lips were made for kissing. They are lips, said Brienne. All lips are the same. And all lips are made for kissing, Hunt agreed pleasantly. Leave your chamber door unbarred tonight, and I will steal into your bed and prove the truth of what I say. If you do, you'll be a eunuch when you leave. Brienne got up and walked away from him. Septon Maribald asked if he might lead the children in a grace, ignoring the small girl crawling naked across the table. I, said Willow, snatching up the crawler before she reached the porridge. So they bowed their heads together and thanked the father and the mother for their bounty. All but the black-haired boy from the forge, who crossed his arms against his chest and sat glowering as the others prayed. Brienne was not the only one to notice. When the prayer was done, Septon Maribald looked across the table and said, Do you have no love for the gods, son? Not for your gods, Gendry stood abruptly. I have work to do. He stalked out without a bite of food. Is there some other god he loves? asked Hyle Hunt. The Lord of Light, piped one scrawny boy, nigh to six. Willow hit him with her spoon. Ben, big mouth, there's food. You should be eating it, not bothering the lords with talk. The children fell upon the supper like wolves upon a wounded deer, quarreling over codfish, tearing the barley bread to pieces, and getting porridge everywhere. Even the huge wheel of cheese did not long survive. Brienne contented herself with fish and bread and carrots, whilst Septon Maribald fed two morsels to dog for every one he ate himself. Outside, a rain began to fall. Inside, the fire crackled, and the common room was filled by the sounds of chewing and willow-smacking children with her spoon. 
One day that little girl will make some man a frightful wife. Sir Hyle observed, That poor prentice boy, most like. Someone should take him some food before it's all gone. You're someone. She wrapped a wedge of cheese, a heel of bread, a dried apple, and two chunks of flaky fried cod in a square of cloth. When Padrick got up to follow her outside, she told him to sit back down and eat. I will not be long. The rain was coming down heavy in the yard. Granny covered the food with a fold of her cloak. Some of the horses whinnied at her as she made her way past the stables. They are hungry, too. Gendry was at his forge, bare-chested beneath his leather apron. He was beating on a sword as if he wished it were a foe, his sweat-soaked hair falling across his brow. She watched him for a moment. He has Renly's eyes and Renly's hair, but not his build. Lord Renly was more lithe than brawny, not like his brother Robert, whose strength was fabled. It was not until he stopped to wipe his brow that Gendry saw her standing there. What do you want? I brought supper. She opened the cloth for him to see. If I wanted food, I would have eaten some. A smith needs to eat to keep his strength up. Are you my mother? No. She put down the food. Who was your mother? What's that to you? You were born in King's Landing. The way he spoke made her certain of it. Me and many more. He plunged the sword into a tub of rainwater to quench it. The hot steel hissed angrily. How old are you? Brienne asked. Is your mother still alive? And your father? Who was he? You ask too many questions. He set down the sword. My mother's dead and I never knew my father. You're a bastard. He took it for an insult. I'm a knight. That sword will be mine own once it's done. What would a knight be doing working at a smithy? You have black hair and blue eyes, and you were born in the shadow of the Red Keep. Has no one ever remarked upon your face? What's wrong with my face? It's not as ugly as yours. In King's Landing, you must have seen King Robert. He shrugged. Sometimes, at tourneys from afar, once at Baylor's Sept. The gold cloaks shoved us aside so he could pass. Another time I was playing near the mud gate when he came back from a hunt. He was so drunk he almost rode me down. A big fat sot he was, but a better king than these sons of his. They are not his sons. Stannis told it true. That day he met with Renly. Joffrey and Tommen were never Robert's sons. This boy, though. Listen to me, Brienne began. Then she heard dog barking loud and frantic. Someone is coming. Friends, said Gendry, unconcerned. What sort of friends? Brienne moved to the door of the smithy to peer out through the rain. He shrugged. You'll meet them soon enough. I may not want to meet them, Brienne thought, as the first riders came splashing through the puddles into the yard. Beneath the patter of the rain and dogs barking, she could hear the faint clink of swords and mail from beneath their ragged cloaks. She counted them as they came. Two, four, six, seven. Some of them were wounded, judging from the way they rode. The last man was massive and hulking, as big as two of the others. His horse was blown and bloody, staggering beneath his weight. All the riders had their hoods up against the lashing rain, save him alone. His face was broad and hairless, maggot white, his round cheeks covered with weeping sores. Brienne sucked in her breath and drew Oathkeeper. Too many, she thought, with a start of fear. They are too many. Gendry, she said in a low voice, you'll want a sword and armor. These are not your friends. They're no one's friends. What are you talking about? The boy came and stood beside her, his hammer in his hand. Lightning cracked to the south as the riders swung down off their horses. 
For half a heartbeat, darkness turned to day. An axe gleamed silvery blue. Light shimmered off mail and plate. And beneath the dark hood of the lead rider, Rieni glimpsed an iron snout and rows of steel teeth snarling. Gendry saw it, too. Him. Not him. His helm. Brienne tried to keep the fear from her voice, but her mouth was dry as dust. She had a pretty good notion who wore the hound's helm. The children, she thought. The door to the yin banged open. Willow stepped out into the rain, a crossbow in her hands. The girl was shouting at the riders, but a clap of thunder rolled across the yard, drowning out her words. As it faded, Brienne heard the man in the hound's helm say, Loose a quarrel at me, and I'll shove that crossbow up your cunt and fuck you with it. Then I'll pop your fucking eyes out and make you eat them. The fury in the man's voice drove Willow back a step, trembling. Seven, Rieni thought again, despairing. She had no chance against Seven, she knew. No chance and no choice. She stepped out into the rain, both keeper in hand. Leave her be. If you want to rape someone, try me. The outlaws turned as one. One laughed, and another said something in a tongue Brienne did not know. The huge one with the broad white face gave a malevolent hiss. The man in the hound's helm began to laugh. You're even uglier than I remembered. I'd sooner rape your horse. Horses, that's what we want, one of the wounded men said. Fresh horses and some food. There are outlaws after us. Give us your horses and we'll be gone. We won't do you harm. Fuck that, the outlaw in the hound's helm yanked a battle axe off his saddle. I want to cut her bloody legs off. I'll set her on her stumps so she can watch me fuck the crossbow girl. With what? taunted Brienne. Shagwell said they cut your manhood off when they took your nose. She meant it to provoke him, and it did. Bellowing curses, he came at her, his feet sending up splashes of black water as he charged. The others stood back to watch the show, as she had prayed they might. Brienne stayed as still as stone, waiting. The yard was dark, the mud slippery underfoot. Better to let him come to me. If the gods are good, he'll slip and fall. The gods were not that good, but her sword was. Five steps, four steps. Now, Brienne counted, and Oathkeeper swept up to meet his rush. Steel crashed against steel as her blade bit through his rags and opened a gash in his chainmail, even as his axe came crashing down at her. She twisted aside, slashing at his chest again as she retreated. He followed, staggering and bleeding, roaring rage. Whore! he boomed. Freak, bitch! I'll give you to my dog to fuck you, bloody bitch! His axe whirled in murderous arcs, a brutal black shadow that turned silver every time the lightning flashed. Brienne had no shield to catch the blows. All she could do was slide back away from him, darting this way and that as the axe head flew at her. Once the mud gave way under her heel, and she almost fell, but somehow she recovered herself though the axe grazed her left shoulder that time and left a blaze of pain in its wake. "'You got the bitch!' one of the others called, and another said, "'Let's see her dance away from that one!' Dance she did, relieved that they were watching. Better that than have them interfere. She could not fight seven, not alone, even if one or two were wounded. Old Sir Goodwin was long in his grave, yet she could hear him whispering in her ear. "'Men will always underestimate you,' he said, "'and their pride will make them want to vanquish you quickly, lest it be said that a woman tried them sorely. Let them spend their strength in furious attacks whilst you conserve your own. Wait and watch, girl. Wait and watch.' She waited, watching, moving sideways, then backwards, then sideways again, slashing now at his face, now at his legs, now at his arm. His blows came more slowly, as his axe grew heavier. 
Brienne turned him so the rain was in his eyes and stepped back two quick steps. He wrenched his axe up once more, cursing, and lurched after her, one foot sliding in the mud. And she leapt to meet his rush, both hands on her sword hilt. His headlong charge brought him right onto her point, and Oathkeeper punched through the cloth and mail and leather and more cloth, deep into his bowels and out his back, rasping as it scraped along his spine. His axe fell from limp fingers, and the two of them slammed together. Brienne's face mashed up against the dog's head helm. She felt the cold, wet metal against her cheek. Rain ran down the steel in rivers, and when the lightning flashed again, she saw pain and fear and rank disbelief through the eye slits. Sapphires, she whispered at him, as she gave her blade a hard twist that made him shudder. His weight sagged heavily against her, and all at once it was a corpse that she embraced, there in the black rain. She stepped back and let him fall. And Biter crashed into her, shrieking. He fell on her like an avalanche of wet wool and milk-white flesh, lifting her off her feet and slamming her down into the ground. She landed in a puddle with a splash that sent water up her nose and into her eyes. All the air was driven out of her, and her head snapped down against some half-buried stone with a crack. No, was all that she had time to say, before he fell on top of her, his weight driving her deeper into the mud. One of his hands was in her hair, pulling her head back. The other groped for her throat. Oathkeeper was gone, torn from her grasp. She had only her hands to fight him off, but when she slammed a fist into his face, it was like punching a ball of wet white dough. He hissed at her. She hit him again, 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 smashing the heel of her hand into his eye, but he did not seem to feel her blows. She clawed at his wrists, but his grip just grew tighter, though blood ran from the gouges where she scratched him. He was crushing her, smothering her. She pushed at his shoulders to get him off her, but he was heavy as a horse, impossible to move. When she tried to knee him in the groin, all she did was drive her knee into his belly. Grunting, Biter tore out a handful of her hair. My dagger. Brienne clutched at the thought, desperate. She worked her hand down between them, fingers squirming under his sour, suffocating flesh, searching until they finally found the hilt. Biter locked both his hands about her neck and began to slam her head against the ground. The lightning flashed again, this time inside her skull. Yet somehow her fingers tightened, pulled the dagger from its sheath. With him on top of her, she could not raise the blade to stab, so she drew it hard across his belly. Something warm and wet gushed between her fingers. Biter hissed again, louder than before, and let go of her throat just long enough to smash her in the face. She heard bones crack, and the pain blinded her for an instant. When she tried to slash at him again, he wrenched the dagger from her fingers and slammed a knee down under her forearm, breaking it. Then he seized her head again and resumed trying to tear it off her shoulders. Brienne could hear dog barking, and men were shouting all about her, and between the claps of thunder she heard the clash of steel on steel. Sir Heil, she thought, Sir Heil has joined the fight. But all that seemed far away and unimportant. Her world was no larger than the hands at her throat and the face that loomed above her. The rain ran off his hood as he leaned closer. His breath stank like cheese gone rotten. Brienne's chest was burning, and the storm was behind her eyes, blinding her. Bones ground against each other inside of her. Biter's mouth gaped open impossibly wide. She saw his teeth, yellow and crooked, filed into points. When they closed on the soft meat of her cheek, she hardly felt it. She could feel herself spiraling down into the dark. I cannot die yet, she told herself. There is something I still need to do. Biter's mouth tore free, full of blood and flesh. He spat, grinned, and sank his pointed teeth into her flesh again. This time he chewed and swallowed. He is eating me, she realized but she had no strength left to fight him any longer. She felt as if she were floating above herself, watching the horror 
as if it were happening to some other woman, to some stupid girl who thought she was a knight. It will be finished soon, she told herself. Then it will not matter if he eats me. Fighter threw back his head and opened his mouth again, howling, and stuck his tongue out at her. It was sharply pointed, dripping blood, longer than any tongue should be, sliding from his mouth out and out and out, red and wet and glistening, it made a hideous sight, obscene. His tongue is a foot long, Brienne thought, just before the darkness took her. Why, it looks almost like a sword. Jamie The brooch that fastened Sir Brendan Tully's cloak was a black fish, wrought in jet and gold. His ringmail was grim and grey, over it he wore greaves, gorget, gauntlets, pauldron, and polanes of blackened steel, none half so dark as the look upon his face as he waited for Jamie Lannister at the end of the drawbridge, alone atop a chestnut courser, caparisoned in red and blue. He loves me not. Tully had a craggy face, deeply lined and wind-burnt beneath a shock of stiff gray hair. But Jamie could still see the great knight who had once enthralled a squire with tales of the ninepenny kings. Honor's hooves clattered against the planks of the drawbridge. Jamie had thought long and hard about whether to wear his gold armor or his white to this meeting. In the end, he chosen a leather jack and a crimson cloak. He drew up a yard from Sir Brendan and inclined his head to the older man. Kingslayer, said Tully. That he would make that name the first word from his mouth spoke volumes. But Jamie was resolved to keep his temper. Blackfish, he responded. Thank you for coming. I assume you have returned to fulfill the oaths you swore my niece, Sir Brendan said. As I recall, you promised Caitlin her daughters in return for your freedom. His mouth tightened. Yet I do not see the girls. Where are they? Must he make me say it? I do not have them. Pity. Do you wish to resume your captivity? Your old cell is still available. We have put fresh rushes on the floor. And a nice new pail for me to shit in, I don't doubt. That was thoughtful of you, sir. But I fear I must decline. I prefer the comforts of my pavilion. Whilst Caitlin enjoys the comforts of her grave. I had no hand in Lady Caitlin's death, he might have said, and her daughters were gone before I reached King's Landing. It was on his tongue to speak of Brienne and the sword he'd given her, but the blackfish was looking at him the way that Edward Stark had looked at him when he'd found him on the Iron Throne with the Mad King's blood upon his blade. I came to speak of the living, not the dead, of those who need not die but shall. Unless I hand you River Run, is this where you threaten to hang Edmure? Beneath his bushy brows, Tully's eyes were stone. My nephew is marked for death, no matter what I do. So hang him and be done with it. I expect that Edmure is as weary of standing on those gallows as I am of seeing him there. Ryman Frey is a bloody fool. His mummer's show with Edmure and the gallows had only made the blackfish more obdurate. That was plain. You hold Lady Sybil Westerling and three of her children. I'll return your nephew in exchange for them. As you returned Lady Caitlin's daughters? Jamie did not allow himself to be provoked. An old woman and three children for your liege lord. That's a better bargain than you could have hoped for. Sir Brendan smiled a hard smile. You do not lack for gall, Kingslayer. Bargaining with oath-breakers is like building on quicksand, though. Cat should have known better than to trust the likes of you. It was Tyrion she trusted in, Jamie almost said. The imp deceived her, too. The promises I made to Lady Caitlin were wrung from me at sword-point. 
And the oath you swore to Eris? He felt his phantom fingers twitching. Eris is no part of this. Will you exchange the Westerlings for Edmure? No. My king entrusted his queen to my keeping, and I swore to keep her safe. I will not hand her over to a fray noose. The girl has been pardoned. No harm will come to her. You have my word on that. Your word of honor? Sir Brynden raised an eyebrow. Do you even know what honor is? A horse. I will swear any oath that you require. Spare me, Kingslayer. I want to. Strike your banners and open your gates, and I'll grant your men their lives. Those who wish to remain at River Run in service to Lord Evan may do so. The rest shall be free to go where they will, though I will require them to surrender their arms and armor. I wonder, how far will they get, unarmed, before outlaws set upon them? You dare not allow them to join Lord Berwick. We both know that. And what of me? Will I be paraded through King's Landing to die like Eddard Stark? I will permit you to take the black. Ned Stark's bastard is the Lord Commander on the wall. The blackfish narrowed his eyes. Did your father arrange for that as well? Caitlin never trusted the boy, as I recall, no more than she ever trusted Theon Greyjoy. It would seem she was right about them both. No, sir, I think not. I'll die warm, if you please, with a sword in hand, running red with lion blood. Tully blood runs just as red, Jamie reminded him. If you will not yield the castle, I must storm it. Hundreds will die. Hundreds of mine, thousands of yours. Your garrison will perish to a man. I know that song. Do you sing it to the tune of the reigns of Castamere? My men would sooner die upon their feet fighting than on their knees beneath a headsman's axe. This is not going well. This defiance serves no purpose, sir. The war is done, and your young wolf is dead. Murdered, in breach of all the sacred laws of hospitality. Phrase work, not mine. Call it what you will. It stinks of Tywin Lannister. Jamie could not deny that. My father is dead as well. May the father judge him justly. Now there's an awful prospect. I would have slain Rob Stark in the Whispering Wood if I could have reached him. Some fools got in my way. Does it matter how the boy perished? He's no less dead, and his kingdom died when he did. You must be blind as well as maimed, sir. Lift your eyes, and you will see that the dire wolf still flies above our walls. I've seen him. He looks lonely. Harren Hall has fallen, Seaguard and Maidenpool, the Brackens have bent the knee, and they've got Titus Blackwood penned up in Raven Tree. Piper, Vance, Wooten, all your bannermen have yielded. Only River Run remains. We have twenty times your numbers. Twenty times the men required, twenty times the food. How well are you provisioned, my lord? Well enough to sit here till the end of days, if need be, whilst you starve inside your walls. He told the lie as boldly as he could, and hoped his face did not betray him. The blackfish was not deceived. The end of your days, perhaps. Our own supplies are ample, though I fear we did not leave much in the fields for visitors. We can bring food down from the twins, said Jamie or over the hills from the west, if it comes to that. If you say so, far be it for me to question the word of such an honorable knight. The scorn in his voice made Jamie bristle. There is a quicker way to decide the matter. A single combat, my champion against yours. I was wondering when you would get to that. Sir Brynden laughed. Who will it be? Strongbore? Adam Marbrand? Black Walter Frey? He leaned forward. Why not you and me, sir? 
That would have been a sweet fight once. Jamie thought, fine fodder for the singers. When Lady Caitlin freed me, she made me swear not to take arms again against the Starks or Tullys. A most convenient oath, sir. His face darkened. Are you calling me a coward? No, I am calling you a cripple. The blackfish nodded at Jamie's golden hand. We both know you cannot fight with that. I had two hands. Would you throw your life away for pride? A voice inside him whispered. Some might say a cripple and an old man are well matched. Free me from my vow to Lady Caitlin, and I will meet you sword to sword. If I win, River Run is ours. If you slay me, we'll lift the siege. Sir Brendan laughed again. Much as I would welcome the chance to take that golden sword away from you and cut out your black heart, your promises are worthless. I would gain nothing from your death but the pleasure of killing you, and I will not risk my own life for that, as small a risk as that may be. It was a good thing that Jamie wore no sword. Elsewise, he would have ripped his blade out, and if Sir Brynden did not slay him, the archers on the walls most surely would. Are there any terms you will accept? he demanded of the blackfish. From you? Sir Brynden shrugged. No. Why did you even come to treat with me? A siege is deadly dull. I wanted to see this stump of yours and hear whatever excuses you cared to offer up for your latest enormities. They were feebler than I'd hoped. You always disappoint, King's Lair. The blackfish wheeled his mare and trotted back toward River Run. The portcullis descended with a rush, its iron spikes biting deep into the muddy ground. Jamie turned Honor's head about for the long ride back to the Lannister siege lines. He could feel the eyes on him, the Tully men upon their battlements, the phrase across the river. If they are not blind, they'll all know he threw my offer in my teeth. He would need to storm the castle. Well, what's one more broken vow to the Kingslayer? Just more shit in the bucket. Jamie resolved to be the first man on the battlements, and with this golden hand of mine, most like the first to fall. Back at camp, little Lou held his bridle whilst Peck gave him a hand down from the saddle. Do they think I'm such a cripple that I cannot dismount by myself? How did you fare, my lord? asked his cousin, Sir Davin. No one put an arrow in my horse's rump. Elsewise, there was little to distinguish me from Sir Ryman, he grimaced. So now he must needs turn the red fork redder. Blame yourself for that, Blackfish. You left me little choice. Assemble a war council. Sir Adam, Strongborn, Forley, Prester, those river lords of ours, and our friends of Frey. Sir Ryman, Lord Emmon, whoever else they care to bring. They gathered quickly. Lord Piper and both Lords Vance came to speak for the repentant lords of the Trident, whose loyalties would shortly be put to the test. The West was represented by Sir Davin, Strongbore, Adam Marbrand, and Forley Prester. Lord Emmon Frey joined them with his wife. Lady Jenna claimed her stool with a look that dared any man there to question her presence. None did. The Freys sent Sir Walter Rivers, called Bastard Walder, and Sir Ryman's firstborn Edwin, a pallid slender man with a pinched nose and lank dark hair. Under a blue lamb's wool cloak, Edwin wore a jerkin of finely tooled gray calfskin with ornate scrollwork worked into the leather. I speak for House Frey, he announced. My father is indisposed this morning. Sir David gave a snort. Is he drunk or just green sick from last night's wine? Edwin had the hard, mean mouth of a miser. Lord Jamie, he said, must I suffer such discourtesy? Is it true? Jamie asked him. Is your father drunk? Frey pressed his lips together and eyed Sir Illyn Payne, who was standing beside by the tent flap 
in his rusted mail, his sword poking up above one bony shoulder. He, my father, has a bad belly, my lord. Red wine helps with his digestion. He must be digesting a bloody mammoth, said Sir David. Strongbore laughed, and Lady Jenna chuckled. Enough, said Jamie. We have a castle to win. When his father sat in council, he let his captains speak first. He was resolved to do the same. How shall we proceed? Hang Edmure Tully for a start, urged Lord Emmon Frey. That will teach Sir Brendan that we mean what we say. If we send Sir Edmure's head to his uncle, it may move him to yield. Brendan Blackfish is not moved so easily. Carol Vance, the Lord of Wayfarer's Rest, had a melancholy look. A wine-stained birthmark covered half his neck and one side of his face. His own brother could not move him to a marriage bed. Sir David shook his shaggy head. We have to storm the walls, as I've been saying all along. Siege towers, scaling ladders, a ram to break the gate. That's what's needed here. I will lead the assault, said Strongbore. Give the fish a taste of steel and fire. That's what I say. They are my walls, protested Lord Emmon. And that is my gate you would break. He drew his parchment out of his sleeve again. King Tommen himself has granted me. We've all seen your paper, Uncle, snapped Edwin Frey. Why don't you go wave it at the blackfish for a change? Storming the walls will be a bloody business, said Adam Marbrand. I propose we wait for a moonless night and send a dozen picked men across the river in a boat with muffled oars. They can scale the walls with ropes and grapnels and open the gates from the inside. I will lead them, if the council wishes. Folly, declared the bastard Walter Rivers. Sir Brynden is no man to be cousined by such tricks. The blackfish is the obstacle, agreed Edwin Frey. His helm bears a black trout on his crest that makes him easy to pick out from afar. I propose that we move our siege towers close, fill them full of bowmen, and feign an attack upon the gates. That will bring Sir Brendan to the battlements, crest and all. Let every archer smear his shafts with night soil and make that crest his mark. Once Sir Brendan dies, River Run is ours. Mine, piped Lord Emmon. River Run is mine. Lord Carroll's birthmark darkened. Will the night soil be your own contribution, Edwin? A mortal poison, I don't doubt. The blackfish deserves a nobler death, and I'm the man to give it to him. Strongbore thumped his fist on the table. I will challenge him to single combat. Mace or axe or longsword makes no matter. The old man will be my meat. Why would he deign to accept your challenge, sir? asked Sir Forley Prester. What could he gain from such a duel? Will we lift the siege if he should win? I do not believe that, nor will he. A single combat would accomplish naught. I have known Brynden Tully since we were squires together in service to Lord Darry, said Norbert Vance, the blind Lord of Atranta. If it please, my lords, let me go and speak with him, and try to make him understand the hopelessness of his position. He understands that well enough, said Lord Piper. He was a short, rotund, bow-legged man with a bush of wild red hair, the father of one of Jamie's squires. The resemblance to the boy was unmistakable. The man's not bloody stupid, Norbert. He has eyes, and too much sense to yield to such as these. He made a rude gesture in the direction of Edwin Frey and Walter Rivers. Edwin bristled. If my lord of Piper means to imply it, I don't imply, Frey. I say what I mean straight out, like an honest man. But what would you know of the ways of an honest man? You're a treacherous lying weasel like all your kin. I'd sooner drink a pint of piss than take the word of any Frey. He leaned across the table. Where is Mark? Answer me that. What have you done with my son? He was a guest at your bloody wedding. And our honoured guest he shall remain, 
said Edwin, until you prove your loyalty to his grace, King Toman. Five knights and twenty men-at-arms went with Mark to the twins, said Piper. Are they your guest as well, Frey? Some of the knights, perhaps. The others were served no more than they deserved. You do well to guard your traitor's tongue, Piper, unless you want your heir returned in pieces. My father's counsels never went like this, Jamie thought, as Piper came lurching to his feet. Say that with a sword in your hands, Frey, the small man snarled, or do you only fight with smears of shit? Frey's pinched face went pale. Beside him, Walter Rivers rose. Edwin is no man of the sword, but I am, Piper. If you have more remarks to make, come outside and make them. This is a war council, not a war, Jamie reminded them. Sit down, the both of you. Neither man moved. Now! Walter Rivers seated himself. Lord Piper was not so easy to cow. He muttered a curse and strode from the tent. Shall I send men after him to drag him back, my lord? Sir David asked Jamie. Send Sir Illyn, urged Edwin Frey. We only need his head. Carol Vance turned to Jamie. Lord Piper spoke from grief. Mark is his firstborn son. Those knights who accompanied him to the twins were nephews and cousins all. Traitors and rebels all, you mean, said Edwin Frey. Jamie gave him a cold look. The twins took up the young wolf's cause as well, he reminded the phrase. Then you betrayed him. That makes you twice as treacherous as Piper. He enjoyed seeing Edwin's thin smile curdle up and die. I have endured sufficient counsel for one day, he decided. We're done. See to your preparations, my lords. We attack at first light. The wind was blowing from the north as the lords filed from the tent. Jamie could smell the stink of the fray encampments beyond the tumblestone. Across the water, Edmure Tully stood forlorn atop the tall gray gallows with a rope around his neck. His aunt departed last, her husband at her heels. Lord Nephew, Emmon protested, this assault on my seat. You must not do this. When he swallowed, the apple in his throat moved up and down. You must not. I I forbid it. He had been chewing sour leaf again. Pinkish froth glistened on his lips. The castle is mine. I have the parchment, signed by the king, by little Toman. I am the lawful lord of River Run, and— Not so long as Edmure Tully lives, said Lady Jenna. He is soft of heart and soft of head, I know. But alive, the man is still a danger. What do you mean to do about that, Jamie? It's the blackfish who is the danger, not Edmure. Leave Edmure to me. Sir Lyle, Sir Illyn, attend me, if you would. It's time I paid a visit to those gallows. The tumblestone was deeper and swifter than the Red Fork, and the nearest ford was leagues upstream. The ferry had just started across with Walter Rivers and Edwin Frey, when Jamie and his men arrived at the river. As they awaited its return, Jamie told them what he wanted. Sir Ellen spat into the river. When the three of them stepped off the ferry on the north bank, a drunken camp follower offered to pleasure Strongbore with her mouth. "'Here, pleasure my friend,' Sir Lyle said, shoving her toward Sir Ellen. Laughing, the woman moved to kiss pain on the lips, then saw his eyes, and shrank away. The paths between the cook fires were raw brown mud, mixed with horse dung, and torn up by hooves and boots alike. Everywhere Jamie saw the twin towers of House Frey displayed on shield and banners, blue on grey, along with the arms of lesser houses sworn to the crossing, the heron of Erinford, the pitchfork of Hay, Lord Charlton's three sprigs of mistletoe. The arrival of the Kingslayer did not go unnoticed. An old woman, selling piglets from a basket, stopped to stare at him. A knight with a half-familiar face went to one knee. And two men-at-arms, pissing in the ditch, turned and sprayed each other. 
Sir Jamie, someone called after him, but he strode on without turning. Around him he glimpsed the faces of men he'd done his best to kill in the whispering wood, where the phrase had fought beneath the direwolf manners of Rob Stark. His golden hand hung heavy at his side. Ryman Frey's great rectangular pavilion was the largest in the camp. Its gray canvas walls were made of sewn squares to resemble stonework, and its two peaks evoked the twins. Far from being indisposed, Sir Ryman was enjoying some entertainment. The sound of a woman's drunken laughter drifted from within the tent, mingled with the strains of a wood harp and a singer's voice. I will deal with you later, sir, Jamie thought. Walter Rivers stood before his own modest tent, talking with two men-at-arms. His shield bore the arms of House Frey, with the colors reversed, and a red bend sinister across the towers. When the bastard saw Jamie, he frowned. There's a cold, suspicious look, if ever I saw one. That one is more dangerous than any of his true-born brothers. The gallows had been raised ten feet off the ground. Two spearmen were posted at the foot of the steps. You can't go up without Sir Ryman's leave, one told Jamie. This says I can. Jamie tapped his sword hilt with a finger. The question is, will I need to step over your corpse? The spearman moved aside. Atop the gallows, the Lord of River Run stood staring at the trap beneath him. His feet were black and caked with mud, his legs bare. Edmure wore a soiled silken tunic, striped in tully red and blue, and a noose of hempen rope. At the sound of Jamie's footsteps, he raised his head and licked his dry, cracked lips. Kingslayer? The sight of Sir Illyn widened his eyes. Better a sword than a rope. Do it, Payne. Sir Illyn, said Jamie, you heard Lord Tully. Do it. The silent knight gripped his great sword with both hands. Long and heavy it was, sharp as common steel could be. Edmure's cracked lips moved soundlessly. As Sir Ellen drew the blade back, he closed his eyes. The stroke had all pain's weight behind it. No! Stop! No! Edwin Frey came panting into view. My father comes, fast as he can. Jamie, you must— My lord— would suit me better, Frey, said Jamie, and you would do well to omit must from any speech directed at me. So Ryman came stomping up the gallows steps in company with a straw-haired slattern as drunk as he was. Her gown laced up the front, but someone had undone the laces to the navel, so her breasts were spilling out. They were large and heavy, with big brown nipples. On her head a circlet of hammered bronze sat askew, graven with runes and ringed with small black swords. When she saw Jamie, she laughed. Who in seven hells is this one? The Lord Commander of the King's Guard, Jamie returned with cold courtesy. I might ask the same of you, my lady. Lady? I'm no lady. I'm the Queen. My sister will be surprised to hear that. Lord Ryman crowned me his very self. She gave a shake of her ample hips. I'm the Queen of Whores. No, Jamie thought. My sweet sister holds that title, too. Sir Ryman found his tongue. Shut your mouth, slut. Lord Jamie doesn't want to hear some harlot's nonsense. This fray was a thick-set man, with a broad face, small eyes, and a soft, fleshy set of chins. His breath stank of wine and onions. "'Making queens, Sir Ryman?' Jamie asked softly. "'Stupid. As stupid as this business with Lord Edmure. "'I gave the blackfish warning. "'I told him Edmure would die unless the castle yielded. "'I had this gallows built to show them that Sir Ryman Frey "'does not make idle threats. "'At Seaguard, my son Walter did the same with Patrick Malister, and Lord Jason bent the knee. But the Blackfish is a cold man. 
He refused us, so. You hanged Lord Edmure? The man reddened. My lord grandfather, if we hang the man, we have no hostage, sir. Have you considered that? Only a fool makes threats he's not prepared to carry out. If I were to threaten to hit you, unless you shut your mouth, and you presumed to speak, what do you think I'd do? Sir, you do not unders— Jamie hit him. It was a backhand blow, delivered with his golden hand. But the force of it sent Sir Ryman stumbling backward into the arms of his whore. You have a fat head, Sir Ryman, and a thick neck as well. Sir Ellen, how many strokes would it take you to cut through that neck? Sir Ellen laid a single finger against his nose. Jamie laughed. An empty boast. I say three. Ryman Frey went to his knees. I have done nothing but drink and whore. I know. I am heir to the crossing. You can't. I warned you about talking. Jamie watched the man turn white. A sot, a fool, and a craven. Lord Walter had best outlive this one, or the phrase are done. You aren't dismissed, sir. Dismissed? You heard me. Go away. But where should I go? To hell or home, as you prefer. See that you are not in camp when the sun comes up. You may take your queen of whores, but not that crown of hers. Jamie turned from Sir Ryman to his son. Edwin, I am giving you your father's command. Try not to be so stupid as your sire. That ought not pose much difficulty, my lord. Send word to Lord Walter. The crown requires all his prisoners. Jamie waved his golden hand. Sir Lyle, bring him. Edmure Tully had collapsed face down on the scaffold when Sir Ellen's blade sheared the rope in two. A foot of hemp still dangled from the noose about his neck. Strongbore grabbed the end of it and pulled him to his feet. A fish on a leash, he said shortly. There's a sight I never saw before. The phrase stepped aside to let them pass. A crowd had gathered below the scaffold, including a dozen camp followers in various states of disarray. Jamie noticed one man holding a wood harp. You, singer, come with me. The man doffed his hat. As my lord commands. No one said a word as they walked back to the ferry, with Sir Ryman's singer trailing after them. But as they shoved off from the riverbank and made for the south side of the tumblestone, Edmure Tully grabbed Jamie by the arm. Why? A Lannister pays his debts, he thought. And you're the only coin that's left to me. Consider it a wedding gift. Edmure stared at him with weary eyes. A wedding gift? I am told your wife is pretty. She'd have to be, for you to better while your sister and your king were being murdered. I never knew. Edmure licked his cracked lips. There were fiddlers outside the bedchamber. And Lady Rosalind was distracting you. She, they made her do it, Lord Walter and the rest. Rosalind never wanted... She wept, but I thought it was... The sight of your rampant manhood? Aye, that would make any woman weep, I'm sure. She is carrying my child. No, Jamie thought, that's your death she has growing in her belly. Back at his pavilion he dismissed Strongbore and Sir Illyn, but not the singer. I may have need of a song shortly, he told the man. Lou, heat some bath water for my guest. Pia, find him some clean clothing. Nothing with lions on it, if you please. Peck, wine for Lord Tully. Are you hungry, my lord? Edmure nodded, but his eyes were still suspicious. Jamie settled on a stool while Tully had his bath. The filth came off in gray clouds. Once you've eaten, my men will escort you to River Run. What happens after that is up to you. What do you mean? Your uncle is an old man. Valiant, yes, but the best part of his life is done. He has no bride to grieve for him, no children to defend. A good death 
is all the blackfish can hope for. But you have years remaining, Edmure, and you are the rightful lord of House Tully, not him. Your uncle serves at your pleasure. The fate of Riverrun is in your hands. Edmure stared. The fate of Riverrun? Yield the castle, and no one dies. Your small folk may go in peace, or stay to serve Lord Emmon. Sir Brendan will be allowed to take the black, along with as many of the garrison as choose to join him. You as well, if the wall appeals to you. Or you may go to Casterly Rock as my captive, and enjoy all the comforts and courtesy that befits a hostage of your rank. I'll send your wife to join you, if you like. If her child is a boy, he will serve House Lannister as a page and a squire. And when he earns his knighthood, we'll bestow some lands upon him. Should Boslin give you a daughter, I'll see her well dowered when she's old enough to wed. You yourself may even be granted parole, once the war is done. All you need do is yield the castle. Edmure raised his hands from the tub and watched the water run between his fingers. And if I will not yield, must you make me say the words? Pia was standing by the flap of the tent with her arms full of clothes. His squires were listening as well, and the singer. Let them hear, Jamie thought. Let the world hear. It makes no matter. He forced himself to smile. You've seen our numbers, Edmure. You've seen the ladders, the towers, the trebuchets, the rams. If I speak the command, my cuz will bridge your moat and break your gate. Hundreds will die, most of them your own. Your former bannermen will make up the first wave of attackers, so you'll start your day by killing the fathers and brothers of men who died for you at the twins. The second wave will be Frey's. I have no lack of those. My westermen will follow, when your archers are short of arrows and your knights so weary they can hardly lift their blades. When the castle falls, all those inside will be put to the sword. Your herds will be butchered, your god's wood will be felled, your keeps and towers will burn. I'll pull your walls down and divert the tumblestone over the ruins. By the time I'm done, no man will ever know that a castle once stood here. Jamie got to his feet. Your wife may help before that. You'll want your child, I expect. I'll send him to you when he's born. With a trebuchet. Silence followed his speech. Edmure sat in his bath. Pia clutched the clothing to her breasts. The singer tightened a string on his harp. Little Lou hollowed out a loaf of stale bread to make a trencher, pretending that he had not heard. With a trebuchet, Jamie thought. If his aunt had been there, would she still say Tyrion was Tywin's son? Edmure Tully finally found his voice. I could climb out of this tub and kill you where you stand, Kingslayer. You could try. Jamie waited. When Edmure made no move to rise, he said, I'll leave you to enjoy your food. Singer, play for our guest whilst he eats. You know the song, I trust. The one about the rain? Aye, my lord, I know it. Edmure seemed to see the man for the first time. No, not him. Get him away from me. Why, it's just a song, said Jamie. He cannot have that bad a voice. Circe. Grand Maester Picel had been old for as long as she had known him, but he seemed to have aged another hundred years in the past three nights. It took him an eternity to bend his creaky knee before her, and once he had, he could not rise again until Sir Osmond jerked him to his feet. Circe studied him with displeasure. Lord Kyburn informs me that Lord Giles has coughed his last. Yes, Your Grace. I did my best to ease his passing. Did you? The Queen turned to Lady Merriweather. I did say I wanted Bosby alive, did I not? 
You did, Your Grace. Sir Osmond, what is your recollection of the conversation? You commanded Grand Maester Pissell to save the man, Your Grace. We all heard. Pissell's mouth opened and closed. Your Grace must know I did all that could be done for the poor man. As you did for Joffrey, and his father, my own beloved husband. Robert was as strong as any man in the Seven Kingdoms, yet you lost him to a boar. Oh, and let us not forget John Arryn. No doubt you would have killed Ned Stark as well, if I had let you keep him longer. Tell me, Maester, was it at the Citadel that you learned to wring your hands and make excuses? Her voice made the old man flinch. No man could have done more, Your Grace. I, I have always given leal service. When you counseled King Eris to open his gates as my father's host approached, was that your notion of leal service? That I misjudged. Was that good counsel? Your Grace must surely know. What I know is that when my son was poisoned, you proved to be of less use than Moonboy. What I know is that the crown has desperate need of gold, and our Lord Treasurer is dead. The old fool seized upon that. I, I shall draw up a list of men suitable to take Lord Giles's place upon the council. A list? Circe was amused by his presumption. I can well imagine the sort of list you would provide me. Greybeards and grasping fools and Garth the Gross. Her lips tightened. You have been much in Lady Marjorie's company of late. Yes, yes, I... Queen Marjorie has been most distraught about Sir Loras. I provide her grace with sleeping draughts and other sorts of potions. No doubt. Tell me, was it our little queen who commanded you to kill Lord Giles? C kill Grand Maester Pissell's eyes grew as big as boiled eggs. Your Grace cannot believe. It was his cough by all the gods. I... Her Grace would not... She bore Lord Giles no ill will. Why would Queen Marjorie want him... Dead? Why to plant another rose on Tormund's council? Are you blind or bought? Rosby stood in her way, so she put him in his grave with your connivance. Your Grace, I swear to you, Lord Giles perished from his cough. His mouth was quivering. My loyalty has always been to the crown, to the realm, to, to House Lannister. In that order, Pissell's fear was palpable. He is ripe enough. Time to squeeze the fruit and taste the juice. If you are as leal as you claim, why are you lying to me? Do not trouble to deny it. You began to dance attendance on Maid Marjorie before Sir Loras went to Dragonstone. So spare me further fables about how you want only to console our good daughter in her grief. What brings you to the Maiden Vault so often? Not Marjorie's vapid conversation, surely. Are you courting that pox-faced scepter of hers? Diddling little Lady Bulwer? Do you play the spy for her, informing on me to serve her plots? I, I obey. A maester takes an oath of service. A grand maester swears to serve the realm. Your grace, she, she is the queen. I am a queen. I meant she is the king's wife, and I know who she is. What I want to know is why she has need of you. Is my good daughter unwell? Unwell? The old man plucked at the thing he called a beard, that patched growth of thin white hair sprouting from the loose pink wattles under his chin. Not unwell, Your Grace. Not as such. My oaths forbid me to divulge. Your oaths will be of small comfort in the black cells, she warned him. I'll hear the truth, or you'll wear chains. Pissell collapsed to his knees. I beg you, I was your lord father's man, and a friend to you in the matter of Lord Arryn. I could not survive the dungeons, not again. 
Why does Marjorie send for you? She desires... She... She... Say it! He cringed. Moon tea, he whispered. Moon tea for... I know what moon tea is for. There it is. Very well. Get off those saggy knees and try to remember what it was to be a man. Pissell struggled to rise, but took so long about it that she had to tell Osmond Kettleblack to give him another yank. As to Lord Giles, no doubt our father above will judge him justly. He left no children? No children of his body, but there is a ward not of his blood. Circe dismissed that annoyance with a flick of her hand. Giles knew of our dire need for gold. No doubt he told you of his wish to leave all his lands and wealth to Toman. Rosby's gold would help refresh their coffers, and Rosby's lands and castle would be bestowed upon one of her own as a reward for leal service. Lord Waters, perhaps. Lorraine had been hinting at his need for a seat. His lordship was only an empty honor without one. He had his eye on Dragonstone, Circe knew, but there he aimed too high. Rosby would be more suitable to his birth and station. Lord Giles loved his grace with all his heart, Bissell was saying, but his word will doubtless understand once he hears you speak of Lord Giles's dying wish. Go and see it done. If it please your grace, Grand Master Bissell almost tripped over his own robes in his haste to leave. Lady Merriweather closed the doors behind him. Moon tea, she said, as she turned back to the queen. How foolish of her! Why would she do such a thing? Take such a risk? The little queen has appetites that Toman is as yet too young to satisfy. That was always a danger when a grown woman was married to a child. Even more so with a widow. She may claim that Renly never touched her, but I will not believe it. Women only drank moon tea for one reason. Maidens had no need for it at all. My son has been betrayed. Marjorie has a lover. That is high treason, punishable by death. She could only hope that Mace Tyrell's prune-faced harridan of a mother lived long enough to see the trial. By insisting that Toman and Marjorie be wed at once, Lady Olenna had condemned her precious rose to a headsman's sword. Jamie made off with Sir Illyn Payne. I suppose I shall need to find a new king's justice to snick her head off. I'll do it, offered Usman Kettleblack with an easy grin. Marjorie's got a pretty little neck. A good and sharp sword will go right through it. It would, said Tana. But there is a Tyrell army at Storm's End, and another at Maidenpool. They have sharp swords as well. I am a wash in roses. It was vexing. She still had need of Mace Tyrell, if not his daughter. At least until such time as Stannis is defeated. Then I shan't need any of them. But how could she rid herself of the daughter without losing the father? Treason is treason, she said. But we must have proof, something more substantial than moon tea. If she is proved to be untrue, even her own lord father must condemn her, or her shame becomes his own. Kettleblack chewed on one end of his moustache. We need to catch them during the deed. How? Kyburn has eyes on her day and night. Her serving men take my coin, but bring us only trifles. Yet no one has seen this lover. The ears outside her door hear singing, laughter, gossip, nothing of any use. Marjorie is too shrewd to be caught so easily, said Lady Merriweather. Her women are her castle walls. They sleep with her, dress her, pray with her, read with her, sew with her. When she is not hawking or riding, she is playing come into my castle with little Alice Ann Bulwer. 
Whenever men are about, her scepter will be with her, or her cousins. She must rid herself of her hens sometime, the queen insisted. A thought struck her. Unless her ladies are part of it as well. Not all of them, perhaps, but some. The cousins? Even Tana sounded doubtful. All three are younger than the little queen, and more innocent. Wantons clad in maiden's white. That only makes their sins more shocking. Their names will live in shame. Suddenly the queen could almost taste it. Tana, your lord husband is my justiciar. The two of you must sup with me this very night. She wanted this done quickly, before Marjorie took it in her little head to return to Highgarden or sail to Dragonstone to be with her wounded brother at death's door. I shall command the cooks to roast a boar for us, and, of course, we must have some music to help with our digestion. Tana was very quick. Music! Just so. Go and tell your lord husband and make arrangements for the singer, Circe urged. Sir Osmond, you may remain. We have much and more to discuss. I shall have need of Kyburn, too. Sad to say, the kitchens proved to have no wild boar on hand, and there was not time enough to send out hunters. Instead, the cooks butchered one of the castle's sows and served them ham studded with cloves and basted with honey and dried cherries. It was not what Circe wanted, but she made do. Afterward they had baked apples with a sharp white cheese. Lady Tana savored every bite. Not so Orton Merriweather, whose round face remained blotched and pale from broth to cheese. He drank heavily and kept stealing glances at the singer. A great pity about Lord Giles, Circe said at last. I dare say none of us will miss his coughing, though. No, no, I think not. We shall have need of a new Lord Treasurer. If the veil were not so unsettled, I would bring back Peter Baelish, but I'm minded to try Sir Harris in the office. He can do no worse than Giles, and at least he does not cough. Sir Harris is the king's hand, said Tana. Sir Harris is a hostage, and feeble even at that. It is time that Toman had a more forceful hand. Lord Orton lifted his gaze from his wine cup. Forceful, to be sure. He hesitated. Who? You, my lord. It is in your blood. Your grandsire took my own father's place as hand to heiress, Replacing Tywin Lannister with Owen Merriweather had proved to be akin to replacing a destrier with a donkey, to be sure. But Owen had been an old, done man when Eris raised him, amiable if ineffectual. His grandson was younger, and— but he has a strong wife. It was a pity Tana could not serve his hand. She was thrice the man her husband was— and far more amusing. She was also mirish-born and female, however, so Orton must needs suffice. I have no doubt that you are more able than Sir Harris. The contents of my chamber pot are more able than Sir Harris. Will you consent to serve? I, yes, of course. Your grace does me great honor. A greater one than you deserve. You served me ably as justiciar, my lord, and will continue to do so through these trying times ahead. When she saw that Merriweather had grasped her meaning, the queen turned to smile at the singer. And you must be rewarded as well, for all the sweet songs you have played for us whilst we ate. The gods have given you a gift. The singer bowed. Your grace is kind to say so. Not kind, said Circe merely truthful. Tana tells me that you are called the Blue Bard. I am, Your Grace. The singer's boots were supple blue calfskin, his breeches fine blue wool. The tunic he wore was pale blue silk slashed with shiny blue satin. He had even gone so far as to dye his hair blue, 
in the Tairoshi fashion. Long and curly, it fell to his shoulders and smelled as if it had been washed in rose water. From blue roses, no doubt. At least his teeth are white. They were good teeth, not the least bit crooked. You have no other name? A hint of pink suffused his cheeks. As a boy, I was called Watt. A fine name for a plowboy, less fitting for a singer. The bluebird's eyes were the same color as Robert's. For that alone she hated him. It is easy to see why you are Lady Marjorie's favorite. Her grace is kind. She says I give her pleasure. Oh, I am certain of it. Might I see your lute? If it please your grace. Beneath the courtesy there was a faint hint of unease, but he handed her the lute all the same. One does not refuse the queen's request. Circe plucked a string and smiled at the sound. Sweet and sad as love. Tell me, what? The first time you took Marjorie to bed, was that before she wed my son, or after? For a moment he did not seem to understand. When he did, his eyes grew large. Your grace has been misinformed. I swear to you, I never— Liar! Circe smashed the lute across the singer's face so hard the painted wood exploded into shards and splinters. Lord Orton, summon my guards and take this creature to the dungeons. Orton Merriweather's face was damp with fear. This, oh, infamy! He dared seduce the Queen? I fear it was the other way around, but he is a traitor all the same. Let him sing for Lord Kyburn. The blue bard went white. No. Blood dripped from his lip where the loot had torn it. I never— When Merriweather seized him by the arm, he screamed, Mother, have mercy, no! I am not your mother, Circe told him. Even in the black cells, all they got from him were denials, prayers, and pleas for mercy. Before long, blood was streaming down his chin from all his broken teeth, and he wet his dark blue breeches three times over, yet still the man persisted in his lies. Is it possible we have the wrong singer? Circe asked. All things are possible, Your Grace. Have no fear. The man will confess before the night is done. Down here in the dungeons, Kyburn wore rough-spun wool and a blacksmith's leather apron. To the blue bard, he said, I am sorry if the guards were rough with you. Their courtesies are sadly lacking. His voice was kind, solicitous. All we want from you is the truth. I've told you the truth, the singer sobbed. Iron shackles held him hard against the cold stone wall. We know better. Kyburn had a razor in his hand, its edge gleaming faintly in the torchlight. He cut away the blue bard's clothing until the man was naked but for his high blue boots. The hair between his legs was brown, Circe was amused to see. Tell us how you pleasured the little queen, she commanded. I never. I sang, was all. I sang and played. Her ladies would tell you. They were always with us, her cousins. How many of them did you have carnal knowledge of? None of them. I'm just a singer, please. Kyburn said, Your Grace, mayhaps this poor man only played for Marjorie whilst she entertained other lovers. No, please. She never. I sang. I only sang. Lord Kyburn ran a hand up the blue bard's chest. Does she take your nipples in her mouth during your love play? He took one between his thumb and forefinger and twisted. Some men enjoy that. Their nipples are as sensitive as a woman's. The razor flashed. The singer shrieked. On his chest a wet red eye wept blood. Circe felt ill. Part of her wanted to close her eyes, to turn away, to make it stop. But she was the queen, and this was treason. 
Lord Tywin would not have turned away. In the end, the Blue Bard told him his whole life, back to his first name day. His father had been a chandler, and Watt was raised to that trade. But as a boy, he found he had more skill at making lutes than barrels. When he was twelve, he ran off to join a troupe of musicians he had heard performing at a fair. He had wandered half the reach before coming to King's Landing in hopes of finding favor at court. Favor? Kyburn chuckled. Is that what women call it now? I fear you found too much of it, my friend, and from the wrong queen. The true one stands before you. Yes. Cersei blamed Marjorie Tyrell for this. If not for her, Watt might have lived a long and fruitful life, singing his little songs and bedding pig girls and Crofter's daughters. Her scheming forced this on me. She has soiled me with her treachery. By dawn, the singer's high blue boots were full of blood, and he had told them how Marjorie had fondled herself as she watched her cousins pleasuring him with their mouths. At other times, he would sing for her whilst she sated her lusts with other lovers. Who were they? the queen demanded. And the wretched Watt named Sir Talad the Tall, Lambert Turnberry, Jalabar Show, the Red Wine Twins, Osney Kettleblack, Hugh Clifton, and the Knight of Flowers. That displeased her. She dare not besmirch the name of the hero of Dragonstone. Besides, no one who knew Sir Loras would ever believe it. The Red Wines could not be a part of it either. Without the arbor and its fleet, the Rum could never hope to rid itself of this Euron Crow's Eye and his accursed Ironman. All you are doing is spitting up the names of men you saw about her chambers. We want the truth. The truth. Mott looked at her with the one blue eye that Kyburn had left him. Blood bubbled through the holes where his front teeth had been. I might have misremembered. Horace and Hubber had no part of this, did they? No, he admitted. Not them. As for Sir Loras, I am certain Marjorie took pains to hide what she was doing from her brother. She did. I remember now. Once I had to hide under the bed when Sir Loras came to see her. He must never know, she said. I prefer this song to the other. Leave the great lords out of it. That was for the best. The others, though. Sir Talad had been a hedge knight. Jalabar Shaw was an exile and a beggar. Clifton was the only one of the little queen's guardsmen. And Osney is the plum that makes the pudding. I know you feel better for having told the truth. You will want to remember that when Marjorie comes to trial. If you were to start lying again. I won't. I'll tell it true. And after. You will be allowed to take the black. You have my word on that. Cersei turned to Kyburn. See that his wounds are cleaned and dressed, and give him milk of the poppy for the pain. Your grace is good. Kyburn dropped the bloody razor into a pail of vinegar. Marjorie may wonder where her bard has gone. Singers come and go. They are infamous for it. The climb up the dark stone steps from the black cells left Circe feeling breathless. I must rest. Getting to the truth was wearisome work, and she dreaded what must follow. I must be strong. What I must do... I do for Toman and the realm. It was a pity that Maggie the Frog was dead. Piss on your prophecy, old woman. The little queen may be younger than I, but she has never been more beautiful, and soon she will be dead. Lady Merriweather was waiting in her bedchamber. It was the black of night, closer to dawn than to dusk. Jocelyn and Dorcas were both asleep, but not Tana. Was it terrible? she asked. You cannot know. I need to sleep, but fear to dream. Tana stroked her hair. It was all for Tillman. It was. I know it was. Cersei shuddered. My throat is raw. Be as sweet and pour me some wine. If it please you, that is all that I desire. Liar. 
She knew what Taina desired. So be it. If the woman was besotted with her, that would help ensure that she and her husband remained loyal. In a world so full of treachery, that was worth a few kisses. She is no worse than most men. At least there is no danger of her ever getting me with child. The wine helped, but not enough. I feel soiled, the queen complained as she stood beside her window, cup in hand. A bath will set you right, my sweet. Lady Merriweather woke Dorcas and Jocelyn and sent them for hot water. As the tub was filled, she helped the queen disrobe, undoing her laces with deft fingers and easing the gown off her shoulders. Then she slipped out of her own dress and let it puddle on the floor. The two of them shared the bath together, with Circe lying back in Tana's arms. Toman must be spared the worst of this, she told the Mirish woman. Marjorie still takes him to the sept every day, so they can ask the gods to heal her brother. Sir Loris still clung to life annoyingly. He is fond of her cousins as well. It will go hard on him to lose them all. All three may not be guilty, suggested Lady Merriweather. Why, it might well be that one of them took no part. If she was shamed and sickened by the things she saw, she might be persuaded to bear witness against the others. Yes, very good. But which one is the innocent? Allah. The shy one? So she seems. But there is more sly than shy in her. Leave her to me, my sweet. Gladly. Alone, the Blue Bard's confession would never suffice. Singers lied for their living, after all. Anna Tyrell would be of great help if Tana could deliver her. Sir Osney shall confess as well. The others must be made to understand that only through confession can they earn the king's forgiveness and the wall. Jalabar Shaw would find the truth attractive. About the rest, she was less certain. But Kyburn was persuasive. Dawn was breaking over King's Landing when they climbed from the tub. The Queen's skin was white and wrinkled from her long immersion. Stay with me, she told Tana. I do not want to sleep alone. She even said a prayer before she crawled beneath her coverlet, beseeching the mother for sweet dreams. It proved a waste of breath. As ever, the gods were deaf. Circe dreamt that she was down in the black cells once again, only this time it was her chained to the wall in place of the singer. She was naked, and blood dripped from the tips of her breasts, where the imp had torn off her nipples with his teeth. "'Please,' she begged, "'please, not my children. Do not harm my children.' Tyrion only leered at her. He was naked, too, covered with coarse hair that made him look more like a monkey than a man. "'You shall see them crowned,' he said, "'and you shall see them die.' Then he took her bleeding breast into his mouth and began to suck, and pain soared through her like a hot knife. She woke shuddering in Tana's arms. "'A bad dream,' she said weakly. "'Did I scream? I'm sorry.' Dreams turn to dust in light of day. Was it the dwarf again? Why does he frighten you so, this silly little man? He is going to kill me. It was foreseen when I was ten. I wanted to know who I would marry, but she said, She? The May guy. The words came tumbling out of her. She could still hear Malara Heatherspoon insisting that if they never spoke about the prophecies, they would not come true. She was not so silent in the well, though. She screamed and shouted. Tyrion is the Valonqar, she said. Do you use that word in mere? It's High Valyrian. It means little brother. She had asked Septa Saranella about the word after Molara drowned. Tana took her hand and stroked it. This was a hateful woman, old and sick and ugly. 
You were young and beautiful, full of life and pride. She lived in Lannisport, you said. So she would have known of the dwarf and how he killed your lady mother. This creature dared not strike you, because of who you were, so she sought to wound you with her viper's tongue. Could it be? Cersei wanted to believe it. Malara died, though, just as she foretold. I never wed Prince Regger. And Joffrey? The dwarf killed my son before my eyes. One son, said Lady Merriweather. But you have another, sweet and strong, and no harm will ever come to him. Never, whilst I live. Saying it, have to believe that it was so. Dreams turn to dust in light of day. Yes. Outside, the morning sun was shining through a haze of cloud. Cersei slipped out from under the blankets. I will break my fast with the king this morning. I want to see my son. All I do, I do for him. Tommen helped restore her to herself. He had never been more precious to her than he was that morning, chattering about his kittens as he dribbled honey onto a chunk of hot black bread fresh from the ovens. Sir Pounce caught a mouse, he told her, but Lady Whiskers stole it from him. I was never so sweet and innocent, Cersei thought. How can he ever hope to rule in this cruel realm? The mother in her wanted only to protect him. The queen in her knew he must go harder, or the iron throne was certain to devour him. Sir Pounce must learn to defend his rights, she told him. In this world, the weak are always the victims of the strong. The king considered that, licking honey off his fingers. When Sir Loris comes back, I'm going to learn to fight with lance and sword and morning star, the same way he does. You will learn to fight, the queen promised, but not from Sir Loris. He will not be coming back, Tormund. Marjorie says he will. We pray for him. We ask for the mother's mercy and for the warrior to give him strength. Eleanor says that this is Sir Loris's hardest battle. She smoothed his hair back, the soft golden curls that reminded her so much of Joff. Will you be spending the afternoon with your wife and her cousins? Not today. She has to fast and purify herself, she said. Fast? And purify? Oh, for Maiden's Day! It had been years since Circe had been required to observe that particular holy day. Thrice wed, yet she still would have us believe she is a maid. Demure in white, the little queen would lead her hens to Baylor's sept to light tall white candles at the maiden's feet and hang parchment garlands about her holy neck. A few of her hens, at least. On Maiden's Day, widows, mothers, and whores alike were barred from the septs, along with men, lest they profane the sacred songs of innocence. Only virgin maids could— Mother, did I say something wrong? Circe kissed her son's brow. You said something very wise, sweetling. Now run along and play with your kittens. Afterward, she summoned Sir Osney Kettleblack to her solar. He came in, sweating from the yard and swaggering. As he took a knee, he undressed her with his eyes, the way he always did. Rise, sir, and sit here next to me. You did me a valiant service once, but now I have a harder task for you. I and I have something hard for you. That must wait. She traced his scars lightly with the tips of her fingers. Do you recall the whore who gave these to you? I'll give her to you when you come back from the wall. Would you like that? It's you I want. That was the right answer. First, you must confess your treason. A man's sins can poison his soul if left to fester. I know it must be hard for you to live with what you've done. It is past time that you rid yourself of your shame. Shame? Osney sounded baffled. I told Osmond. Marjorie just teases. She never lets me do any more than— 
It is chivalrous of you to protect her. Circe broke in. But you are too good a knight to go on living with your crime. No, you must take yourself to the great sept of Baylor this very night and speak with the high septon. When a man's sins are so black, only his high holiness himself can save him from hell's torments. Tell him how you bedded Marjorie and her cousins. Osney blinked. What? The cousins, too? Mega and Eleanor, she decided. Never Allah. That little detail would make the whole story more plausible. Allah would sit weeping and plead with the others to stop their sinning. Just Mega and Eleanor? Or Marjorie, too? Marjorie, most certainly. She was the one behind it all. She told him all she had in mind. As Osney listened, apprehension slowly spread across his face. When she finished, he said, After you cut her head off, I want to take that kiss she never gave me. You may take all the kisses you like. And then the wall? For just a little while. Toman is a forgiving king. Osney scratched at his scarred cheek. Usually, if I lie about some woman, it's me saying how I never fucked them, and them saying how I did. This, I never lied to no high septon before. I think you go to some hell for that. One of the bad ones. The queen was taken aback. The last thing she expected was piety from a kettle black. Are you refusing to obey me? No. Osney touched her golden hair. The thing is, the best lies have some truth in them, to give them flavor, as it were. And you want me to go tell how I fucked a queen? She almost slapped his face. Almost. But she had gone too far, and too much was at stake. All I do, I do for Toman. She turned her head and caught Sir Osney's hand with her own, kissing his fingers. They were rough and hard, calloused from the sword. Robert had hands like that, she thought. Circe wrapped her arms about his neck. I would not want it said I made a liar of you, she whispered in a husky voice. Give me an hour, and meet me in my bedchamber. We waited long enough. He thrust his fingers inside the bodice of her gown and yanked, and the silk parted with a ripping sound so loud that Circe was afraid that half of the red keep must have heard it. Take off the rest before I tear that, too, he said. You can keep the crown on. I like you in the crown. The Princess in the Tower Hers was a gentle prison. Ariane took solace from that. Why would her father go to such great pains to provide for her comfort in captivity, if he had marked her for a traitor's death. He cannot mean to kill me, she told herself a hundred times. He does not have it in him to be so cruel. I am his blood and seed, his heir, his only daughter. If need be, she would throw herself beneath the wheels of his chair, admit her fault, and beg him for his pardon. And she would weep. When he saw tears rolling down her face, he would forgive her. She was less certain whether she would forgive herself. Ario, she had pleaded with her captor during the long, dry ride from the green blood back to Sunspear. I never wanted the girl to come to harm. You must believe me. Hota made no reply, except to grunt. Ariane could feel his anger. Dark Star had escaped him, the most dangerous of all her little group of plotters, he had outraced all his pursuers and vanished into the deep desert with blood upon his blade. You know me, Captain, Ariane had said as the leagues rolled past. You have known me since I was little. You always kept me safe, as you kept my lady mother safe when you came with her from Great Norvos to be her shield in a strange land. I need you now. I need your help. I never meant— what you meant does not matter, little princess, Ariohuta said. Only what you did. His countenance was stony. I am sorry. 
It is for my prince to command, for Hota to obey. Ariane expected to be brought before her father's high seat beneath the dome of leaded glass in the Tower of the Sun. Instead, Hota delivered her to the Spear Tower and the custody of her father's seneschal Ricasso and Sir Manfrey Martel, the castellan. Princess, Ricasso said, you will forgive an old blind man if he does not make the climb with you. These legs are not equal to so many steps. A chamber has been prepared for you. Sir Manfrey shall escort you there to await the prince's pleasure. The prince's displeasure, you mean? Will my friends be confined here as well? Ariane had been parted from Garin, Dre, and the others after capture, and Hota had refused to say what would be done with them. That is for the prince to decide, was all the captain had to say upon the subject. Sir Manfrey proved a bit more forthcoming. They were taken to the Planky Town, and will be conveyed by ship to Gaston Grey, until such time as Prince Durand decides their fate. Gaston Grey was a crumbling old castle, perched on a rock in the Sea of Dorne. A drear and dreadful prison, where the vilest of criminals were sent to rot and die. Does my father mean to kill them? Ariane could not believe it. All they did, they did for love for me. If my father must have blood, it should be mine. As you say, princess. I want to speak with him. He thought you might. Sir Manfrey took her arm and marched her up the steps, up and up, until her breath grew short. The spear tower stood a hundred and a half feet high, and her cell was nearly at the top. Ariane eyed every door they passed, wondering if one of the sand snakes might be locked within. When her own door had been closed and barred, Ariane explored her new home. Her cell was large and airy, and did not lack for comforts. There were mirish carpets on the floor, red wine to drink, books to read. In one corner stood an ornate Sivas table, with pieces carved of ivory and onyx, though she had no one to play with, even if she had been so inclined. She had a feather bed to sleep in, and a privy with a marble seat, sweetened by a basket full of herbs. This high up, the views were splendid. One window opened to the east, so she could watch the sun rise above the sea. The other allowed her to look down upon the Tower of the Sun and the winding walls and threefold gate beyond. The exploration took less time than it would have taken her to lace a pair of sandals but at least it served to keep the tears at bay for a time. Ariane found a basin and a flagon of cool water, and washed her hands and face, but no amount of scrubbing could cleanse her of her grief. Aris, she thought, my white knight. Tears filled her eyes, and suddenly she was weeping, her whole body racked by sobs. She remembered how Hota's heavy axe had cleaved through his flesh and bone, the way his head had gone spinning through the air. Why did you do it? Why throw your life away? I never told you to. I never wanted that. I only wanted... I wanted... I wanted... That night she cried herself to sleep, for the first time, if not the last. Even in her dreams she found no peace. She dreamt of Aris Oakhart caressing her, smiling at her, telling her that he loved her. But all the while the quarrels were in him, and his wounds were weeping, turning his whites to red. Part of her knew it was a nightmare, even as she dreamt it. Come morning, all of this will vanish, the princess told herself. But when morning came, she was still in her cell. Sir Aris was still dead. And Marcella? I never wanted that, never. I meant the girl no harm. All I wanted was for her to be a queen. If we had not been betrayed... Someone told, Hota had said. The memory still made her angry. Ariane clung to that, feeding the flame within her heart. Anger was better than tears, better than grief, better than guilt. 
Someone told. Someone she had trusted. Aris Oakhart had died because of that, slain by the traitor's whisper as much as by the captain's axe. The blood that had streamed down Marcella's face, that was the betrayer's work as well. Someone told. Someone she had loved. That was the cruelest cut of all. She found a cedar chest full of her clothes at the foot of her bed, so she stripped out of the travel-stained garb she had slept in and donned the most revealing garments she could find, wisps of silk that covered everything and hid nothing. Prince Duran might treat her like a child, but she refused to dress like one. She knew such garb would discomfort her father when he came to chastise her for making off with Marcella. She counted on it. If I must crawl and weep, let him be uncomfortable as well. She expected him that day, but when the door finally opened, it proved to be only the servants with her midday meal. When might I see my father? she asked, but none of them would answer. The kid had been roasted with lemon and honey. With it were grape leaves stuffed with a melange of raisins, onions, mushrooms, and fiery dragon peppers. I am not hungry, Ariane said. Her friends would be eating ship's biscuits and salt beef on their way to Gaston Grey. Take this away and bring me Prince Duran. But they left the food, and her father did not come. After a while, hunger weakened her resolve, so she sat and ate. Once the food was gone, there was nothing else for Ariane to do. She paced around her tower, twice and thrice and three times thrice. She sat beside the Savast table and idly moved an elephant. She curled up in the window seat and tried to read a book, until the words became a blur and she realized that she was crying again. Aris, my sweet, my white knight, why did you do it? You should have yielded. I tried to tell you, but the words caught in my mouth. You gallant fool. I never meant for you to die, or for Marcella. Oh, gods be good, that little girl. Finally, she crawled back into the feather bed. The world had grown dark, and there was little she could do but sleep. Someone told, she thought. Someone told. Garin, Dre, and Spotted Silva were friends of her girlhood, as dear to her as her cousin Tyeen. She could not believe they would inform on her. But that left only Darkstar, and if he was the betrayer, why had he turned his sword on poor Marcella? He wanted to kill her instead of crowning her. He said as much at Shandystone. He said that was how I'd get the war I wanted. But it made no sense for Dane to be the traitor. If Sir Gerald had been the worm in the apple, why would he have turned his sword upon Marcella? Someone told. Could it have been Sir Aris? Had the White Knight's guilt won out over his lust? Had he loved Marcella more than her, and betrayed his new princess to atone for his betrayal of the old? Was he so ashamed of what he'd done that he threw his life away at the green blood rather than live to face dishonor? Someone told. When her father came to see her, she would learn which one. Prince Durand did not come the next day, though, nor the day after. The princess was left alone to pace and weep and nurse her wounds. During the daylight hours she would try to read, but the books that they had given her were deadly dull. Ponderous old histories and geographies annotated maps, a dry-as-dust study of the laws of Dorne, the seven-pointed star, and lives of the High Septons, a huge tome about dragons that somehow made them about as interesting as newts. Ariane would have given much and more for a copy of Ten Thousand Ships, or the loves of Queen Nymeria, anything to occupy her thoughts and let her escape her tower for an hour or two, but such amusements were denied her. From her window seat she had only to glance out to see the great dome of gold and colored glass below her, where her father sat in state. He will summon me soon, she told herself. No visitors were permitted her beyond the servants. 
bores with his stubbly jaw, tall Timoth, dripping dignity, the sisters Mora and Melee, pretty little Cedra, old Belandra, who had been her mother's bedmaid. They brought her meals, changed her bed, and emptied the chamber pot beneath her privy. But none would speak with her. When she required more wine, Timoth would fetch it. If she desired some favorite food, figs or olives or peppers stuffed with cheese, she need only tell Bolandra, and it would appear. Mora and Malay took away her dirty clothes and returned them clean and fresh. Every second day a bath was brought for her, and shy little Cedra would soap her back and help her brush her hair. Yet none of them had a word for her, nor would they deign to tell her what was happening in the world outside her sandstone cage. Has Darkstar been captured? she asked Bors one day. Are they still hunting for him? The man only turned his back on her and walked away. Have you gone deaf? Ariane snapped at him. Come back here and answer me. I command it. Her only reply was the sound of a door closing. Timoth, she tried another day, what has become of Princess Marcella? I never meant for harm to come to her. The last she had seen of the other princess had been on their ride back to Sunspear. Too weak to sit a horse, Marcella had traveled in a litter, her head bound up in silken bandages where Dark Star slashed at her, her green eyes bright with fever. Tell me that she has not died, I beg you. What harm could come to my knowing that? Tell me how she fares. Timoth would not. Belandra, Arian said, a few days later. If you ever loved my lady mother, take pity on her poor daughter, and tell me when my father means to come and see me. Please, please. But Belandra had lost her tongue as well. Is this my father's notion of torment? Not hot irons or the rack, but simple silence? That was so very like Duran Martel that Ariane had to laugh, he thinks he is being subtle when he is only being feeble. She resolved to enjoy the quiet, to use the time to heal and fortify herself for what must come. It was no good dwelling endlessly on Sir Aris, she knew. Instead, she made herself think about the sand snakes, Tyene especially. Ariane loved all her bastard cousins, from prickly, hot-tempered Obara to little Loriza, the youngest, only six years old. Tyene had always been the one she loved the most, though, the sweet sister that she never had. The princess had never been close to her brothers. Quentin was off at Ironwood, and Tristane was too young. No, it had always been her and Tyene, with Garin and Dre and Spotted Silva. Nim would sometimes join them in their sport, and Cirilla was forever pushing in where she didn't belong, but for the most part, they had been a company of five. They splashed in the pools and fountains of the water gardens and rode into battle perched on one another's naked backs. She and Tyene had learned to read together, learned to ride together, learned to dance together. When they were ten, Ariane had stolen a flagon of wine, and the two of them had gotten drunk together. They shared meals and beds and jewelry. They would have shared their first man as well, but Dre got too excited and spurted it all over Tyene's fingers the moment she drew him from his britches. Her hands are dangerous. The memory made her smile. The more she thought about her cousins, the more the princess missed them. For all I know, they might be right below me. That night, Ariane tried pounding on the floor with the heel of her sandal. When no one answered, she leaned out a window and peered down. She could see other windows below, smaller than her own, some no more than arrow loops. Tyene, she called. Tyene, are you there? Obara? Nim? Can you hear me? Elaria? Anyone? Tyene! The princess spent half the night hanging out the window, calling till her throat was raw, but no answering shouts came back to her. That frightened her more than she could say. If the sand snakes were imprisoned in the spear tower, 
They surely would have heard her shouting. Why didn't they answer? If father has done them harm, I will never forgive him. Never, she told herself. By the time a fortnight had passed, her patience had worn paper thin. I will speak with my father now, she told Bors in her most commanding voice. You will take me to him? He did not take her to him. I am ready to see the prince, she told Timoth, but he turned away as if he had not heard. The next morning, Ariane was waiting beside the door when it opened. She bolted past Belandra, sending a platter of spiced eggs to crash against the wall, but the guards caught her before she'd gone three yards. She knew them, too, but they were deaf to her entreaties. They dragged her back to her cell, kicking and squirming. Ariane decided that she must needs be more subtle. Cedra was her best hope. The girl was young, naive, and gullible. Garin had boasted of betting her once, the princess recalled. The next time she bathed, as Cedra soaped her shoulders, she began to talk of everything and nothing. I know you have been commanded not to speak to me, she said, but no one told me not to speak to you. She spoke about the heat of the day and what she'd had last night for supper, and how slow and stiff poor Belandra was becoming. Prince Oberyn had armed each of his daughters, so they need never be defenseless. But Ariane Martel had no weapon but her guile. And so she smiled and charmed, and asked nothing in return of Cedra, neither word nor nod. The next day at supper she nattered at the girl again, as she was serving. This time she contrived to mention Garin. Cedra glanced up shyly at his name, and almost spilled the wine that she was pouring. So it is that way, is it? thought Ariane. During her next bath she spoke of her imprisoned friends, especially Garin. He's the one I fear for most, she confided to the serving girl. The orphans are free spirits. They live to wander. Garin needs sunshine and fresh air. If they lock him away in some dank stone cell, how will he survive? He will not last a year at Gaston Grey. Cedra did not reply, but her face was pale when Ariane rose from the water, and she was squeezing the sponge so tightly that soap was dripping on the mirish carpet. Even so, it was four more days and two more baths before the girl was hers. "'Please,' Sandra finally whispered, after Ariane had painted a vivid picture of Garin throwing himself from the window of his cell to taste freedom one last time before he died. "'You have to help him. Please don't let him die. "'I can do little and less so long as I am locked up here,' she whispered back. "'My father will not see me. You are the only one who can save Garin. Do you love him?' Yes, Cedra whispered, blushing. But how can I help? You can smuggle out a letter for me, said the princess. Will you do that? Will you take the risk? For Garin? Cedra's eyes got big. She nodded. I have a raven, Ariane thought triumphantly. But who to send her to? The only one of her conspirators to escape her father's net was Dark Star. By now, Sir Gerald might well have been taken, however. If not, he would surely have fled Dorne. Her next thought was of Garin's mother and the orphans of the Green Blood. No, not them. They must be someone with real power, someone who had no part of our plot, yet might have reason to be sympathetic to us. She considered appealing to her own mother but Lady Malario was far away in Norvos. Besides, Prince Duran had not listened to his lady wife for many years. Not her, either. I need a lord, one great enough to cow my father into releasing me. The most powerful of the Dornish lords was Anders Ironwood, the Blood Royal, Lord of Ironwood, and Warden of the Stoneway. But Ariane knew better than to look for help from the man who had fostered her brother Quentin. No. Dre's brother, Sir Desiel Dalt, 
had once aspired to marry her, but he was much too dutiful to go against his prince. Besides, whilst the knight of Lemonwood might intimidate a petty lord, he did not have the strength to sway the prince of Dorne. No. The same was true of Spotted Silver's father. No. Ariane finally decided that she had but two real hopes, Harmon Uller, Lord of Hellholt, and Franklin Fowler, Lord of Skyreach and Warden of the Prince's Pass. Half of the Ullers are half mad, the saying went, and the other half are worse. Ilaria Sand was Lord Harmon's natural daughter. She and her little ones had been locked away with the rest of the Sand Snakes. That would have made Lord Harmon wroth, and the others were dangerous when wroth. Too dangerous, perhaps. The princess did not want to put any more lives in danger. Lord Fowler might be a safer choice. The old hawk, he was called. He had never gotten on with Anders Ironwood. There was bad blood between their houses going back a thousand years, from when the Fowlers had chosen Martell over Ironwood during Nemeria's war. The Fowler twins were famous friends of Lady Nim as well, but how much weight would that carry with the old hawk? For days Ariane wavered as she composed her secret letter. Give the man who brings this to you a hundred silver stags, she began. That should ensure that the message was delivered. She wrote where she was and pleaded for rescue. Whoever shall deliver me from this cell, he shall not be forgotten when I wed. That should bring the heroes running. Unless Prince Doran had attainted her, she remained the lawful heir to Sunspear. The man who married her would one day rule Dorne by her side. Ariane could only pray that her rescuer would prove younger than the greybeards her father had offered her over the years. I want a consort with teeth, she had told him when she refused the last. She dare not ask for parchment for fear of rousing the suspicions of her captors. So she wrote the letter on the bottom of a page torn from the seven-pointed star and pressed it into Cedra's hand on her next bath day. There's a place beside the threefold gate where the caravans take on supplies before crossing the deep sand, Ariane told her. Find some traveler headed for the prince's pass and promise him a hundred silver stags if he will put this in Lord Fowler's hand. I will. Cedra hid the message in her bodice. I'll find someone before the sun goes down, Princess. Good, she said. Tell me how it went on the morrow. The girl did not return upon the morrow, however, nor on the day that followed. When it was time for Ariane to bathe, it was Mara and Malay who filled her tub and stayed to wash her back and brush her hair. "'Has Cedra taken ill?' the princess asked them, but neither would reply. "'She has been caught,' was all that she could think. "'What else could it be?' That night she hardly slept, for fear of what might come next. When Timoth brought her breakfast the next morning, Ariane asked to see Ricasso rather than her father. Plainly she could not compel Prince Duran to attend her, but surely a mere seneschal would not ignore a summons from the rightful heir to Sunspear. He did, though. "'Did you tell Ricasso what I said?' she demanded the next time she saw Timoth. "'Did you tell him I had need of him?' When the man refused to answer her, Ariane seized a flagon of red wine and upended it over his head. The serving man retreated, dripping his face a mask of wounded dignity. My father means to leave me here to rot, the princess decided, or else he is making plans to marry me off to some disgusting old fool and intends to keep me locked away until the bedding. Ariane Martel had grown up expecting that one day she would wed some great lord of her father's choosing. That was what princesses were for, she had been taught, though admittedly, her uncle Oberyn had taken a different view of matters. "'If you would wed, wed,' the Red Viper had told his own daughters. 
If not, take your pleasure where you find it. There's little enough of it in this world. Choose well, though. If you saddle yourself with a fool or a brute, don't look to me to rid you of him. I gave you the tools to do that for yourself. The freedom that Prince Oberyn allowed his bastard daughters had never been shared by Prince Doran's lawful heir. Ariane must wed. She had accepted that. Dre had wanted her, she knew. So had his brother Dezeal, the Knight of Lemonwood. Damon Sand had gone so far as to ask for her hand. Damon was bastard-born, however, and Prince Durand did not mean for her to wed a Dornishman. Ariane had accepted that as well. One year King Robert's brother came to visit, and she did her best to seduce him, but she was half a girl, and Lord Renly seemed more bemused than inflamed by her overtures. Later, when Hoster Tully asked her to come to River Run and meet his heir, she lit candles to the maid in thanks, but Prince Duran had declined the invitation. The princess might even have considered Willis Tyrell, crippled leg and all, but her father refused to send her to Highgarden to meet him. She tried to go, despite him, with Tyene's help, but Prince Oberyn caught them at Vaith and brought them back. That same year Prince Durand tried to betroth her to Ben Beesbury, a minor lordling who was eighty if he was a day, and as blind as he was toothless. Beesbury died a few years later. That gave her some small comfort in her present past. She could not be forced to marry him if he was dead. And the Lord of the Crossing had wed again, so she was safe from him as well. Elton Estremont is still alive and unwed, though. Lord Rossby and Lord Grandison as well. Grandison was called the Greybeard, but by the time she'd met him, his beard had gone snow white. At the welcoming feast, he had gone to sleep between the fish course and the meat. Dre called that apt, since his sigil was a sleeping lion. Garin challenged her to see if she could tie a knot in his beard without waking him, but Ariane refrained. Grandison had seemed a pleasant fellow, less querulous than Estremont, and more robust than Rosby. She would never marry him, however, not even if Hota stands behind me with his axe. No one came to marry her the next day, nor the day after, nor did Cedra return. Ariane tried to win Mora and Mele the same way, but it was no good. If she had been able to get either one alone, she might have some hope, but together the sisters were a wall. By that time the princess would have welcomed a touch of a hot iron or an evening on the rack. The loneliness was like to drive her mad. I deserve a headsman's axe for what I did, but he will not even give me that. He would sooner shut me away and forget I ever lived. She wondered if Maester Kelliot was drawing a proclamation to name her brother Quentin heir to Dorne. Days came and went, one after the other, so many that Ariane lost count of how long she had been imprisoned. She found herself spending more and more time abed, until she reached the point where she did not rise at all except to use her privy. The meals the servants brought grew cold, untouched. Ariane slept and woke and slept again, and still felt too weary to rise. She prayed to the mother for mercy and to the warrior for courage, then slept some more. Fresh meals replaced the old ones, but she did not eat them either. Once, when she felt especially strong, she carried all the food to the window and flung it out into the yard, so it would not tempt her. The effort exhausted her, so afterwards she crawled back into bed and slept for half a day. Then came a day when a rough hand woke her, shaking her by the shoulder. "'Little princess,' said a voice she'd known from childhood, "'up and dress. The prince has called for you.' Ariel Hota stood over her, her old friend and protector. He was talking to her. Ariane smiled sleepily. It was good to see that seamed, scarred face, and hear his gruff, deep voice 
in thick Norvashi accent. What did you do with Sedra? The prince sent her to the water gardens, Hota said. He will tell you. First, you must wash and eat. She must look a wretched creature. Ariane crawled from the bed, weak as a kitten. Have Mora and Malay prepare a bath, she told him. And tell Timoth to bring me up some food. Nothing heavy, some cold broth and a bit of bread and fruit. I said Hota. Never had she heard a sweeter sound. The captain waited without, whilst the princess bathed and brushed her hair, and ate sparingly of the cheese and fruit they'd brought her. She drank a little wine to settle her stomach. I am frightened, she realized, for the first time in my life. I am frightened of my father. That made her laugh until the wine came out her nose. When it was time to dress, she chose a simple gown of ivory linen, with vines and purple grapes embroidered around the sleeves and bodice. She wore no jewels. I must be chaste and humble and contrite. I must throw myself at his feet and beg forgiveness, or I may never hear another human voice again. By the time she was ready, dusk had fallen. Arian had thought that Hota would escort her to the Tower of the Sun to hear her father's judgment. Instead, he delivered her to the Prince's Solar, where they found Doran Martel seated behind a Sivas table, his gaudy legs supported by a cushioned footstool. He was toying with an onyx elephant, turning it in his reddened, swollen hands. The Prince looked worse than she had ever seen him. His face was pale and puffy, his joints so inflamed that it hurt her just to look at them. Seeing him this way made Ariane's heart go out to him. Yet, somehow, she could not bring herself to kneel and beg, as she had planned. Father, she said instead. When he raised his head to look at her, his dark eyes were clouded with pain. Is that gout? Ariane wondered. Or is it me? A strange and subtle folk, the Valentines, he muttered as he put the elephant aside. I saw Volantis once, on my way to Norvos, where I first met Malario. The bells were ringing, and the bears danced down the steps. Ariel will recall the day. I remember, echoed Ariel Huta in his deep voice. The bears danced and the bells rang, and the prince wore red and gold and orange. My lady asked me who it was who shone so bright. Prince Duran smiled wanly. Leave us, Captain. Hota stamped the butt of his long axe on the floor, turned on his heel, and took his leave. I told them to place a Sivas table in your chambers, your father said when the two of them were alone. Who was I supposed to play with? Why is he talking about a game? Has the gout robbed him of his wits? Yourself. Sometimes it is best to study a game before you attempt to play it. How well do you know the game, Ariane? Well enough to play. But not to win. My brother loved the fight for its own sake, but I only play such games as I can win. Sivas is not for me. He studied her face for a long moment before he said, Why? Tell me that, Ariane. Tell me why. For the honor of our house. Her father's voice made her angry. He sounded so sad, so exhausted, so weak. You are a prince, she wanted to shout. You should be raging. Your meekness Shames all Dorn, father. Your brother went to King's Landing in your place, and they killed him. Do you think I do not know that? Oberyn is with me every time I close my eyes. Telling you to open them, no doubt. She seated herself across the Xavas table from her father. I did not give you leave to sit. Then call Hota back and whip me for my insolence. 
You are the Prince of Dorn. You can do that. She touched one of the Savas pieces, the heavy horse. Have you caught Sir Gerald? He shook his head. Would that we had. You were a fool to make him part of this. Dark Star is the most dangerous man in Dorn. You and he have done us all great harm. Ariane was almost afraid to ask. Myrcella, is she dead? No, though Dark Star did his best. All eyes were on your white knight, so no one seems quite certain just what happened. But it would appear that her horse shied away from his at the last instant, as he would have taken off the top of the girl's skull. As it is, the slash opened her cheek down to the bone and sliced off her right ear. Maester Calliot was able to save her life, but no poultice nor potion will ever restore her face. She was my ward, Ariane, betrothed to your own brother, and under my protection. You have dishonored all of us. I never meant her harm, Ariane insisted. If Hota had not interfered, you would have crowned Marcella queen to raise a rebellion against her brother. Instead of an ear, she would have lost her life. Only if we lost. If. The word is when. Dorne is the least populous of the seven kingdoms. It pleased the young dragon to make all our armies larger when he wrote that book of his, so as to make his conquest that much more glorious. And it has pleased us to water the seed he planted and let our foes think us more powerful than we are. But a princess ought to know the truth. Valor is a poor substitute for numbers. Dorn cannot hope to win a war against the Iron Throne, not alone, and yet that may well be what you have given us. Are you proud? The prince did not allow her time to answer. What am I to do with you, Ariane? Forgive me, part of her wanted to say, but his words had cut her too deeply. Why, do what you always do. Do nothing. You make it difficult for a man to swallow his anger. Best stop swallowing. You're like to choke on it. The prince did not answer. Tell me how you knew my plans. I am the prince of Dorne. Men seek my favor. Someone told. You knew, and yet you still allowed us to make off with Marcella. Why? That was my mistake, and it has proved a grievous one. You are my daughter, Ariane, the little girl who used to run to me when she skinned her knee. I found it hard to believe that you would conspire against me. I had to learn the truth. Now you have. I want to know who informed on me. I would as well, in your place. Will you tell me? I can think of no reason why I should. You think I cannot discover the truth on my own? You are welcome to try. Until such time, you must mistrust them all. And a little mistrust is a good thing in a princess. Prince Doran sighed. You disappoint me, Ariane. Said the crow to the raven. You have been disappointing me for years, father. She had not meant to be so blunt with him, but the words came spilling out. There, now I have said it. I know I am too meek and weak and cautious, too lenient to our enemies. Just now, though, you are in need of some of that leniency, it seems to me. You ought to be pleading for my forgiveness rather than seeking to provoke me further. I ask leniency only for my friends. How noble of you! What they did, they did for love for me. They do not deserve to die on Gaston Grey. As it happens, I agree. Aside from Dark Star, your fellow plotters were no more than foolish children. Still, this was no harmless game of Sivas. 
you and your friends were playing at treason. I might have had their heads off. You might have, but you didn't. Dane, Dalt, Santigar? No, you would never dare make enemies of such houses. I dare more than you dream, but leave that for the nonce. Sir Andre has been sent to Norvos to serve your lady mother for three years. Garin will spend his next two years in Tyrosh. From his kin amongst the orphans, I took coin and hostages. Lady Silva received no punishment from me, but she was of an age to marry. Her father has shipped her to Greenstone to wed Lord Estremont. As for Aris Oakhart, he chose his own fate and met it bravely. A knight of the King's Guard. What did you do to him? I fucked him, father. You did command me to entertain our noble visitors, as I recall. His face grew flushed. Was that all that was required? I told him that once Myrcella was the queen, she would give us leave to marry. He wanted me for his wife. You did everything you could to stop him from dishonoring his vows, I am certain, your father said. It was her turn to flush. Her seduction of Sir Aris had required half a year. Though he claimed to have known other women before taking the white, she would never have known that from the way he acted. His caresses had been clumsy, his kisses nervous, and the first time they were abed together he spent his seat on her thigh as she was guiding him inside her with her hand. Worse, he had been consumed by shame. If she only had a dragon for every time he had whispered, We should not be doing this, she would be richer than the Lannisters. Did he charge at Ariohota in hopes of saving me? Ariane wondered. Or did he do it to escape me, to wash out his dishonor with his life's blood? He did love me, she heard herself say. He died for me. If so, he may well be but the first of many. You and your cousins wanted war. You may get your wish. Another King's Guard knight creeps toward Sunspear even as we speak. Sir Balan Swan is bringing me the mountain's head. My bannermen have been delaying him to purchase me some time. The wills kept him hunting and hawking for eight days on the Boneway, and Lord Ironwood feasted him for a fortnight when he emerged from the mountains. At present he is at the Tor, where Lady Jordani has arranged games in his honor. When he reaches Ghost Hill, he will find Lady Toland intent on outdoing her. Soon or late, however, Sir Balan must arrive at Sunspear, and when he does, he will expect to see Princess Myrcella, and Sir Aris, his sworn brother. What shall we tell him, Marianne? Shall I say that Oakheart perished in her hunting accident? or from a tumble down some slippery steps. Perhaps Aris went swimming at the water gardens, slipped upon the marble, hit his head and drowned? No, Ariane said. Say that he died defending his little princess. Tell Sir Balin that Darkstar tried to kill her, and Sir Aris stepped between them and saved her life. That was how the white knights of the King's Guard were supposed to die, giving up their own lives for those that they had sworn to protect. Sir Balan may be suspicious, as you were when the Lannisters killed your sister and her children, but he will have no proof until he speaks with Myrcella. Or must that brave child suffer a tragic accident as well? If so, it will mean war. No lie will save Dorn from the Queen's wrath if her daughter should perish whilst in my care. He needs me, Ariane realized. That's why he sent for me. I could tell Myrcella what to say, but why should I? A spasm of anger rippled across her father's face. I warn you, Ariane, I am out of patience. With me? 
that is so like him. For Lord Tywin and the Lannisters you always had the forbearance of Bela the Blessed, but for your own blood, none. You mistake patience for forbearance. I have worked at the downfall of Tywin Lannister since the day they told me of Elia and her children. It was my hope to strip him of all that he held most dear before I killed him, but it would seem his dwarf son has robbed me of that pleasure. I take some small solace in knowing that he died a cruel death at the hands of the monster that he himself begot. Be that as it may, Lord Tywin is howling down in hell, where thousands more will soon be joining him, if your folly turns to war. Your father grimaced, as if the very word were painful to him. Is that what you want? The princess refused to be cowed. I want my cousins freed. I want my uncle avenged. I want my rights. Your rights? Dorn. You will have Dorn after I am dead. Are you so anxious to be rid of me? I should turn that question back on you, father. You have been trying to rid yourself of me for years. That is not true. No? Shall we ask my brother? Tristain? Quentin? What of him? Where is he? He is with Lord Ironwood's host in the Boneway. You do lie well, father. I will grant you that. You did not so much as blink. Quentin has gone to Lys. Where did you get that notion? A friend told me. She could have secrets, too. Your friend lied. You have my word. Your brother has not gone to Lys. I swear it by sun and spear and seven. Marianne could not be fooled so easily. Is it mere, then, Tyrosh? I know he is somewhere across the narrow sea, hiring sellswords to steal away my birthright. Her father's face darkened. This mistrust does you no honor, Ariane. Quentin should be the one conspiring against me. I sent him away when he was just a child, too young to understand the needs of Dorn. Anders Ironwood has been more a father to him than I have, yet your brother remains faithful and obedient. Why not? You favor him, and always have. He looks like you, he thinks like you, and you mean to give him Dorn. Don't trouble to deny it. I read your letter. The words still burned as bright as fire in her memory. One day you will sit where I sit, and rule all Dorn. You wrote him. Tell me, father, when did you decide to disinherit me? Was it the day that Quentin was born, or the day that I was born? What did I ever do to make you hate me so? To her fury there were tears in her eyes. I never hated you. Prince Duran's voice was parchment-thin and full of grief. Ariane, you do not understand. Do you deny you wrote those words? No. That was when Quentin first went to Ironwood. I did intend for him to follow me, yes. I had other plans for you. Oh, yes, she said scornfully. Such plans. Giles Rosby. Blind Ben Beesbury. Greybeard Grandison. They were your plans. She gave him no chance to reply. I know it is my duty to provide an heir for Dorn. I have never been forgetful of that. I would have wed, and gladly, but the matches that you brought to me were insults. With every one you spit on me. If you ever felt any love for me at all, why offer me to Walder Frey? Because I knew that you would spurn him. I had to be seen to try to find a consort for you once you'd reached a certain age, else it would have raised suspicions. But I dared not bring you any man you might accept. You were promised, Ariane. Promised? Ariane stared at him incredulously. What are you saying? Is this another lie? You never said— the pact was sealed in secret. 
I meant to tell you when you were old enough, when you came of age. I thought, but I am three and twenty, for seven years a woman grown. I know. If I kept you ignorant too long, it was only to protect you. Ariane, your nature, to you a secret was only a choice tale to whisper to Garin and Tyene in your bed of a night. Garin gossips as only the orphans can, and Tyene keeps nothing from Obara and the Lady Nim. And if they knew, Obara is too fond of wine, and Nim is too close to the Fowler twins, and who might the Fowler twins confide in? I could not take the risk. She was lost, confounded. Promised. I was promised. Who is it? Who have I been betrothed to all these years? It makes no matter. He is dead. And left her more baffled than ever. The old ones are so frail. Was it a broken hip, a chill, the gout? It was a pot of molten gold. We princes make our careful plans, and the gods smash them all awry. Prince Duran made a weary gesture with a chafed red hand. Dorn will be yours. You have my word on that, if my word still has any meaning for you. Your brother Quentin has a harder road to walk. What road? Ariane regarded him suspiciously. What are you holding back? Seven save me, but I am sick of secrets. Tell me the rest, father. Or else name Quentin your heir, and send for Hota and his axe, and let me die beside my cousins. Do you truly believe I would harm my brother's children? Her father grimaced. Obara, Nim, and Tyene lack for nothing but their freedom, and Alaria and her daughters are happily ensconced at the water gardens. Doria stalks about knocking oranges off the trees with her morning star, and Elia and Obella have become the terror of the pools. He sighed. It has not been so long since you were playing in those pools. You used to ride the shoulders of an older girl, a tall girl with wispy yellow hair. Janie Fowler, or her sister Jenilyn. It had been years since Arianne had thought of that. Oh, and Frinny. Her father was a smith. Her hair was brown. Garin was my favorite, though. When I wrote Garin, no one could defeat us. Not even Nim and that green-haired Tyroshi girl. That green-haired girl was the Archon's daughter. I was to have sent you to Tyrosh in her place. You would have served the Archon as a cup-bearer and met with your betrothed in secret but your mother threatened to harm herself if I stole another of her children, and I—I I could not do that to her. His tale grows ever stranger. Is that where Quentin's gone? To Tyrosh, to court the Archon's green-haired daughter? Your father plucked up a savas piece. I must know how you learned that Quentin was abroad. Your brother went with Cletus Ironwood, Maester Kedry, and three of Lord Ironwood's best young knights, on a long and perilous voyage, with an uncertain welcome at its end. He has gone to bring us back our heart's desire. She narrowed her eyes. What is our heart's desire? Vengeance. His voice was soft, as if he were afraid that someone might be listening. Justice. Prince Duran pressed the onyx dragon into her palm with his swollen, gouty fingers and whispered, Fire and blood. Elaine. She turned the iron ring and pushed the door open just a crack. Sweet Robin, she called. May I enter? Have a care, my lady, warned old Gretchel, wringing her hands. His lordship threw his chamber pot at the maester. Then he has none to throw at me. Isn't there some work you should be doing? And you, Maddie, are all the windows closed and shuttered? Have all the furnishings been covered? 
all of them, milady, said Maddy. Best make certain of it. Elaine slipped into the darkened bedchamber. It's only me, sweet Robin. Someone sniveled in the darkness. Are you alone? I am, my lord. Come close, then. Just you. Elaine shut the door firmly behind her. It was solid oak, four inches thick. Maddie and Gretchel might listen all they wished, but they would hear nothing. That was just as well. Gretchel could hold her tongue, but Maddie gossiped shamelessly. Did Maester Coleman send you? the boy asked. No, she lied. I heard my sweet Robin was ailing. After his encounter with the chamber pot, the maester had come running to Sir Lothar, and Boone had come to her. If my lady can talk him out of bed nice, the knight said, I won't have to drag him out. We can't have that, she told herself. When Robert was handled roughly, he was apt to go into a shaking fit. Are you hungry, my lord? she asked the little lord. Shall I send Maddie down for berries and cream, or some warm bread and butter? Too late, she remembered, that there was no warm bread. The kitchens were closed, the ovens cold. If it gets Robert out of bed, it would be worth the bother of lighting a fire. She told herself, I don't want food, the little lord said in a reedy, petulant voice. I'm going to stay in bed today. You could read to me if you want. It is too dark in here for reading. The heavy curtains drawn across the windows made the bedchamber black as night. Has my sweet Robin forgotten what day this is? No, he said, but I'm not going. I want to stay in bed. You could read to me about the winged knight. The winged knight was Sir Artis Aaron. Legend said that he had driven the first men from the vale and flown to the top of the giant's lance on a huge falcon to slay the griffin king. There were a hundred tales of his adventures. Little Robert knew them all so well he could have recited them from memory, but he liked to have them read to him all the same. Sweetling, we have to go, she told the boy, but I promise I'll read you two tales of the winged knight when we reach the gates of the moon. Three, he said at once. No matter what you offered him, Robert always wanted more. Three, she agreed. Might I let some sun in? No, the light hurts my eyes. Come to bed, Elaine. She went to the windows anyway, edging around the broken chamber pot. She could smell it better than she saw it. I shan't open them very wide, only enough to see my sweet Robin's face. He sniffled. If you must. The curtains were of plush blue velvet. She pulled one back a finger's length and tied it off. Dust motes danced in a shaft of pale morning light. The small diamond-shaped panes of the window were obscured by frost. Elaine rubbed at one with the heel of her hand, enough to glimpse a brilliant blue sky and a blaze of white from the mountainside. The eyrie was wrapped in an icy mantle. The giant's lance above, buried in waist-deep snows, when she turned back, Robert Aaron was propped up against the pillows, looking at her. The Lord of the Eyrie and Defender of the Vale. A woolen blanket covered him below the waist. Above it he was naked, a pasty boy with hair as long as any girl's. Robert had spindly arms and legs, a soft concave chest and little belly, and eyes that were always red and runny. He cannot help the way he is. He was born small and sickly. You look very strong this morning, my lord. He loved to be told how strong he was. Shall I have Maddie and Gretchel fetch hot water for your bath? Maddie will scrub your back for you and wash your hair to make you clean and lordly for your journey. Won't that be nice? No, I hate Maddie. She has a wart on her eye and she scrubs so hard it hurts. My mummy never hurt me scrubbing. 
I will tell Mattie not to scrub my sweet barbin so hard. You'll feel better when you're fresh and clean. No bath! I told you! My head hurts most awfully. Shall I bring you a warm cloth for your brow? Or a cup of dream wine? Only a little one, though. Maya Stone is waiting down at Sky, and she'll be hurt if you go to sleep on her. You know how much she loves you. I don't love her. She's just the mule girl. Robert sniffled. Maester Coleman put something vile in my milk last night. I could taste it. I told him I wanted sweet milk, but he wouldn't bring me any. Not even when I commanded him. I am the Lord. He should do what I say. No one does what I say. I'll speak to him, Elaine promised. But only if you get up out of bed. It's beautiful outside, sweet Robin. The sun is shining bright. A perfect day for going down the mountain. The mules are waiting down its sky with Maya. His mouth quivered. I hate those smelly mules. One tried to bite me once. You tell that Maya that I'm staying here. He sounded as if he were about to cry. No one can hurt me so long as I stay here. The Eerie is impregnable. Who would want to hurt my sweet Robin? Your lords and knights adore you, and the small folk cheer your name. He is afraid, she thought, and with good reason. Since his lady mother had fallen, the boy would not even stand upon a balcony, and the way from the Eerie to the gates of the moon was perilous enough to daunt anyone. Elaine's heart had been in her throat when she made her own ascent with Lady Lysa and Lord Peter, and everyone agreed that the descent was even more harrowing, since you were looking down the whole time. Maya could tell of great lords and bold knights who had gone pale and wet their small clothes on the mountain, and none of them had the shaking sickness either. Still, it would not serve. On the valley floor, autumn still lingered, warm and golden, but winter had closed around the mountain peaks. They had weathered three snowstorms and an ice storm that transformed the castle into crystal for a fortnight. The Erie might be impregnable, but it would soon be inaccessible as well, and the way down grew more hazardous every day. Most of the castle's servants and soldiers had already made the descent. Only a dozen still lingered up here to attend Lord Robert. Sweet Robin, she said gently, the descent will be ever so jolly. You'll see. Sir Lothar will be with us, and Maya. Her mules have gone up and down this old mountain a thousand times. I hate mules, he insisted. Mules are nasty. I told you, one tried to bite me when I was little. Robert had never learned to ride properly, she knew. Mules, horses, donkeys, it made no matter. To him they were all fearsome beasts, as terrifying as dragons or griffins. He had been brought to the Vale at six, riding with his head cradled between his mother's milky breasts, and had never left the eerie since. Still, they had to go, before the eyes closed about the castle for good. There was no telling how long the weather would hold. Maya will keep the mules from biting, Elaine said, and I'll be riding just behind you. I'm only a girl, not as brave or strong as you. If I can do it, I know you can, sweet Robin. I could do it, Lord Robert said, but I don't choose to. He swiped at his runny nose with the back of his hand. Tell Maya I am going to stay abed. Perhaps I will come down on the morrow, if I feel better. Today is too cold out, and my head hurts. You can have some sweet milk, too. And I'll tell Gretchen to bring us some honeycombs to eat. We'll sleep and kiss and play games, and you can read me about the winged night. I will. Three tales, as I promised, when we reach the gates of the moon. Elaine was running short of patience. We have to go, she reminded herself, or we'll still be above the snow line when the sun goes down. 
Lord Nestor has prepared a feast to welcome you. Mushroom soup and venison and cakes. You don't want to disappoint him, do you? Will they be lemon cakes? Lord Robert loved lemon cakes, perhaps because Elaine did. Lemony, lemony, lemon cakes, she assured him. And you can have as many as you like. A hundred? He wanted to know. Could I have a hundred? If it please you. She sat on the bed and smoothed his long, fine hair. He does have pretty hair. Lady Liza had brushed it herself every night and cut it when it wanted cutting. After she had fallen, Robert had suffered terrible shaking fits whenever anyone came near him with a blade, so Peter had commanded that his hair be allowed to grow. Elaine wound a lock around her finger and said, Now, will you get out of bed and let us dress you? I want a hundred lemon cakes and five tails. I'd like to give you a hundred spankings and five slaps. You would not dare behave like this if Peter were here. The little lord had a good healthy fear of his stepfather. Elaine forced a smile. As my lord desires, but nothing till you're washed and dressed and on your way. Come, before the morning's gone. She took him firmly by the hand and drew him out of bed. Before she could summon the servants, however, Sweet Robin threw his skinny arms around her and kissed her. It was a little boy's kiss, and clumsy. Everything Robert Aaron did was clumsy. If I close my eyes, I can pretend he is the Knight of Flowers. Sir Loras had given Sansa Stark a red rose once, but he had never kissed her. And no Tyrell would ever kiss Elaine Stone. Pretty as she was, she had been born on the wrong side of the blanket. As the boy's lips touched her own, she found herself thinking of another kiss. She could still remember how it felt when his cruel mouth pressed down on her own. He had come to Sansa in the darkness as green fire filled the sky. He took a song and a kiss and left me nothing but a bloody cloak. It made no matter. That day was done, and so was Sansa. Elaine pushed her little lord away. That's enough. You can kiss me again when we reach the gates, if you keep your word. Maddie and Gretchel were waiting outside with Maester Coleman. The maester had washed the night soil from his hair and changed his robe. Robert's squires had turned up as well. Terence and Giles could always sniff out trouble. Lord Robert is feeling stronger. Elaine told the serving women. Fetch hot water for his bath, but see you don't scald him, and do not pull on his hair when you brush out the tangles. He hates that. One of the squires sniggered until she said, Terence, lay out his lordship's riding clothes and his warmest cloak. Giles, you may clean up that broken chamber pot. Giles Grafton made a face. I'm no scrub woman. Do as Lady Elaine commands, or Lothar Brune will hear of it, said Maester Coleman. He followed her along the hallway and down the twisting stairs. I am grateful for your intercession, my lady. You have a way with him. He hesitated. Did you observe any shaking while you were with him? His fingers trembled a little bit when I held his hand. That's all. He says you put something vile in his milk. Vile? Coleman blinked at her, and the apple in his throat moved up and down. I merely... Is he bleeding from the nose? No. Good. That is good. His chain clinked softly as he bobbed his head atop a ridiculously long and skinny neck. This descent... My lady, it might be safest if I mixed his lordship some milk of the poppy. Maya Stone could lash him over the back of her most sure-footed mule whilst he slumbered. The lord of the Erie cannot descend from his mountain tied up like a sack of barleycorn. Of that Elaine was certain. 
They dare not let the full extent of Robert's frailty and cowardice become too widely known. Her father had warned her. I wish he were here. He would know what to do. Peter Baelish was clear across the veil, though, attending Lord Lionel Corbray at his wedding. A widower of forty-odd years and childless, Lord Lionel was to wed the strapping sixteen-year-old daughter of a rich Gulltown merchant. Peter had brokered the match himself. The bride's dower was said to be staggering. It had to be, since she was of common birth. Corbray's vassals would be there, were the lords Waxley, Grafton, Linderley, some petty lords and landed knights, and Lord Belmore, who had lately reconciled with her father. The other lords, the Clarent, were expected to shun the nuptials, so Peter's presence was essential. Elaine understood all that well enough, but it meant that the burden of getting sweet Robin safely down the mountain fell on her. Give his lordship a cup of sweet milk, she told the maester. That will stop him from shaking on the journey down. He had a cup not three days past, Coleman objected, and wanted another last night, which you refused him. It was too soon. My lady, you do not understand. As I've told the Lord Protector, a pinch of sweet sleep will prevent the shaking, but it does not leave the flesh, and in time—time time will not matter if his lordship has a shaking fit and falls off the mountain. If my father were here, I know he would tell you to keep Lord Robert calm at all costs. I try, my lady, yet his fits grow ever more violent, and his blood is so thin I dare not leech him any more. Sweet sleep, you are certain he was not bleeding from the nose? He was sniffling, Elaine admitted, but I saw no blood. I must speak to the Lord Protector. This feast, is that wise, I wonder, after the strain of the descent? It will not be a large feast, she assured him. No more than forty guests, Lord Nestor and his household, the Knight of the Gate, a few lesser lords and their retainers. Lord Robert mislikes strangers, you know that. And there will be drinking, noise, music. Music frightens him. Music soothes him, she corrected, the high harp especially. It's singing he can't abide, since Marillion killed his mother. Elaine had told the lie so many times that she remembered it that way more oft than not. The other seemed no more than a bad dream that sometimes troubled her sleep. Lord Nestor will have no singers at the feast, only flutes and fiddles for the dancing. What would she do when the music began to play? It was a vexing question, to which her heart and head gave different answers. Sansa loved to dance, but Elaine— just give him a cup of the sweet milk before we go, and another at the feast, and there should be no trouble. Very well. They paused at the foot of the stairs. But this must be the last for half a year or longer. You had best take that up with the Lord Protector. She pushed through the door and crossed the yard. Coleman only wanted the best for his charge, Elaine knew. But what was best for Robert the boy and what was best for Lord Aaron were not always the same. Peter had said as much, and it was true. Maester Coleman cares only for the boy, though. Father and I have larger concerns. Old snow cloaked the courtyard, and icicles hung down like crystal spears from the terraces and towers. The eyrie was built of fine white stone and winter's mantle made it whiter still. So beautiful, Elaine thought, so impregnable. She could not love this place, no matter how she tried, even before the guards and serving men had made their descent. The castle had seemed as empty as a tomb, and more so when Peter Baelish was away. No one sang up there, not since Marillion. No one ever laughed so loud. 
Even the gods were silent. The Erie boasted a sept, but no septon, a god's wood, but no heart tree. No prayers are answered here, she often thought, though some days she felt so lonely she had to try. Only the wind answered her, sighing endlessly around the seven slim white towers and rattling the moon door every time it dusted. It will be even worse in winter, she knew. In winter, this will be a cold white prison. And yet the thought of leaving frightened her almost as much as it frightened Robert. She only hid it better. Her father said there was no shame in being afraid, only in showing your fear. All men live with fear, he said. Elaine was not certain she believed that. Nothing frightened Peter Baelish. He only said that to make me brave. She would need to be brave down below, where the chance of being unmasked was so much greater. Peter's friends at court had sent him word that the Queen had men out looking for the imp and Sansa Stark. It will mean my head if I am found, she reminded herself as she descended a flight of icy stone steps. I must be Elaine all the time, inside and out. Lothar Brun was in the winch room, helping the jailer, Mord, and two serving men wrestle chests of clothes and bales of cloth into six huge oaken buckets, each big enough around to hold three men. The great chain winches were the easiest way to reach the way castle, Sky, six hundred feet below them. Elsewise, you had to descend the natural stone chimney from the undercellar, or go the way Meridian went, and Lady Lysa before him. Boy out of bed? Sir Lothar asked. They're bathing him. He will be ready within the hour. We best hope he is. Maya won't wait past midday. The winch room was unheated, so his breath misted with every word. She'll wait, Elaine said. She has to wait. Don't be so certain, my lady. She's half mule herself, that one. I think she'd leave us all to starve before she'd put those animals at risk. He smiled when he said it. He always smiles when he speaks of Maya Stone. Maya was much younger than Sir Lothar, but when her father had been brokering the marriage between Lord Corbray and his merchant's daughter, he told her that young girls were always happiest with older men. Innocence and experience make for a perfect marriage, he had said. Elaine wondered what Maya made of Sir Lothar. With his squashed nose, square jaw, and nap of woolly gray hair, Brune could not be called comely, but he was not ugly either. It is a common face, but an honest one. Though he had risen to knighthood, Sir Lothar's birth had been very low. One night he had told her that he was kin to the Brunes of Brown Hollow, an old knightly family from Cracklaw Point. I went to them when my father died, he confessed, but they shat on me and said I was no blood of theirs. He would not speak of what happened after that, except to say that he had learned all he knew of arms the hard way. Sober, he was a quiet man, but a strong one. And Peter says he's loyal. He trusts him as much as he trusts anyone. Brune would be a good match for a bastard girl like Maya Stone, she thought. It might be different if her father had acknowledged her, but he never did. And Mattie says that she's no maid either. Mord took up his whip and cracked it, and the first pair of oxen began to lumber in a circle, turning the winch. The chain uncoiled, rattling as it scraped across the stone, the oaken bucket swaying as it began its long descent to sky. Poor oxen, thought Elaine. Mord would cut their throats and butcher them before he left and leave them for the falcons. Whatever part remained when the eyrie was reopened would be roasted up for the spring feast, if it had not spoiled. A good supply of hard-frozen meat foretold a summer of plenty, old Gretchel claimed. My lady, 
Sir Lothar said. You'd best know. Maya didn't come up alone. Lady Miranda's with her. Oh? Why would she ride all the way up the mountain just to ride back down again? Miranda Royce was the Lord Nestor's daughter. The one time that Sansa had visited the Gates of the Moon, on the way up to the Erie with her Aunt Lysa and Lord Peter, she had been away. But Elaine had heard much of her since from the Erie's soldiers and serving girls. Her mother was long dead, so Lady Miranda kept her father's castle for him. It was a much livelier court when she was home than when she was away, according to rumor. Soon or late, you must meet Miranda Royce, Peter had warned her. When you do, be careful. She likes to play the merry fool, but underneath, she's shrewder than her father. Guard your tongue around her. I will, she thought, but I did not know I'd need to start so soon. Robert will be pleased. He liked Miranda Royce. You must excuse me, sir. I need to finish packing. Alone, she climbed the steps back to her room for one last time. The windows had been sealed and shuttered, the furnishings covered. A few of her things had already been removed, the rest stored away. All of Lady Lysa's silks and samites were to be left behind. Her sheerest linens and plushest velvets, the rich embroidery and fine mirish lace, all would remain. Down below, Elaine must dress modestly, as befit a girl of modest birth. It makes no matter, she told herself. I dared not wear the best clothes even here. Gretchel had stripped the bed and laid out the rest of her clothing. Elaine was already wearing woolen hose beneath her skirts, over a double layer of small clothes. Now she donned a lamb's wool over tunic and a hooded fur cloak, fastening it with an enameled mockingbird that had been a gift from Peter. There was a scarf as well, and a pair of leather gloves lined with fur to match her riding boots. When she donned it all, she felt as fat and furry as a bear cub. I will be glad of it on the mountain, she had to remind herself. She took one last look at her room before she left. I was safe here, she thought, but down below... When Elaine returned to the winch room, she found Maya Stone waiting impatiently with Lothar Brun and Mord. She must have come up in the bucket to see what was taking us so long. Slim and sinewy, Maya looked as tough as the old riding leathers she wore beneath her silvery ring-mail shirt. Her hair was black as a raven's wing, so short and shaggy that Elaine suspected that she cut it with a dagger. Maya's eyes were her best feature, big and blue. She could be pretty, if she would dress up like a girl. Elaine found herself wondering whether Sir Lothar liked her best in her iron and leather, or dreamed of her gowned in lace and silk. Maya liked to say that her father had been a goat and her mother an owl. But Elaine had gotten the true story from Maddie. Yes, she thought, looking at her now. Those are his eyes, and she has his hair, too, the thick black hair he shared with Renly. Where is he? the bastard girl demanded. His lordship is being bathed and dressed. He needs to make some haste. It's getting colder, can't you feel it? We need to get below snow before the sun goes down. How bad is the wind? Elaine asked her. It could be worse, and will be after dark. Maya pushed a lock of hair from her eyes. If he bathes much longer, we'll be trapped up here all winter with nothing to eat except each other. Elaine did not know what to say to that. Thankfully, she was spared by the arrival of Robert Aaron. The little lord wore sky-blue velvet, a chain of gold and sapphires, and a white bearskin cloak. His squires each held an end to keep the cloak from dragging on the floor. Maester Coleman accompanied them in a threadbare gray cloak lined with squirrel fur. Gretchel and Maddie were not far behind. When he felt the cold wind on his face, Robert quailed but Terence and Giles were behind him, so he could not flee. 
My lord, said Maya, will you ride down with me? Too brusque, Elaine thought. She should have greeted him with a smile, told him how strong and brave he looks. I want Elaine, Lord Robert said. I'll only go with her. The bucket can hold all three of us. I just want Elaine. You smell all stinky, like a mule. As you wish. Maya's face showed no emotion. Some of the winch chains were fixed to wicker baskets, others to stout oaken buckets. The largest of those was taller than Elaine, with iron bands girding its dark brown staves. Even so, her heart was in her throat as she took Robert's hand and helped him in. Once the hatch was closed behind them, the wood surrounded them on all sides. Only the top was open. It is best that way, she told herself. We can't look down. Below them was only sky and sky. Six hundred feet of sky. For a moment she found herself wondering how long it had taken her aunt to fall that distance, and what her last thought had been as the mountain rushed up to meet her. No, I mustn't think of that. I mustn't. Away! came Sir Lothar's shout. Someone shoved the bucket hard. It swayed and tipped, scraped against the floor, then swung free. She heard the crack of Mord's whip and the rattle of the chain. They began to descend, by jerks and starts at first, then more smoothly. Robert's face was pale and his eyes puffy, but his hands were still. The eerie shrank above them. The sky cells on the lower levels made the castle look something like a honeycomb from below. A honeycomb made of ice, Elaine thought. A castle made of snow. She could hear the wind whistling round the bucket. A hundred feet down, a sudden gust caught hold of them. The bucket swayed sideways, spinning in the air, then bumped hard against the rock face behind them. Shards of ice and snow rained down on them and the oak creaked and strained. Robert gave a gasp and clung to her, burying his face between her breasts. My lord is brave, Elaine said when she felt him shaking. I'm so frightened I can hardly talk, but not you. She felt him nod. The winged knight was brave, and so am I, he boasted to her bodice. I'm an Aaron. Will my sweet Robin hold me tight? she asked, though he was already holding her so tightly that she could scarcely breathe. "'If you like,' he whispered, and clinging hard to one another, they continued on straight down to sky. "'Calling this a castle is like calling a puddle on a privy floor a lake,' Elaine thought, when the bucket was opened so they might emerge within the way castle. Sky was no more than a crescent-shaped wall of old unmortared stone, enclosing a stony ledge and the yawning mouth of a cavern. Inside were storehouses and stables, a long natural hall, and the chiseled handholds that led up to the eyrie. Outside the ground was strewn by broken stones and boulders. Earthen ramps gave access to the wall. Six hundred feet above, the eyrie was so small she could hide it with her hand. But far below, the veil stretched green and golden. Twenty mules awaited them within the way castle, along with two mule walkers and the Lady Miranda Royce. Lord Nestor's daughter proved to be a short, fleshy woman of an age with Maya Stone. But where Maya was slim and sinewy, Miranda was soft-bodied and sweet-smelling, broad of hip thick of waist, and extremely buxom. Her thick chestnut curls framed round red cheeks, a small mouth, and a pair of lively brown eyes. When Robert climbed gingerly from the bucket, she knelt in a patch of snow to kiss his hands and cheeks. "'My lord,' she said, "'you've grown so big!' "'Am I?' said Robert, pleased. "'You will be taller than me soon.' The lady lied. She got to her feet and brushed the snow from her skirts. 
and you must be the Lord Protector's daughter, she added, as the bucket went rattling back up to the eerie. I had heard that you were beautiful. I see that it is true. Elaine curtsied. My lady is kind to say so. Kind? The older girl gave a laugh. How boring that would be. I aspire to be wicked. You must tell me all your secrets on the ride down. May I call you Elaine? If you wish, my lady. But you'll get no secrets from me. I am my lady at the gates. But up here on the mountain you may call me Randa. How many years have you, Elaine? Four and ten, my lady. She had decided that Elaine Stone should be older than Sansa Stark. Randa! It seems a hundred years since I was four and ten. How innocent I was! Are you still innocent, Elaine? She blushed. You should not. Yes, of course. Saving yourself for Lord Robert? Lady Miranda teased. Or is there some ardent squire dreaming of your favors? No, said Elaine, even as Robert said, She's my friend. Terence and Giles can't have her. A second bucket had arrived by then, thumping down softly on a mound of frozen snow. Maester Coleman emerged with the squires, Terence and Giles. The next winch delivered Maddie and Gretchel, who drove with Maya Stone. The bastard girl wasted no time taking charge. We don't want to get bunched up on the mountain, she told the other mule handlers. I'll take Lord Robert and his companions. Ossie, you'll bring down Sir Lothar and the rest, but give me an hour's lead. Carrot, you'll have charge of their chests and boxes. She turned to Robert Aaron, her black hair blowing. Which mule will you ride today, my lord? They're all stinky. I'll have the gray one, with the ear chewed off. I want Elaine to ride with me, and Miranda, too. Where the way is wide enough. Come, my lord, let's get you on your mule. There's a smell of snow in the air. It was another half hour before they were ready to set out. When all of them were mounted up, Maya Stone gave a crisp command, and two of Skye's men-at-arms swung the gates open. Maya led them out, with Lord Robert just behind her, swaddled in his bearskin cloak. Elaine and Miranda Royce followed, then Gretchel and Maddie, then Terence Linderley and Giles Grafton. Maester Coleman brought up the rear, leading a second mule laden with his chests of herbs and potions. Beyond the walls, the wind picked up sharply. They were above the tree line here, exposed to the elements. Elaine was thankful that she dressed so warmly. Her cloak was flapping noisily behind her, and a sudden gust blew back her hood. She laughed, but a few yards ahead Lord Robert squirmed and said, It's too cold. We should go back and wait until it's warmer. It will be warmer on the valley floor, my lord, said Maya. You'll see when we get down there. I don't want to see, said Robert, but Maya paid no mind. Their road was a crooked series of stone steps carved into the mountainside, but the mules knew every inch of it. Elaine was glad of that. Here and there the stone was shattered from the strain of countless seasons with all their thaws and freezes. Patches of snow clung to the rock on either side of the path, blinding white. The sun was bright, the sky was blue, and there were falcons circling overhead, riding on the wind. Up here, where the slope was steepest, the steps wound back and forth rather than plunging straight down. Sansa Stark went up the mountain, but a lane stone is coming down. It was a strange thought. Coming up, Maya had warned her to keep her eyes on the path ahead, she remembered. Look up, not down, she said, but that was not possible on the descent. I could close my eyes. The mule knows the way. He has no need of me. But that seemed more something Sansa would have done, that frightened girl. Elaine was an older woman, and bastard brave. At first they rode in single file, but farther down 
the path widened enough for two to ride abreast, and Miranda Royce came up beside her. "'We have had a letter from your father,' she said as casually as if they were sitting with their scepter, doing needlework. "'He is on his way home,' he says, "'and hopes to see his darling daughter soon. "'He writes that Lionel Corbray seems well pleased with his bride, "'and even more so with her dowry. "'I do hope Lord Lionel remembers which one he needs to bed. "'Lady Wainwood turned up with the Knight of Nine Stars for the wedding feast,' "'Lord Peter says, to everyone's astonishment.' Anya Wainwood? Truly? The Lords the Clarent were down from six to three, it would seem. The day he'd departed the mountain, Peter Baelish had been confident of winning Simon Templeton to his side, but not so Lady Wainwood. Was there more? she asked. The Erie was such a lonely place that she was eager for any bit of news from the world beyond, however trivial or insignificant. Not from your father, no. But we've had other birds. The war goes on, everywhere but here. River Run has yielded, but Dragonstone and Storm's End still hold for Lord Stannis. Lady Lysa was so wise to keep us out of it. Miranda gave her a shrewd little smile. Yes, she was the very soul of wisdom, that good lady. She shifted her seat. Why must mules be so bony and ill-tempered? Maya does not feed them enough. A nice fat mule would be more comfortable to ride. There's a new high septon, did you know? Oh, and the Night's Watch has a boy commander, some bastard son of Eddard Stark's. John Snow? She blurted out, surprised. Snow? Yes, it would be Snow, I suppose. She had not thought of John in ages. He was only her half-brother, but still. With Rob and Bran and Rickon dead, John Snow was the only brother that remained to her. I am a bastard too now, just like him. Oh, it would be so sweet to see him once again. But of course that could never be. Elaine Stone had no brothers, base-born or otherwise. Our cousin Bronze Yon had himself a melee at Runestone, Miranda Royce went on, oblivious. A small one, just for squires. It was meant for Harry the heir to win the honours, and so he did. Harry the heir? Lady Wainwood's ward, Harold Harding. I suppose we must call him Sir Harry now. Bronze Yon knighted him. Oh. Elaine was confused. Why should Lady Wainwood's ward be her heir? She had sons of her own blood. One was the Knight of the Bloody Gate, Sir Donal. She did not want to look stupid, though, so all she said was, I pray he proves a worthy knight. Lady Miranda snorted. I pray he gets the pox. He has a bastard daughter by some common girl, you know. My lord father had hoped to marry me to Harry, but Lady Wainwood would not hear of it. I do not know whether it was me she found unsuitable, or just my dowry. She gave a sigh. I do need another husband. I had one once, but I killed him. You did? Elaine said, shocked. Oh, yes. He died on top of me. In me, if truth be told. You do know what goes on in a marriage bed, I hope. She thought of Tyrion and of the hound, and how he'd kissed her, and gave a nod. That must have been dreadful, my lady, him dying. There, I mean, whilst, whilst he was fucking me. She shrugged. It was disconcerting, certainly, not to mention discourteous. He did not even have the common decency to plant a child in me. Old men have weak seed, so here I am, a widow, but scarce used. Harry could have done much worse. I dare say that he will. Lady Wainwood will most like marry him to one of her granddaughters, or one of Bronze Yon's. As you say, my lady. Elaine remembered Peter's warning. Randa. Come now, you can say it. Randa. Randa. Much better. I fear I must apologize to you. 
You will think me a dreadful slut, I know. But I bedded that pretty boy Marillion. I did not know he was a monster. He sang beautifully, and could do the sweetest things with his fingers. I would never have taken him to bed if I had known he was going to push Lady Lysa through the moon door. I do not bed monsters as a rule. She studied Elaine's face and chest. You are prettier than me, but my breasts are larger. The maesters say large breasts produce no more milk than small ones, but I do not believe it. Have you ever known a wet nurse with small teats? Yours are ample for a girl your age, but as they are bastard breasts, I shan't concern myself with them. Miranda edged her mule closer. You know, Armaya's not a maid, I trust. She did. Fat Maddie had whispered it to her, one time when Maya brought up their supplies. Maddie told me. Of course she did. She has a mouth as big as her thighs, and her thighs are enormous. Michael Redford was the one. He used to be Lynn Corbray's squire. A real squire, not like that loutish lad Sir Lynn's got squiring for him now. He only took that one on for Cohen, they say. Michael was the best young swordsman in the Vale, and gallant, or so poor Maya thought, till he wed one of Bronze Jan's daughters. Lord Horton gave him no choice in the matter, I'm sure, but it was still a cruel thing to do to Maya. Sir Lothar is fond of her. Elaine glanced down at the mule girl twenty steps below. More than fond. Lothar Brune? Miranda raised an eyebrow. Does she know? She did not wait for an answer. He has no hope, poor man. My father's tried to make a match for Maya, but she'll have none of them. She is half mule, that one. Despite herself, Elaine found herself warming to the older girl. She had not had a friend to gossip with since poor Janie Poole. Do you think Sir Lothar likes her as she is, in male and leather? She asked the older girl, who seemed so worldly wise. Or does he dream of her draped in silks and velvets? He's a man. He dreams of her naked. She is trying to make me blush again. Lady Miranda must have heard her thoughts. You do turn such a pretty shade of pink. When I blush, I look quite like an apple. I have not blushed for years, though. She leaned closer. Does your father plan to wed again? My father? Elaine had never considered that. Somehow the notion made her squirm. She found herself remembering the look on Lysa Aaron's face as she'd tumbled through the moon door. We all know how devoted he was to Lady Lysa, said Miranda, but he cannot mourn forever. He needs a pretty young wife to wash away his grief. I imagine he could have his pick of half the noble maidens in the Vale. Who could be a better husband than our own bold Lord Protector? Though I do wish he had a better name than Littlefinger. How little is it, do you know? His finger? She blushed again. I don't. I never. Lady Miranda laughed so loud that Maya Stone glanced back at them. Never you mind, Elaine. I'm sure it's large enough. They passed beneath the wind-carved arch, where long icicles clung to the pale stone, dripping down on them. On the far side the path narrowed and plunged down sharply for a hundred feet or more. Miranda was forced to drop back. Elaine gave the mule his head. The steepness of this part of the descent made her cling tightly to her saddle. The steps here had been worn smooth by the iron-shod hooves of all the mules who'd passed this way, until they resembled a series of shallow stone bowls. Water filled the bottoms of the bowls, glimmering golden in the afternoon sun. It is water now, Elaine thought, but come dark, all of it will turn to ice. She realized that she was holding her breath, and let it out. Maya Stone and Lord Robert had almost reached the rock spire where the slope leveled off again. She tried to look at them, and only them. I will not fall, she told herself, 
Maya's mule will see me through. The wind skirled around her as she bumped and scraped her way down step by step. It seemed to take a lifetime. Then, all at once, she was at the bottom with Maya and her little lord, huddled beneath a twisted rocky spire. Ahead stretched a high stone saddle, narrow and icy. Elaine could hear the wind shrieking and feel it plucking at her cloak. She remembered this place from her ascent. It had frightened her then, and it frightened her now. "'It is wider than it looks,' Maya was telling Lord Robert in a cheerful voice. "'A yard across, and no more than eight yards long. That's nothing.' "'Nothing?' Robert said. His hand was shaking. "'Oh, no,' Elaine thought. "'Please, not here, not now.' "'It's best to lead the mules across,' Maya said. "'If it please, my lord, I'll take mine over first, then come back for yours.' Lord Robert did not answer. He was staring at the narrow saddle with his reddened eyes. "'I shan't be long, my lord,' Maya promised, but Elaine doubted that the boy could even hear her. When the bastard girl led her mule out from beneath the shelter of the spire, the wind caught her in its teeth. Her cloak lifted, twisting and flapping in the air. Maya staggered, and for half a heartbeat it seemed as if she would be blown over the precipice. But somehow she regained her balance and went on. Elaine took Robert's gloved hand in her own to stop his shaking. "'Sweet Robin,' she said, "'I'm scared. Hold my hand and help me get across. I know you're not afraid.' He looked at her his pupils small dark pinpricks in eyes as big and white as eggs. I'm not. Not you. You're my winged knight, Sir Sweet Robin. The winged knight could fly, Robert whispered. Higher than the mountains, she gave his hand a squeeze. Lady Miranda had joined them by the spire. He could, she echoed when she saw what was happening. "'Sir Sweet Robin,' Lord Robert said, and Elaine knew that she dare not wait for Maya to return. She helped the boy dismount, and hand in hand they walked out onto the bare stone saddle, their cloaks snapping and flapping behind them. All around was empty air and sky, the ground falling away sharply to either side. There was ice underfoot, and broken stones just waiting to turn an ankle, and the wind was howling fiercely. It sounds like a wolf, thought Sansa, a ghost wolf, big as mountains. And then they were on the other side. And Maya Stone was laughing and lifting Robert for a hug. Be careful, Elaine told her. He can hurt you flailing. You wouldn't think so, but he can. They found a place for him, a cleft in the rock, to keep him out of the cold wind. Elaine tended him until the shaking passed whilst Maya went back to help the others cross. Fresh mules awaited them at snow, and a hot meal of stewed goat and onions. She ate with Maya and Miranda. "'So you're brave as well as beautiful,' Miranda said to her. "'No,' the compliment made her blush. "'I'm not. I was so scared. I don't think I could have crossed without Lord Robert.' She turned to Maya Stone. You almost fell. You're mistaken. I never fall. Maya's hair had tumbled across her cheek, hiding one eye. Almost, I said. I saw you. Weren't you afraid? Maya shook her head. I remember a man throwing me in the air when I was very little. He stands as tall as the sky, and he throws me up so high, it feels as though I'm flying. We're both laughing, laughing so much that I can hardly catch a breath. And finally I laughed so hard I wet myself. But that only makes him laugh the louder. I was never afraid when he was throwing me. I knew that he would always be there to catch me. She pushed her hair back. Then one day he wasn't. Men come and go. They lie or die or leave you. A mountain is not a man, though, and a stone is a mountain's daughter. I trust my father, and I trust my mules. I won't fall. She put her hand on a jagged spur of rock and got to her feet. 
Best finish. We have a long way yet to go, and I can smell a storm. The snow began to fall as they were leaving Stone, the largest and lowest of the three way castles that defended the approaches to the Erie. Dusk was settling by then. Lady Miranda suggested that perhaps they might turn back, spend the night at Stone, and resume their descent when the sun came up, but Maya would not hear of it. The snow might be five feet deep by then, and the steps treacherous even for my mules, she said. We will do better to press on. We'll take it slow. And so they did. Below stone, the steps were broader and less steep, winding in and out of the tall pines and gray-green sentinels that cloaked the lower slopes of the giant's lance. Maya's mules knew every root and rock on the way down, it seemed, and any they forgot, the bastard girl remembered. Half the night was gone before they sighted the lights of the gates of the moon through the falling snow. The last part of their journey was the most peaceful. The snow fell steadily, cloaking all the world in white. Sweet Robin drifted to sleep in the saddle, swaying back and forth with the motion of his mule. Even Lady Miranda began to yawn and complain of being weary. We have apartments prepared for all of you, she told Elaine. But if you like, you may share my bed tonight. It's large enough for four. I should be honored, my lady. Randa, count yourself fortunate that I'm so tired. All I want to do is curl up and go to sleep. Usually when ladies share my bed, they have to pay a pillow tax and tell me all about the wicked things they've done. What if they haven't done any wicked things? Why, then they must confess all the wicked things they want to do. Not you, of course. I can see how virtuous you are just by looking at those rosy cheeks and big blue eyes of yours. She yawned again. I hope your feet are warm. I do hate bedmaids with cold feet. By the time they finally reached her father's castle, Lady Miranda was drowsing, too, and Elaine was dreaming of her bed. It will be a feather bed, she told herself, soft and warm and deep, piled high with furs. I will dream a sweet dream, and when I wake there will be dogs barking, women gossiping beside the well, swords ringing in the yard, and later there will be a feast with music and dancing. After the deathly silence of the eerie, she yearned for shouts and laughter. As the riders were climbing off their mules, however, one of Peter's guardsmen emerged from within the keep. Lady Elaine, he said, the Lord Protector has been waiting for you. He's back? she said, startled. At evenfall, you'll find him in the West Tower. The hour was closer to dawn than to dusk, and most of the castle was asleep, but not Peter Baelish. Elaine found him seated by a crackling fire, drinking hot mulled wine with three men she did not know. They all rose when she entered, and Peter smiled warmly. Elaine, come give your father a kiss. She hugged him dutifully and kissed him on the cheek. I am sorry to intrude, father. No one told me you had company. You are never an intrusion, sweetling. I was just now telling these good knights what a dutiful daughter I had. Dutiful and beautiful, said an elegant young knight, whose thick blonde mane cascaded down well past his shoulders. Aye, said the second knight, a burly fellow, with a thick salt-and-pepper beard, a red nose, bulbous with broken veins, and gnarled hands as large as hams. You left out that part, my lord. I would do the same if she were my daughter, said the last knight. A short, wiry man, with a wry smile, pointed nose, and bristly orange hair. Particularly around louts like us. Elaine laughed. Are you louts? she said, teasing. Why, I took the three of you for gallant knights. Knights they are, said Peter. Their gallantry has yet to be demonstrated, but we may hope. Allow me to present Sir Byron, Sir Morgarth, and Sir Shadrich. Sirs, the Lady Elaine, my natural and very clever daughter. 
with whom I must needs confer, if you will be so good as to excuse us. The three knights bowed and withdrew, though the tall one with the blonde hair kissed her hand before taking his leave. Hedge knights, said Elaine when the door had closed. Hungry knights, I thought it best that we have a few more swords about us. The times grow ever more interesting, my sweet. And when the times are interesting, you can never have too many swords. The Merling kings returned to Gulltown, and old Oswell had some tales to tell. She knew better than to ask what sort of tales. If Peter had wanted her to know, he would have told her. I did not expect you back so soon, she said. I am glad you've come. I would never have known it from the kiss you gave me. He pulled her closer, caught her face between his hands, and kissed her on the lips for a long time. Now, that's the sort of kiss that says, Welcome home. See that you do better next time. Yes, father. She could feel herself blushing. He did not hold her kiss against her. You would not believe half of what is happening in King's Landing, sweetling. Circe stumbles from one idiocy to the next, helped along by her counsel of the deaf, the dim, and the blind. I always anticipated that she would beggar the realm and destroy herself, but I never expected she would do it quite so fast. It is quite vexing. I had hoped to have four or five quiet years to plant some seeds and allow some fruits to ripen. But now— it is a good thing that I thrive on chaos. What little peace and order the five kings left us will not long survive the three queens, I fear. Three queens? She did not understand. Nor did Peter choose to explain. Instead, he smiled and said, I have brought my sweet girl back a gift. Elaine was as pleased as she was surprised. Is it a gown? She had heard there were fine seamstresses in Gulltown, and she was so tired of dressing drably. Something better. Guess again. Jewels? No jewels could hope to match my daughter's eyes. Lemons. Did you find some lemons? She had promised Sweet Robin lemon cake, and for lemon cake you needed lemons. Peter Baelish took her by the hand and drew her down onto his lap. I have made a marriage contract for you. A marriage? Her throat tightened. She did not want to wed again. Not now. Perhaps not ever. I do not. I cannot marry. Father, I— Elaine looked to the door to make certain it was closed. I am married, she whispered. You know. Peter put a finger to her lips to silence her. The dwarf wed Ned Stark's daughter, not mine. Be that as it may, this is only a betrothal. The marriage must needs wait until Circe is done and Sansa's safely widowed. And you must meet the boy and win his approval. Lady Wainwood will not make him marry against his will. She was quite firm on that. Lady Wainwood? Elaine could hardly believe it. Why would she marry one of her sons to—to to a— Bastard? For a start, you are the Lord Protector's bastard, never forget. The Wainwoods are very old and very proud, but not as rich as one might think, as I discovered when I began buying up their debt. Not that Lady Anya would ever sell a son for gold. A ward, however. Young Harry's only a cousin, and the dower that I offered her ladyship— was even larger than the one that Lionel Corbray just collected. It had to be, for her to risk Bronze Yawn's wrath. This will put all his plans awry. You are promised to Harold Harding, sweetling, provided you can win his boyish heart, which should not be hard for you. Harry, the heir? Elaine tried to recall what Miranda had told her about him on the mountain. He was just knighted. And he has a bastard daughter by some common girl. And another on the way by a different wench. 
Harry can be a beguiling one, no doubt. Soft, sandy hair, deep blue eyes, and dimples when he smiles. And very gallant, I am told. He teased you with a smile. Bastard born or no, sweetling, when this match is announced, you will be the envy of every high-born maiden in the Vale, and a few from the Riverlands in the Reach as well. Why? Elaine was lost. Is Sir Harold... How could he be Lady Wainwood's heir? Doesn't she have sons of her own blood? Three, Peter allowed. She could smell the wine on his breath, the cloves and nutmeg. Daughters, too, and grandsons. Won't they come before Harry? I don't understand. You will. Listen. Peter took her hand in his own and brushed his fingers lightly down the inside of her palm. Lord Jasper Arryn, begin with him, John Arryn's father. He begot three children, two sons and a daughter. John was the eldest, so the Erie and the lordship passed to him. His sister Alice wed Sir Ellis Wainwood, uncle to the present Lady Wainwood. He made a wry face. Ellis and Alice, isn't that precious? Lord Jasper's younger son, Sir Ronald Arryn, but a Belmore girl, but only rang her once or twice before dying of a bad belly. Their son, Albert, was being born in one bed, even as poor Ronald was dying in another down the hall. Are you paying close attention, sweetling? Yes, there was John and Alice and Ronald, but Ronald died. Good. Now, John Arryn married thrice, but his first two wives gave him no children. So for long years his nephew Elbert was his heir. Meantime, Ellis was ploughing Alice quite dutifully, and she was whelping once a year. She gave him nine children, eight girls and one precious little boy, another Jasper, after which she died exhausted. Boy Jasper, inconsiderate of the heroic efforts that had gone into begetting him, got himself kicked in the head by a horse when he was three years old. A pox took two of his sisters soon after, leaving six. The eldest married Sir Dennis Arryn, a distant cousin to the Lords of the Erie. There are several branches of House Arryn, scattered across the Vale, all as proud as they are penurious, save for the Gulltown Arryns, who had the rare good sense to marry merchants. They are rich, but less than couth, so no one talks about them. Sir Dennis hailed from one of the poor, proud branches, but he was also a renowned jouster, handsome and gallant and brimming with courtesy, and he had that magic Aaron name, which made him ideal for the eldest Wainwood girl. Their children would be Aaron's, and the next heirs to the Vale should any ill befall Elbert. Well, as it happened, Mad King Eris befell Elbert. You know that story. She did. The Mad King murdered him. He did indeed. And soon after, Sir Dennis left his pregnant Wainwood wife to ride to war. He died during the Battle of the Bells, of an excess of gallantry and an axe. When they told his lady of his death, she perished of grief, and her newborn son soon followed. No matter. John Arryn had gotten himself a young wife during the war, one he had reason to believe fertile. He was very hopeful, I'm sure, but you and I know that all he ever got from Lysa were stillbirths, miscarriages, and poor sweet Robin. Which brings us back to the five remaining daughters of Ellis and Alice. The eldest had been left terribly scarred by the same pox that killed her sisters, so she became a septa. Another was seduced by a sellsword. Sir Ellis cast her out, and she joined the Silent Sisters after her bastard died in infancy. The third wed the Lord of the Paps, but proved barren. The fourth was on her way to the Riverlands to marry some bracken, and burned men carried her off. That left the youngest, who wed a landed knight sworn to the Wainwoods, gave him a son that she named Harold, and perished. 
He turned her hand over and lightly kissed her wrist. So, tell me, sweetly, why is Harry the heir? Her eyes widened. He is not Lady Wainwood's heir. He's Robert's heir. If Robert were to die... Peter arched an eyebrow. When Robert dies, our poor, brave, sweet Robin is such a sickly boy, it is only a matter of time. When Robert dies, Harry the heir becomes Lord Harold, defender of the Vale and Lord of the Eyrie. John Aaron's bannerman will never love me, nor our silly, shaking Robert, but they will love their young falcon. And when they come together for his wedding, and you come out with your long auburn hair, clad in a maiden's cloak of white and grey, with a dire wolf emblazoned on the back, why, every knight in the vale will pledge his sword to win you back your birthright. So those are your gifts from me, my sweet Sansa, Harry the Eyrie, and Winterfell. That's worth another kiss now, don't you think? Brienne. This is an evil dream, she thought. But if she were dreaming, why did it hurt so much? The rain had stopped falling, but all the world was wet. Her cloak felt as heavy as her mail. The ropes that bound her wrists were soaked through, but that only made them tighter. No matter how Brienne turned her hands, she could not slip free. She did not understand who had bound her or why. She tried to ask the shadows, but they did not answer. Perhaps they did not hear her. Perhaps they were not real. Under her layers of wet wool and rusting mail, her skin was flushed and feverish. She wondered whether all of this was just a fever dream. She had a horse beneath her, though she could not remember mounting. She lay face down across his hindquarters, like a sack of oats. Her wrists and ankles had been lashed together. The air was damp, the ground cloaked in mist. Her head pounded with every step. She could hear voices, but all she could see was the earth beneath the horse's hooves. There were things broken inside of her. Her face felt swollen, her cheek was sticky with blood, and every jounce and bounce sent a stab of agony through her arm. She could hear Padrick calling her as if from far away. Sir, he kept saying, Sir, my lady! Sir, my lady! His voice was faint and hard to hear. Finally, there was only silence. She dreamt she was at Harren Hall, down in the bear pit once again. This time it was Biter facing her, huge and bald and maggot-white, with weeping sores upon his cheeks. Naked he came, fondling his member, gnashing his filed teeth together. Brienne fled from him. My sword, she called. Oathkeeper, please. The watchers did not answer. Brendan was there, with Nimble Dick and Caitlin Stark. Shagwell, Pig, and Timian had come, and the corpses from the trees with their sunken cheeks, swollen tongues, and empty eye sockets. Brienne wailed in horror at the sight of them, and Biter grabbed her arm and yanked her close and tore a chunk from her face. Jamie! she heard herself scream. Jamie! Even in the depths of dream, the pain was there. Her face throbbed, her shoulder bled, breathing hurt. The pain crackled up her arm like lightning. She cried out for a maester. We have no maester, said a girl's voice, only me. I am looking for a girl, Brienne remembered, a high-born maid of three and ten, with blue eyes and auburn hair. My lady, she said, Lady Sansa. A man laughed. She thinks your Sansa's stark. She can't go much farther. She'll die. One less lion, I won't weep. Brienne heard the sound of someone praying. She thought of Septon Maribald, but all the words were wrong. 
The night is dark and full of terrors, and so are dreams. They were riding through a gloomy wood, a dank, dark, silent place where the pines pressed close. The ground was soft beneath her horse's hooves, and the tracks she left behind filled up with blood. Beside her rode Lord Renly, Dick Crabb, and Vargo Holt. Blood ran from Renly's throat. The goat's torn ear oozed pus. Where are we going? Brienne asked. Where are you taking me? None of them would answer. How can they answer? All of them are dead. Did that mean that she was dead as well? Lord Renly was ahead of her, her sweet smiling king. He was leading her horse through the trees. Brienne called out to tell him how much she loved him, but when he turned to scowl at her, she saw that he was not Renly after all. Renly never scowled. He always had a smile for me, she thought, except... Cold, her king said, puzzled, and a shadow moved without a man to cast it. And her sweet lord's blood came washing through the green steel of his gorget to drench her hands. He had been a warm man, but his blood was cold as ice. This is not real, she told herself. This is another bad dream, and soon I'll wake. Her mount came to a sudden halt. Rough hands seized hold of her. She saw shafts of red afternoon light slanting through the branches of a chestnut tree. A horse rooted amongst the dead leaves after chestnuts. And men moved nearby, talking in quiet voices. Ten, twelve, maybe more. Brienne did not recognize their faces. She was stretched out on the ground, her back against a tree trunk. Drink this, my lady, said the girl's voice. She lifted a cup to Brienne's lips. The taste was strong and sour. Brienne spat it out. Water, she gasped. Please, water. Water won't help the pain. This will, a little. The girl put the cup to Brienne's lips again. It even hurt to drink. Wine ran down her chin and dribbled on her chest. When the cup was empty, the girl filled it from a skin. Brienne sucked it down until she sputtered. No more. More? You have a broken arm, and some of your ribs is cracked. Two, maybe three. Bite her, Brienne said, remembering the weight of him, the way his knee had slammed into her chest. Aye. A real monster, that one. It all came back to her. Lightning above and mud below, the rain pinging softly against the dark steel of the hound's helm, the terrible strength in Biter's hands. Suddenly she could not stand being bound. She tried to wrench free of her ropes, but all that did was chafe her worse. Her wrists were tied too tightly. There was dried blood on the hemp. Is he dead? She trembled. Bite her. Is he dead? She remembered his teeth tearing into the flesh of her face. The thought that he might still be out there somewhere, breathing, made Brienne want to scream. He's dead. Gendry shoved a spear point through the back of his neck. Drink, milady, or I'll pour it down your throat. She drank. I'm looking for a girl, she whispered between swallows. She almost said, my sister. A high-born maid of three and ten. She has blue eyes and auburn hair. I'm not her. No, Brienne could see that. The girl was thin to the point of looking starved. She wore her brown hair in a braid, and her eyes were older than her years. Brown hair? brown eyes, plain. Willow, six years older. You're the sister, the innkeep. I might be, the girl squinted. What if I am? Do you have a name? Brienne asked. Her stomach gurgled. She was afraid that she might retch. 
Heddle, same as Willow. Janie Heddle. Janie, untie my hands, please. Have pity. The ropes are chafing my wrists. I'm bleeding. It's not allowed. You're to stay bound till... till you stand before my lady. Rennie stood behind the girl, pushing his black hair out of his eyes. Not Renly. Gendry. Milady means for you to answer for your crimes. Milady? The wine was making her head spin. It was hard to think. Stoneheart, is that who you mean? Lord Randall had spoken of her back at Maidenpool. Lady Stoneheart. Some call her that. Some call her other things. The Silent Sister. Mother Merciless. The Hangwoman. The Hangwoman. When Brienne closed her eyes, she saw the corpses swaying underneath the bare brown limbs, their faces black and swollen. Suddenly she was desperately afraid. Padrick! My squire! Where is Padrick? And the others, Sir Hyle, Septon Maribald, Dog! What did you do with Dog? Gendry and the girl exchanged a look. Brienne fought to rise and managed to get one knee under her before the world began to spin. It was you killed the dog, my lady, she heard Gendry say, just before the darkness swallowed her again. Then she was back at the whispers, standing amongst the ruins and facing Clarence Crabb. He was huge and fierce, mounted on an aurochs shaggier than he was. The beast pawed the ground in fury, tearing deep furrows in the earth. Crab's teeth had been filed into points. When Brienne went to draw her sword, she found her scabbard empty. No! she cried, as Sir Clarence charged. It wasn't fair. She could not fight without her magic sword. Sir Jamie had given it to her. The thought of failing him, as he had failed Lord Renly, made her want to weep. My sword! Please! I have to find my sword! The wench wants her sword back, a voice declared. And I want Cersei Lannister to suck my cock. So what? Jamie called it Oathkeeper. Please. But the voices did not listen, and Clarence Crabbe thundered down on her and swept off her head. Brienne spiraled down into a deeper darkness. She dreamed that she was lying in a boat, her head pillowed on someone's lap. There were shadows all around them, hooded men in mail and leather, paddling them across a foggy river with muffled oars. She was drenched in sweat, burning, yet somehow shivering, too. The fog was full of faces. Beauty, whispered the willows on the bank, but the reeds said, Freak! Freak! Brienne shuddered. Stop! she said. Someone make them stop! The next time she woke, Janie was holding a cup of hot soup to her lips. Onion broth, Brienne thought. She drank as much of it as she could, until a bit of carrot caught in her throat and made her choke. Coughing was agony. Easy, the girl said. Gendry, she wheezed. I have to talk with Gendry. He turned back at the river, my lady. He's gone back to his forge, to Willow and the little ones, to keep them safe. No one can keep them safe. She began to cough again. Ah, let her choke. Save us a rope. One of the shadow men shoved the girl aside. He was clad in rusted rings and a studded belt. At his hip hung long sword and dirk. A yellow great cloak was plastered to his shoulders, sodden and filthy. From his shoulders rose a steel dog's head, its teeth bared in a snarl. No! Brienne moaned. No! You're dead! I killed you! The hound laughed. You got that backwards. It'll be me killing you. 
I'd do it now, but Milady wants to see you hanged. Hanged? The word sent a jolt of fear through her. She looked at the girl, Janie. She is too young to be so hard. Bread and salt, Brienne gasped. The inn. Septon Maribald fed the children. We broke bread with your sister. Guessed right. Don't mean so much as it used to, said the girl. Not since my lady come back from the wedding. Some of them swinging down by the river figured they was guests, too. We figured different, said the hound. They wanted beds. We gave them trees. We got more trees, though, put in another shadow, one-eyed beneath a rusty pot helm. We always got more trees. When it was time to mount again, they yanked a leather hood down over her face. There were no eye holes. The leather muffled the sounds around her. The taste of onions lingered on her tongue, sharp as the knowledge of her failure. They mean to hang me. She thought of Jamie, of Sansa, of her father back on Tarth, and was glad for the hood. It helped hide the tears welling in her eyes. From time to time she heard the outlaws talking, but she could not make out their words. After a while she gave herself up to weariness and the slow, steady motion of her horse. This time she dreamed that she was home again at evenfall, through the tall, arched windows of her lord father's hall, she could see the sun just going down. I was safe here. I was safe. She was dressed in silk brocade, a quartered gown of blue and red, decorated with golden suns and silver crescent moons. On another girl it might have been a pretty gown, but not on her. She was twelve, ungainly and uncomfortable, waiting to meet the young knight her father had arranged for her to marry, a boy six years her senior, sure to be a famous champion one day. She dreaded his arrival. Her bosom was too small, her hands and feet too big. Her hair kept sticking up, and there was a pimple nestled in the fold beside her nose. "'He will bring a rose for you,' her father promised her. But a rose was no good. A rose could not keep her safe. It was a sword she wanted. Oath-keeper! I have to find the girl! I have to find his honor! Finally the doors opened, and her betrothed strode into her father's hall. She tried to greet him, as she had been instructed, only to have blood come pouring from her mouth. She had bitten her tongue off as she waited. She spat it at the young knight's feet and saw the disgust on his face. Brienne the beauty, he said in a mocking tone. I have seen sows more beautiful than you. He tossed the rose in her face. As he walked away, the griffins on his cloak rippled and blurred and changed to lions. Jamie, she wanted to cry. Jamie, come back for me but her tongue lay on the floor by the rose, drowned in blood. Brienne woke suddenly, gasping. She did not know where she was. The air was cold and heavy. It smelled of earth and worms and mold. She was lying on a pallet beneath a mound of sheepskins, with rock above her head and roots poking through the walls. The only light came from a tallow candle smoking in a pool of melted wax. She pushed aside the sheepskins. Someone had stripped her of her clothes and armor, she saw. She was clad in a brown woolen shift, thin but freshly washed. Her forearm had been splinted and bound up with linen, though. One side of her face felt wet and stiff. When she touched herself, she found some sort of damp poultice covering her cheek and jaw and ear. Bite her. Brienne got to her feet. Her legs felt weak as water, her head as light as air. Is anyone there? Something moved in one of the shadowed alcoves behind the candle. An old gray man clad in rags. 
The blankets that had covered him slipped to the floor. He sat up and rubbed his eyes. Lady Brienne, you gave me a fright. I was dreaming. No, she thought, that was me. What place is this? Is this a dungeon? A cave. Like rats, we must run back to our holes when the dogs come sniffing after us. And there are more dogs every day. He was clad in the ragged remains of an old robe, pink and white. His hair was long and gray and tangled. The loose skin of his cheeks and chin was covered with coarse stubble. Are you hungry? Could you keep down a cup of milk? Perhaps some bread and honey? I want my clothes, my sword. She felt naked without her mail, and she wanted Oathkeeper at her side. The way out. Show me the way out. The floor of the cave was dirt and stone, rough beneath the soles of her feet. Even now she felt light-headed, as if she were floating. The flickering light cast queer shadows. Spirits of the slain, she thought, dancing all about me, hiding when I turned to look at them. Everywhere she saw holes and cracks and crevices, but there was no way to know which passages led out, which would take her deeper into the cave, and which went nowhere. All were black as pitch. Might I feel your brow, my lady? Her jailer's hand was scarred and hard with callous, yet strangely gentle. Your fever has broken, he announced, in a voice flavored with the accents of the free cities. Well and good. Just yesterday your flesh felt as if it were on fire. Janie feared that we might lose you. Janie? The tall girl? The very one though she is not so tall as you, my lady. Long Janie, the men call her. It was she who set your arm and splinted it, as well as any maester. She did what she could for your face as well, washing out the wounds with boiled ale to stop the mortification. Even so, a human bite is a filthy thing. That is where the fever came from, I am certain. The gray man touched her bandaged face. We had to cut away some of the flesh. Your face will not be pretty, I fear. It has never been pretty. Scars, you mean? My lady, that creature chewed off half your cheek. Brienne could not help but flinch. Every knight has battle scars, Sir Goodwin had warned her when she asked him to teach her the sword. Is that what you want, child? Her old master at arms had been talking about sword cuts, though. He could never have anticipated biter's pointed teeth. Why set my bones and wash my wounds if you only mean to hang me? Why, indeed? He glanced at the candle as if he could no longer bear to look at her. You fought bravely at the inn, they tell me. Lem should not have left the crossroads. He was told to stay close, hidden, to come at once if he saw smoke rising from the chimney. But when word reached him that the mad dog of salt pans had been seen making his way north along the green fork, he took the bait. We have been hunting that lot for so long. Still, he ought to have known better. As it was, it was half a day before he realized that the mummers had used a stream to hide their tracks and doubled back behind him. And then he lost more time circling around a column of fray knights. If not for you, only corpses might have remained at the inn by the time that Lem and his men got back. That was why Janie dressed your wounds, mayhaps. Whatever else you may have done, you won those wounds honorably, in the best of causes. Whatever else you may have done. What is it that you think I've done? she said. Who are you? 
We were king's men when we began, the man told her. But king's men must have a king, and we have none. We were brothers, too, but now our brotherhood is broken. I do not know who we are, if truth be told, nor where we might be going. I only know the road is dark. The fires have not shown me what lies at its end. I know where it ends. I have seen the corpses in the trees. Fires, Brienne repeated. All at once she understood. You are the Mirish priest, the Red Wizard. He looked down at his ragged robes and smiled ruefully. The pink pretender, rather. I am Thoros, late of Mir, I. A bad priest, and a worse wizard. You ride with the Dondarian, the Lightning Lord. Lightning comes and goes, and then is seen no more. So too with men. Lord Beric's fire has gone out of this world, I fear. A grimmer shadow leads us in his place. The hound? The priest pursed his lips. The hound is dead and buried. I saw him in the woods. A fever dream, my lady. He said that he would hang me. Even dreams can lie. My lady, how long has it been since you have eaten? Surely you are famished. She was, she realized. Her belly felt hollow. Food. Food would be welcome, thank you. A meal, then. Sit. We will talk more. But first, a meal. Wait here. Thoros lit a taper from the sagging candle and vanished into a black hole beneath a ledge of rock. Brienne found herself alone in the small cave. For how long, though? She prowled the chamber, looking for a weapon. Any sort of weapon would have served a staff, a club, a dagger. She found only rocks. One fit her fist nicely. But she remembered the whispers and what happened when Shagwell tried to put a stone against the knife. When she heard the priest returning footsteps, she let the rock fall to the cavern floor and resumed her seat. Thoros had bread and cheese and a bowl of stew. I am sorry, he said. The last of the milk had soured, and the honey is all gone. Food grows scant. Still, this will fill you. The stew was cold and greasy, the bread hard, the cheese harder. Brienne had never eaten anything half so good. Are my companions here? she asked the priest, as she was spooning up the last of the stew. The septon was set free to go upon his way. There was no harm in him. The others are here, awaiting judgment. Judgment? she frowned. Padrick Payne is just a boy. He says he is a squire. You know how boys will boast. The imp's squire. He has fought in battles by his own admission. He has even killed, to hear him tell it. A boy, she said again. Have pity. My lady, Thora said, I do not doubt that kindness and mercy and forgiveness can still be found somewhere in these seven kingdoms, but do not look for them here. This is a cave, not a temple. When men must live like rats in the dark beneath the earth, they soon run out of pity, as they do of milk and honey. And justice? Can that be found in caves? Justice? Thoros smiled wanly. I remember justice. It had a pleasant taste. Justice was what we were about when Beric led us, or so we told ourselves. 
We were king's men, knights and heroes. But some knights are dark and full of terror, my lady. War makes monsters of us all. Are you saying you are monsters? I am saying we are human. You are not the only one with wounds, Lady Brienne. Some of my brothers were good men when this began. Some were less good, shall we say? Though there are those who say it does not matter how a man begins, but only how he ends, I suppose it is the same for women. The priest got to his feet. Our time together is at an end, I fear. I hear my brothers coming. Our lady sends for you. Brienne heard their footsteps and saw a torchlight flickering in the passage. You told me she had gone to Fear Market. And so she had. She returned whilst we were sleeping. She never sleeps herself. I will not be afraid, she told herself, but it was too late for that. I will not let them see my fear, she promised herself instead. There were four of them, hard men with haggard faces, clad in mail and scale and leather. She recognized one of them, the man with one eye, from her dreams. The biggest of the four wore a stained and tattered yellow cloak. Enjoy the food, he asked. I hope so. It's the last food you're ever like to eat. He was brown-haired, bearded, brawny, with a broken nose that had healed badly. I know this man, Brienne thought. You are the hound. He grinned. His teeth were awful, crooked and streaked brown with rot. I suppose I am, seeing as how Milady went and killed the last one. He turned his head and spat. She remembered lightning flashing, the mud beneath her feet. It was Rorge I killed. He took the helm from Clegane's grave, and you stole it off his corpse? I didn't hear him objecting. Thoros sucked in his breath in dismay. Is this true? A dead man's helm? Have we fallen that low? The big man scowled at him. It's good steel. There is nothing good about that helm, nor the men who wore it, said the Red Priest. Sandor Clegane was a man in torment, and Rorge a beast in human skin. I'm not them. Then why show the world their face? Savage, snarling, twisted? Is that who you would be, Lem? The sight of it will make my foes afraid. The sight of it makes me afraid. Close your eyes, then. The man in the yellow cloak made a sharp gesture. Bring the whore. Brienne did not resist. There were four of them, and she was weak and wounded, naked beneath the woolen shift. She had to bend her neck to keep from hitting her head as they marched her through the twisting passage. The way ahead rose sharply, turning twice before emerging in a much larger cavern full of outlaws. A fire pit had been dug into the center of the floor, and the air was blue with smoke. Men clustered near the flames, warming themselves against the chill of the cave. Others stood along the walls or sat cross-legged on straw pallets. There were women, too, and even a few children peering out from behind their mother's skirts. The one face Brienne knew belonged to Long Janie Heddle. A trestle table had been set up across the cave in a cleft in the rock. Behind it sat a woman all in gray, cloaked and hooded. In her hands was a crown, a bronze circlet ringed by iron swords. She was studying it, her fingers stroking the blades as if to test their sharpness. Her eyes glimmered under her hood. Gray was the color of the silent sisters, the handmaidens of the stranger. Brienne felt a shiver climb her spine. 
Stoneheart. Milady, said the big man, here she is. Aye, added the one-eyed man, the Kingslayer's whore. She flinched. Why would you call me that? If I had a silver stag for every time you said his name, I'd be as rich as your friends the Lannisters. That was only... You do not understand. Don't we, though? The big man laughed. I think we might. There's a stink of lion about you, lady. That's not so. Another of the outlaws stepped forward, a younger man in a greasy sheepskin jerkin. In his hand was Oathkeeper. This says it is. His voice was frosted with the accents of the North. He slid the sword from its scabbard and placed it in front of Lady Stoneheart. In the light from the fire pit, the red and black ripples in the blade almost seemed to move, but the woman in grey had eyes only for the pommel. A golden lion's head, with ruby eyes that shone like two red stars. There is this as well. Thoros of Mir drew a parchment from his sleeve and put it down next to the sword. It bears the boy king's seal, and says the bearer is about his business. Lady Stoneheart set the sword aside to read the letter. The sword was given me for a good purpose, said Brienne. Sir Jamie swore an oath to Caitlin Stark. Before his friends cut her throat for her, that must have been, said the big man in the yellow cloak. We all know about the Kingslayer and his oaths. It is no good, Brienne realized. No words of mine will sway them. She plunged ahead despite that. He promised Lady Caitlin her daughters, but by the time we reached King's Landing, they were gone. Jamie sent me out to seek the Lady Sansa. And if you had found the girl, asked the young Northman, what were you to do with her? Protect her. Take her somewhere safe. The big man laughed. Where is that? Cersei's dungeon? No. Deny it all you want. That sword says you're a liar. Are we supposed to believe the Lannisters are handing out gold and ruby swords to foes? That the Kingslayer meant for you to hide the girl from his own twin? I suppose the paper with the boy's king's seal was just in case you needed to wipe your arse. And then there's the company you keep. The big man turned and beckoned. The ranks of outlaws parted, and two more captives were brought forth. The boy was the imp's own squire, my lady, he said to Lady Stoneheart. T'other is one of Randall Bloody Tarley's bloody household knights. Isle Hunt had been beaten so badly that his face was swollen almost beyond recognition. He stumbled as they shoved him and almost fell. Padrick caught him by the arm. Sir, the boy said miserably when he saw Brienne. My lady, I mean, sorry. You have nothing to be sorry for. Brienne turned to Lady Stoneheart. Whatever treachery you think I may have done, my lady, Padrick and Sir Hyle were no part of it. They're lions, said the one-eyed man. That's enough. I say they hang. Tarly's hanged a score of ours. Past time we strung up some of his. Sir Hyle gave Brienne a faint smile. My lady, he said, you should have wed me when I made my offer. Now I fear you're doomed to die a maid and me a poor man. Let them go, Brienne pleaded. The woman in grey gave no answer. She studied the sword, the parchment, the bronze and iron crown. Finally she reached up under her jaw and grasped her neck, as if she meant to throttle herself. Instead she spoke. Her voice was halting, broken, tortured. The sound seemed to come from her throat, part croak, part wheeze, 
part death rattle. The language of the damned, thought Brienne. I don't understand. What did she say? She asked the name of this blade of yours, said the young Northman in the sheepskin jerkin. Oathkeeper, Brienne answered. The woman in grey hissed through her fingers. Her eyes were two red pits burning in the shadows. She spoke again. No, she says. Call it Oathbreaker, she says. It was made for treachery and murder. She names it False Friend, like you. To whom have I been false? To her, the Northman said. Can it be that my lady has forgotten that you once swore her your service? There was only one woman that the Maid of Tarth had ever sworn to serve. That cannot be, she said. She is dead. Death and guest right, wanted long Janie Heddle. They don't mean so much as they used to, neither one. Lady Stoneheart lowered her hood and unwound the grey wool scarf from her face. Her hair was dry and brittle, white as bone. Her brow was mottled green and grey, spotted with the brown blooms of decay. The flesh of her face clung in ragged strips from her eyes down to her jaw. Some of the rips were crusted with dried blood, but others gaped open to reveal the skull beneath. Her face, Brienne thought, her face was so strong and handsome, her skin so smooth and soft. Lady Caitlin? Tears filled her eyes. They said, they said that you were dead. She is, said Thoros of Mir. The phrase slashed her throat from ear to ear. When we found her by the river, she was three days dead. Harwin begged me to give her the kiss of life, but it had been too long. I would not do it, so Lord Berwick put his lips to hers instead, and the flame of life passed from him to her. And she rose. May the Lord of Light protect us. She rose. Am I dreaming still? Brienne wondered. Is this another nightmare born from biter's teeth? I never betrayed her. Tell her that. I swear it by the seven. I swear it by my sword. The thing that had been Caitlin Stark took hold of her throat again. Fingers pinching at the ghastly long slash in her neck and choked out more sounds. Words are wind, she says, the North man told Brienne. She says that you must prove your faith. How? asked Brienne. With your sword, oath keeper, you call it? Then keep your oath to her, my lady says. What does she want of me? She wants her son alive, or the man who killed him dead, said the big man. She wants to feed the crows like they did at the Red Wedding. Frey's and Bolton's eye. We'll give her those, as many as she likes. All she asks from you is Jamie Lannister. Jamie. The name was a knife twisting in her belly. Lady Caitlin, I... You do not understand. Jamie. He saved me from being raped when the bloody mummers took us, and later he came back for me. He leapt into the bear pit empty-handed. I swear to you, he is not the man he was. He sent me after Sansa to keep her safe. He could not have had a part in the Red Wedding. Lady Caitlin's fingers dug deep into her throat, and the words came rattling out. Choked and broken, a stream as cold as ice. The Northman said, She says that you must choose. Take the sword and slay the Kingslayer, or be hanged for a betrayer. The sword or the noose, 
she says. Choose, she says. Choose. Brienne remembered her dream, waiting in her father's hall for the boy she was to marry. In the dream she had bitten off her tongue. My mouth was full of blood. She took a ragged breath and said, I will not make that choice. There was a long silence. Then Lady Stoneheart spoke again. This time Brienne understood her words. There were only two. Hang them, she croaked. As you command, my lady, said the big man. They bound Brienne's wrists with rope again and led her from the cavern up a twisting stony path to the surface. It was morning outside, she was surprised to see. Shafts of pale dawn light were slanting through the trees. So many trees to choose from, she thought. They will not need to take us far. Nor did they. Beneath a crooked willow, the outlaws slipped a noose about her neck, jerked it tight, and tossed the other end of the rope over a limb. Hyle Hunt and Podrick Payne were given elms. Sir Hyle was shouting that he would kill Jamie Lannister, but the hound cuffed him across the face and shut him up. He had donned the helm again. If you got crimes to confess to your gods, this would be the time to say them. Padrick has never harmed you. My father will ransom him. Tarth is called the Sapphire Isle. Send Padrick with my bones to Evenfall, and you'll have sapphires, silver, whatever you want. I want my wife and daughter back, said the hound. Can your father give me that? If not, he can get buggered. The boy will rot beside you. Wolves will gnaw your bones. Do you mean to hang her, Lem? asked the one-eyed man. Or do you figure to talk the bitch to death? The hound snatched the end of the rope from the man holding it. Let's see if she can dance, he said, and gave a yank. Brienne felt the hemp constricting, digging into her skin, jerking her chin upward. Sir Hyle was cursing them eloquently, but not the boy. Podrick never lifted his eyes, not even when his feet were jerked up off the ground. If this is another dream, it is time for me to awaken. If this is real, it is time for me to die. All she could see was Podrick, the noose around his thin neck, his legs twitching. Her mouth opened. Pod was kicking choking, dying. Brienne sucked the air in desperately, even as the rope was strangling her. Nothing had ever hurt so much. She screamed a word. Circe. Septimo Well was a white-haired harridan with a face as sharp as an axe and lips pursed in perpetual disapproval. This one still has her maiden head, I'll wager, Circe thought though by now it's hard and stiff as boiled leather. Six of the High Sparrow's knights escorted her. With the rainbow sword of their reborn order emblazoned on their kite shields. Septa, Circe sat beneath the iron throne, clad in green silk and golden lace. Tell his High Holiness that we are vexed with him. He presumes too much. Emeralds glimmered on her fingers and in her golden hair. The eyes of court and city were upon her, and she meant for them to see Lord Tywin's daughter. By the time this mummer's farce was done, they would know they had but one true queen. But first we must dance the dance, and never miss a step. Lady Marjorie is my son's true and gentle wife, his helpmate and consort, his High Holiness had no cause to lay his hands upon her person, or to confine her and her young cousins, who are so dear to all of us. I demand that he release them. Septimoel's stern expression did not flicker. I shall convey your grace's words to his High Holiness, but it grieves me to say that the young queen and her ladies cannot be released until and unless their innocence has been proved. Innocence? 
why you need only look upon their sweet young faces to see how innocent they are. A sweet face oft hides a sinner's heart. Lord Merriweather spoke up from the council table. What offense have these young maids been accused of, and by whom? The scepter said, Mega Tyrell and Eleanor Tyrell stand accused of lewdness, fornication, and conspiracy to commit high treason. Ella Tyrell has been charged with witnessing their shame and helping them conceal it. All this Queen Marjorie has also been accused of, as well as adultery and high treason. Cersei put her hand to her breast. Tell me who is spreading such calumnies about my good daughter. I do not believe a word of this. My sweet son loves Lady Marjorie with all his heart. She could never have been so cruel as to play him false. The accuser is a knight of your own household. Sir Osney Kettleblack has confessed his carnal knowledge of the Queen to the High Septon himself, before the altar of the Father. At the council table, Harris Swift gasped, and Grand Maester Purcell turned away. A buzz filled the air, as if a thousand wasps were loose in the throne room. Some of the ladies in the galleries began to slip away, followed by a stream of petty lords and knights from the back of the hall. The gold cloaks let them go, but the queen had instructed Sir Osfred to make note of all who fled. Suddenly the Tyrol rose does not smell so sweet. Sir Osney is young and lusty, I will grant you, the queen said. But a faithful knight for all that. If he says that he was part of this, no, it cannot be. Marjorie is a maiden. She is not. I examined her myself, at the behest of his high holiness. Her maidenhead is not intact. Septa Aglantine and Septa Millicent will say the same, as will Queen Marjorie's own Septa, Nysterica who has been confined to a penitent cell for her part in the Queen's shame. Lady Mega and Lady Eleanor were examined as well. Both were found to have been broken. The wasps were growing so loud that the Queen could hardly hear herself think. I do hope the little Queen and her cousins enjoyed those rides of theirs. Lord Merriweather thumped his fist on the table. Lady Marjorie had sworn solemn oaths attesting to her maidenhood, to her grace the queen, and her late father. Many here bore witness. Lord Tyrell has also testified to her innocence, as has the Lady Olenna, whom we all know to be above reproach. Would you have us believe that all of these noble people lied to us? Perhaps they were deceived as well, my lord said Septimuel. I cannot speak to this. I can only swear to the truth of what I discovered for myself when I examined the Queen. The picture of this sour old crone poking her wrinkled fingers up Marjorie's little pink cunt was so droll that Circe almost laughed. We insist that His High Holiness allow our own maesters to examine my good daughter to determine if there is any shred of truth to these slanders. Grand Maester Pissel, you shall accompany Septa Moel back to beloved Bela's Sept, and return to us with the truth about our Marjorie's maidenhead. Pissel had gone the color of curdled white. At council meetings the wretched old fool cannot say enough, but now that I need a few words from him he has lost the power of speech. The Queen thought, before the old man finally came out with, "'There is no need for me to examine her, her privy parts.' His voice was a quaver. "'I grieve to say Queen Marjorie is no maiden. She has required me to make her moon tea, not once, but many times.' The uproar that followed was all that Cersei Lannister could ever have hoped for. Even the royal herald beating on the floor with his staff did little to quell the noise. 
The queen let it wash over her for a few heartbeats, savoring the sounds of the little queen's disgrace. When it had gone on long enough, she rose, stone-faced, and commanded that the gold cloaks clear the hall. Marjorie Tyrell is done, she thought, exulting. Her white knights fell in around her as she made her exit through the king's door behind the iron throne. Boris Blount, Marin Trent, and Osmond Kettleblack, the last of the king's guards still remaining in the city. Moonboy was standing beside the door, holding his rattle in his hand, and gaping at the confusion with his big round eyes. A fool he may be, but he wears his folly honestly. Maggie the Frog should have been in Motley, too, for all she knew about the morrow. Circe prayed the old fraud was screaming down in hell. The younger queen, whose coming she'd foretold, was finished, and if that prophecy could fail, so could the rest. No golden shrouds, no valonqar. I am free of your croaking malice at last. The remnants of her small council followed her out. Harris Swift appeared dazed. He stumbled at the door, and might have fallen if Orain Waters had not caught him by the arm. Even Orton Merriweather seemed anxious. "'The small folk are fond of the little queen,' he said. "'They will not take well to this. I fear what might happen next, Your Grace.' "'Lord Merriweather is right,' said Lord Waters. "'If it please, Your Grace, I will launch the rest of our new dramons.' The sight of them upon the black water with King Toman's banner flying from the masts will remind the city who rules here, and keep them safe should the mobs decide to run riot again. He left the rest unspoken. Once on the black water, his Dromans could stop Mace Tyrell from bringing his army back across the river, just as Tyrion had once stopped Stannis. Highgarden had no sea power of its own this side of Westeros. They relied upon the Red Wine fleet, presently on its way back to the arbor. A prudent measure, the Queen announced, until this storm has passed. I want your ships crewed and on the water. Sir Harris Swift was so pale and damp he looked about to faint. When word of this reaches Lord Tyrell, his fury will know no bounds. There will be blood in the streets. The night of the yellow chicken, Circe mused. You ought to take a worm for your sigil, sir. A chicken is too bold for you. If Mace Tyrell will not even assault Storm's End, how do you imagine that he would ever dare attack the gods? When he was done blathering, she said, It must not come to blood. I mean to see that it does not. I will go to Baylor's Sept myself, to speak to Queen Marjorie and the High Septon. Toman loves them both, I know, and would want me to make peace between them. Peace? Sir Harris dabbed at his brow with a velvet sleeve. If peace is possible, that is very brave of you. Some sort of trial may be necessary, said the Queen, to disprove these base calumnies and lies, and show the world that our sweet Marjorie is the innocent we all know her to be. Aye, said Merriweather, but this high septon may want to try the queen himself, as the faith once tried men of old. I hope so, Circe thought. Such a court was not like to look with favor on treasonous queens who spread their legs for singers and profaned the maiden's holy rites to hide their shame. The important thing is to find the truth. I am sure we all agree, she said. And now, my lords, you must excuse me. I must go see the king. He should not be alone at such a time. Toman was fishing for cats when his mother returned to him. Dorcas had made him a mouse with scraps of fur and tied it on a long string at the end of an old fishing pole. The kittens loved to chase it, and the boy liked nothing better than jerking it about the floor as they pounced after it. He seemed surprised when Circe gathered him up in her arms and kissed him on his brow. "'What's that for, mother? Why are you crying?' "'Because you're safe,' she wanted to tell him. 
because no harm will ever come to you. You are mistaken. A lion never cries. It would be time later to tell him about Marjorie and her cousins. There are some warrants that I need you to sign. For the king's sake, the queen had left the names off the arrest warrants. Tommen signed them blank and pressed his seal into the warm wax happily, as he always did. Afterward, she sent him off with Jocelyn Swift. Sir Osford Kettleblack arrived as the ink was drying. Circe had written in the names herself. Sir Talad the Tall, Jalabar Shoal, Hamish the Harper, Hugh Clifton, Mark Mullendore, Bayard Norcross, Lambert Turnberry, Horace Redwine, Hobber Redwine, and a certain churl named Watt, who called himself the Blue Bard. So many, Sir Osford shuffled through the warrants, as wary of the words as if they had been roaches crawling across the parchment. None of the kettle blacks could read. Ten. You have six thousand gold cloaks, sufficient for ten, I would think. Some of the clever ones may have fled, if the rumors reached their ears in time. If so, it makes no matter. Their absence only makes them look that much more guilty. Sir Talent is a bit of an oaf, and may try to resist you. See that he does not die before confessing, and do no harm to any of the others. A few may well be innocent. It was important that the red wine twins be found to have been falsely accused. That would demonstrate the fairness of the judgments against the others. We'll have them all before the sun comes up, Your Grace. Sir Osford hesitated. There's a crowd gathering outside the door of Baylor's Sept. What sort of crowd? Anything unexpected made her wary. She remembered what Lord Waters had said about the riots. I had not considered how the small folk might react to this. Marjorie has been their little pet. How many? A hundred or so. They're shouting for the High Septon to release the little queen. We can send them running, if you like. No. Let them shout until they're hoarse. It will not sway the sparrow. He only listens to the gods. There was a certain irony in his high holiness having an angry mob encamped upon his doorstep, since just such a mob had raised him to the crystal crown, which he promptly sold. The faith has its own knights now. Let them defend the sept. Oh, and close the city gates as well. No one is to enter or leave King's Landing without my leave, until all this is done and settled. As you command, Your Grace. Sir Osford bowed and went off to find someone to read the warrants to him. By the time the sun went down that day, all of the accused traitors were in custody. Hamish the Harper had collapsed when they came for him, and Sir Talley the Tall had wounded three gold cloaks before the others overwhelmed him. Circe ordered that the red wine twins be given comfortable chambers in a tower. The rest went down to the dungeons. Hamish is having difficulty breathing, Kyvan informed her when he came to call that night. He is calling for a maester. Tell him he can have one as soon as he confesses. She thought a moment. He is too old to have been amongst the lovers, but no doubt he was made to play and sing for Marjorie whilst she was entertaining other men. We will need details. I shall help him to remember them, Your Grace. The next day Lady Merriweather helped Circe dress for their visit to the little queen. Nothing too rich or colorful, she said. Something suitably devout and drab for the high septon. He's like to make me pray with him. In the end she chose a soft woolen dress that covered her from throat to ankle. With only a few small vines embroidered on the bodice and the sleeves, in golden thread, to soften the severity of its lines. Even better, Brown would help conceal the dirt if she was made to kneel. Whilst I am comforting my good daughter, you shall speak with the three cousins, she told Tana. Win Allah if you can, but be careful what you say. The gods may not be the only ones listening. 
Jamie always said that the hardest part of any battle is just before, waiting for the carnage to begin. When she stepped outside, Cersei saw that the sky was gray and bleak. She could not take the risk of being caught in a downpour and arriving at Baylor's sept soaked and bedraggled. That meant the litter. For her escort, she took ten Lannister house guards and Boris Blount. Marjorie's mob may not have the wit to tell one kettle black from another, she told Sir Osmond. And I cannot have you cutting through the commons. Best we keep you out of sight for a time. As they made their way across King's Landing, Tana had a sudden doubt. This trial, she said in a quiet voice, what if Marjorie demands that her guilt or innocence be determined by wager of battle? A smile brushed Cersei's lips. As queen, her honor must be defended by a knight of the king's guard. Why, every child in Westeros knows how Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight championed his sister Queen Nerys against Sir Morgil's accusations. With Sir Loras so gravely wounded, though, I fear Prince Aemon's part must fall to one of his sworn brothers. She shrugged. Who, though? Sir Aris and Sir Balan are far away in Dorne. Jaime is off at River Run, and Sir Osmond is the brother of the man accusing her. Which leaves only... Oh, dear. Boris Blount and Marin Trant. Lady Taina laughed. Yes, and Sir Marin has been feeling ill of late. Remind me to tell him that when we return to the castle. I shall, my sweet. Tina took her hand and kissed it. I pray that I never offend you. You are terrible when roused. Any mother would do the same to protect her children, said Cersei. When do you mean to bring that boy of yours to court? Russell, was that his name? He could train with Toman. That would thrill the boy, I know. But things are so uncertain just now... I thought it best to wait until the danger passed. Soon enough, promised Circe. Send word to Longtable, and have Russell pack his best doublet and his wooden sword. A new young friend will be just the thing to help Tone forget his loss, after Marjorie's little head has rolled. They descended from the litter under Blessed Baylor's statue. The Queen was pleased to see that the bones and filth had been cleaned away. Sir Osford had told it true. The crowd was neither as numerous nor as unruly as the sparrows had been. They stood about in small clumps, gazing sullenly at the doors of the great sept, where a line of novice septons had been drawn up with quarterstaffs in their hands. No steel, Circe noted. That was either very wise or very stupid. She was not sure which. No one made any attempt to hinder her. Small folk and novices alike parted as they passed. Once inside the doors they were met by three knights in the Hall of Lamps, each clad in the rainbow-striped robes of the warrior's sons. "'I am here to see my good daughter,' Circe told them. "'His High Holiness has been expecting you. I am Sir Theodan the True, formerly Sir Theodan Wells. If your grace will come with me.' The High Sparrow was on his knees as ever. This time he was praying before the Father's altar. Nor did he break off his prayer when the Queen approached, but made her wait impatiently until he had finished. Only then did he rise and bow to her. Your Grace, this is a sad day. Very sad. Do we have your leave to speak with Marjorie and her cousins? She chose a meek and humble manner. With this man, that was like to work the best. If that is your wish, come to me afterward, my child. We must pray together, you and I. The little queen had been confined atop one of the great Seth's slender towers. Her cell was eight feet long and six feet wide, with no furnishings, but a straw-stuffed pallet and a bench for prayer, a ewer of water, a copy of the seven-pointed star, and a candle to read it by. 
The only window was hardly wider than a narrow slit. Cersei found Marjorie barefoot and shivering, clad in the rough-spun shift of a novice sister. Her locks were all a tangle, and her feet were filthy. They took my clothes from me, the little queen told her once they were alone. I wore a gown of ivory lace with freshwater pearls on the bodies, but the scepters laid their hands on me and stripped me to the skin. My cousins, too. Mega sent one scepter crashing into the candles and set her robe afire. I fear for Allah, though. She went as white as milk, too frightened even to cry. Poor child. There were no chairs, so Circe sat beside the little queen on her pallet. Lady Tana has gone to speak with her, to let her know that she is not forgotten. He will not even let me see them, fumed Marjorie. He keeps each of us apart from the others. Until you came, I was allowed no visitors but septas. One comes every hour to ask if I wish to confess my fornications. They will not even let me sleep. They wake me to demand confessions. Last night I confessed to Septa Unella that I wished to scratch her eyes out. A shame you did not do it. Circe thought, blinding some poor old Septa would certainly persuade the high sparrow of your guilt. They are questioning your cousins the same way. Damn them, then, said Marjorie. Damn them all to seven hells. Anna is gentle and shy. How can they do this to her? And Mega, she laughs as loud as a dockside whore, I know, but inside she's still just a little girl. I love them all, and they love me. If this sparrow thinks to make them lie about me, they stand accused as well, I fear. All three. My cousins? Marjorie paled. Ella and Mega are hardly more than children. Your Grace, this, this is obscene. Will you take us out of here? Would that I could. Her voice was full of sorrow. His High Holiness has his new knights guarding you. To free you I would need to send the gold cloaks and profane this holy place with killing. Circe took Marjorie's hand in hers. I have not been idle, though. I have gathered up all those that Sir Osney named as your lovers. They will tell his high holiness of your innocence, I am certain, and swear to it at your trial. Trial? There was real fear in the girl's voice now. Must there be a trial? How else will you prove your innocence? Circe gave Marjorie's hand a reassuring squeeze. It is your right to decide the manner of the trial, to be sure. You are the queen. The knights of the king's guard are sworn to defend you. Marjorie understood at once. A trial by battle? Norris is hurt, though. Elsewise he... He has six brothers. Marjorie stared at her, then pulled her hand away. Is that a jape? Boris is a craven. Marin is old and slow. Your brother is maimed. The other two are off in Dorne, and Osmond is a bloody kettle-black. Loris has two brothers, not six. If there's to be a trial by battle, I want Garland as my champion. Sir Garland is not a member of the King's Guard, the Queen said. When the Queen's honor is at issue, law and custom require that her champion be one of the King's sworn seven. The High Septon will insist, I fear. I will make certain of it. Marjorie did not answer at once, but her brown eyes narrowed in suspicion. Blount or Trent, she said at last. It would have to be one of them. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Osney Kettleblack would cut either one to pieces. Seven hells. Cersei donned a look of hurt. You wrong me, daughter. All I want is your son all for yourself. He will never have a wife that you don't hate, and I am not your daughter, thank the gods. Leave me. You are being foolish. I am only here to help you. To help me to my grave? 
I asked for you to leave. Will you make me call my jailers and have you dragged away, you vile, scheming, evil bitch? Cersei gathered up her skirts and dignity. This must be very frightening for you. I shall forgive those words. Here, as at court, one never knew who might be listening. I would be afraid as well in your place. Grandmaster Pissell has admitted providing you with moon tea and your blue bard. If I were you, my lady, I would pray to the crone for wisdom and to the mother for her mercy. I fear you may soon be in dire need of both. Four shriveled septas escorted the queen down the tower steps. Each of the crones seemed more feeble than the last. When they reached the ground, they continued down into the heart of Visenya's hill. The steps ended well below the earth, where a line of flickering torches lit a long hallway. She found the high septon waiting for her in a small seven-sided audience chamber. The room was sparse and plain, with bare stone walls, a rough-hewn table, three chairs, and a prayer bench. The faces of the seven had been carved into the walls. Cersei thought the carvings crude and ugly, but there was a certain power to them, especially about the eyes. Orbs of onyx, malachite, and yellow moonstone that somehow made the faces come alive. You spoke with the queen, the high septon said. She resisted the urge to say, I am the queen. I did. All men sin, even kings and queens. I have sinned myself and been forgiven. Without confession, though, there can be no forgiveness. The queen will not confess. Perhaps she is innocent. She is not. Holy scepters have examined her and testify that her maiden head is broken. She has drunk of moon tea to murder the fruit of her fornications in her womb. An anointed knight has sworn upon his sword to having carnal knowledge of her and two of her three cousins. Others have lain with her as well, he says, and names many names of men both great and humble. My gold cloaks have taken all of them to the dungeons, Circe assured him. Only one has yet been questioned, a singer called the Blue Bard. What he had to say was disturbing. Even so, I pray that when my good daughter is brought to trial, her innocence may yet be proved. She hesitated. Toman loves his little queen so much, your holiness. I fear it might be hard for him or his lords to judge her justly. Perhaps the faith should conduct the trial? The high sparrow steepled his thin hands. I have had the selfsame thought, your grace. Just as Magor the Cruel once took the swords from the faith, so J. Harris the Conciliator deprived us of the scales of judgment. Yet who is truly fit to judge a queen, save the seven above and the god sworn below? A sacred court of seven judges shall sit upon this case. Three shall be of your female sex, a maiden, a mother, and a crone. Who could be more suited to judge the wickedness of women? That would be for the best. To be sure, Marjorie does have the right to demand that her guilt or innocence be proven by wager of battle. If so, her champion must be one of Toman's seven. The knights of the King's Guard have served as the rightful champions of king and queen since the days of Aegon the Conqueror. Crown and faith speak as one on this. Cersei covered her face with her hands, as if in grief. When she raised her head again, a tear glistened in one eye. These are sad days, indeed, she said, but I am pleased to find us so much in agreement. If Toman were here, I know he would thank you. Together, you and I must find the truth. We shall. I must return to the castle. With your leave, I will take Sir Osney Kettleblack back with me. The small council will want to question him, and hear his accusations for themselves. No, said the high septon. 
It was only a word, one little word, but to Circe it felt like a splash of icy water in the face. She blinked, and her certainty flickered just a little. Sir Osney will be held securely, I promise you. He is held securely here. Come, I will show you. Circe could feel the eyes of the seven staring at her, eyes of jade and malachite and onyx, and a sudden shiver of fear went through her, cold as ice. I am the queen, she told herself, Lord Tywin's daughter. Reluctantly, she followed. Sir Osney was not far. The chamber was dark, and closed by a heavy iron door. The high septum produced the key to open it, and took a torch down from the wall to light the room within. After you, your grace. Within, Osney Kettleblack hung naked from the ceiling, swinging from a pair of heavy iron chains. He had been whipped, his back and shoulders been laid almost bare, and cuts and welts crisscrossed his legs and arse as well. The queen could hardly stand to look at him. He turned back to the high septon. What have you done? We have sought after the truth, most earnestly. He told you the truth. He came to you of his own free will and confessed his sins. Aye, he did that. I have heard many men confess, Your Grace, but seldom have I heard a man so pleased to be so guilty. You whipped him. There can be no penance without pain. No man should spare himself the scourge, as I told Sir Osney. I seldom feel so close to God as when I am being whipped for mine own wickedness though my darkest sins are no wise near as black as his. Oh, but, she sputtered, you preach the mother's mercy. Sir Osney shall taste of that sweet milk in the afterlife. In the seven-pointed star it is written that all sins may be forgiven, but crimes must still be punished. Osney Kettleblack is guilty of treason and murder, and the wages of treason are death. He is just a priest. He cannot do this. It is not for the faith to condemn a man to death, whatever his offense. Whatever his offense. The High Septon repeated the words slowly, weighing them. Strange to say, Your Grace. The more diligently we applied the scourge, the more Sir Osney's offences seemed to change. He would now have us believe that he never touched Marjorie Tyrell. Is that not so, Sir Osney? Osney Kettleblack opened his eyes. When he saw the Queen standing there before him, he ran his tongue across his swollen lips and said, The wall! You promised me the wall. He is mad, said Circe. You have driven him mad. Sir Osney, said the High Septon in a firm, clear voice, did you have carnal knowledge of the Queen? Aye. The chains rattled softly as Osney twisted in his shackles. That one there. She's the Queen I fucked. The one sent me to kill the old High Septon. He never had no guards. I just come in when he was sleeping and pushed a pillow down across his face. Circe whirled and ran. The High Septon tried to seize her, but he was some old sparrow and she was a lioness of the rock. She pushed him aside and burst through the door, slamming it behind her with a clang. The Kettle Blacks. I need the Kettle Blacks. I will send in Osfrid with the gold cloaks and Osmond with the king's guard. Osney will deny it all once they cut him free, and I'll rid myself of this high septon just as I did the other. The four old septas blocked her way and clutched at her with wrinkled hands. She knocked one to the floor and clawed another across the face and gained the steps. Halfway up, 
She remembered Tina Merriweather. It made her stumble, panting. Seven save me, she prayed. Tina knows it all. If they take her, too, and whip her. She ran as far as the sept, but no farther. There were women waiting for her there, more septas and silent sisters, too, younger than the four old crones below. I am the queen, she shouted, backing away from them. I will have your heads for this. I will have all your heads. Let me pass. Instead, they laid hands upon her. Circe ran to the altar of the mother, but they caught her there, a score of them, and dragged her kicking up the tower steps. Inside the cell, three silent sisters held her down as a scepter named Scolera stripped her bare. She even took her small clothes. Another scepter tossed a rough-spun shift at her. You cannot do this, the queen kept screaming at them. I am a Lannister. Unhand me. My brother will kill you. Jamie will slice you open from throat to cunt. Unhand me. I am the queen. The queen should pray, said Septa Scolera, before they left her naked in the cold, bleak cell. She was not meek Marjorie Tyrell, to don her little shift and submit to such captivity. I will teach them what it means to put a lion in a cage, Circe thought. She tore the shift into a hundred pieces, found a ewer of water, and smashed it against the wall, then did the same with the chamber pot. When no one came, she began to pound on the door with her fists. Her escort was below, on the plaza. Ten Lannister guardsmen and Sir Boris Blount. Once they hear, they'll come free me, and we'll drag the bloody High Sparrow back to the Red Keep in chains. She screamed and kicked and howled until her throat was raw, at the door and at the window. No one shouted back, nor came to rescue her. The cell began to darken. It was growing cold as well. Circe began to shiver. How can they leave me like this? without so much as a fire. I am their queen. She began to regret tearing apart the shift they'd given her. There was a blanket on the pallet in the corner, a threadbare thing of thin brown wool. It was rough and scratchy, but it was all she had. Circe huddled underneath to keep from shivering, and before long she had fallen into an exhausted sleep. The next she knew a heavy hand was shaking her awake. It was black as pitch inside the cell, and a huge, ugly woman was kneeling over her, a candle in her hand. "'Who are you?' the queen demanded. "'Are you come to set me free?' "'I am Septa Anella. I am come to hear you tell of all your murders and fornications.' Circe knocked her hand aside. "'I will have your head.' Do not presume to touch me. Get away. The woman rose. Your Grace, I will be back in an hour. Mayhaps by then you will be ready to confess. An hour and an hour and an hour. So passed the longest night that Circe Lannister had ever known, save for the night of Joffrey's wedding. Her throat was so raw from shouting that she could hardly swallow. The cell turned freezing cold. She had smashed the chamber pot, so she had to squat in a corner to make her water and watch it trickle across the floor. Every time she closed her eyes, Unella was looming over her again, shaking her and asking her if she wanted to confess her sins. Day brought no relief. Septimuel brought her a bowl of some watery gray gruel as the sun was coming up, Circe flung it at her head. When they brought a fresh ewer of water, though, she was so thirsty that she had no choice but to drink. When they brought another shift, gray and thin and smelling of mildew, she put it on over her nakedness. And that evening, when Moel appeared again, she ate the bread and fish and demanded wine to wash it down. No wine appeared, only Septuagenella, making her hourly visit to ask if the queen was ready to confess. "'What can be happening?' Circe wondered 
as the thin slice of sky outside her window began to darken once again. Why has no one come to pry me out of here? She could not believe that the Kettle Blacks would abandon their brother. What was her counsel doing? Cravens and traitors. When I get out of here I will have the lot of them beheaded and find better men to take their place. Thrice that day she heard the sound of distant shouting drifting up from the plaza, but it was Marjorie's name that the mob was calling, not hers. It was near dawn on the second day, and Cersei was licking the last of the porridge from the bottom of the bowl when her cell door swung open unexpectedly to admit Lord Kyburn. It was all she could do not to throw herself at him. Kyburn, she whispered. Oh, gods, I am so glad to see your face. Take me home. That will not be allowed. You are to be tried before a holy court of seven for murder, treason, and fornication. Cersei was so exhausted that the words seemed nonsensical to her at first. Tommen, tell me of my son. Is he still king? He is, your grace. He is safe and well, secure within the walls of Magus Holdfast, protected by the king's guard. He is lonely, though, fretful. He asks for you, and for his little queen. As yet no one has told him of your... your... difficulties, she suggested. What of Marjorie? She is to be tried as well, by the same court that conduct your trial. I had the blue bard delivered to the High Septon, as your grace commanded. He is here now, somewhere down below us. My whisperers tell me that they are whipping him, but so far he is still singing the same sweet song we taught him. The same sweet song. Her wits were dull for want of sleep. What? His real name is Watt. If the gods were good, Watt might die beneath the lash, leaving Marjorie with no way to disprove his testimony. Where are my knights? Sir Osfrid, the High Septum, means to kill his brother Osney. His gold cloaks must— Osfrid Kettleblack no longer commands the city watch. The king has removed him from office and raised the captain of the Dragon Gate in his place, a certain Humphrey Waters. Cersei was so tired, none of this made any sense. Why would Tommen do that? The boy is not to blame. When his council puts a decree in front of him, he signs his name and stamps it with his seal. My council? Who? Who would do that? Not you. Alas, I have been dismissed from the council, although for the nonce they allow me to continue my work with the eunuch's whisperers. The realm is being ruled by Sir Harris Swift and Grand Maester Pissell. They have dispatched a raven to Casterly Rock, inviting your uncle to return to court and assume the regency. If he means to accept, he had best make haste. Mace Tyrell has abandoned his siege of Storm's End and is marching back to the city with his army, and Randall Tarley is reported on his way down from Maidenpool as well. Has Lord Merriweather agreed to this? Merriweather has resigned his seat on the council and fled back to Longtable with his wife, who was the first to bring us news of the accusations against your grace. They let Taina go. That was the best thing she had heard since the High Sparrow had said no. Taina could have doomed her. What of Lord Waters? His ships. If he brings his crews ashore, he should have enough men to— As soon as word of your grace's present troubles reached the river— Lord Waters raised sail, unshipped his oars, and took his fleet to sea. Sir Harris fears he means to join Lord Stannis. Pisan believes that he is sailing to the Stepstones, to set himself up as a pirate. All oh, my lovely Dromans! Cersei almost laughed. My Lord Father used to say that bastards are treacherous by nature. Would that I had listened! She shivered. I am lost, Kyburn. No, 
He took her hand. Hope remains. Your grace has the right to prove your innocence by battle. My queen, your champion stands ready. There is no man in all the seven kingdoms who can hope to stand against him. If you will only give the command— This time she did laugh. It was funny, terribly funny, hideously funny. The gods make japes of all our hopes and plans. I have a champion no man can defeat. But I am forbidden to make use of him? I am the queen, Kyburn. My honor can only be defended by a sworn brother of the king's guard. I see. The smile died on Kyburn's face. Your grace, I am at a loss. I do not know how to counsel you. Even in her exhausted, frightened state, the queen knew she dare not trust her fate to a court of sparrows nor could she count on Sir Kevin to intervene after the words that had passed between them at their last meeting. It will have to be a trial by battle. There is no other way. Kyburn, for the love you bear me, I beg you, send a message for me, a raven if you can, a rider if not. You must send to River Run, to my brother, tell him what has happened, and write, write, Yes, Your Grace. She licked her lips, shivering. Come at once. Help me. Save me. I need you now as I have never needed you before. I love you. I love you. I love you. Come at once. As you command. I love you thrice? Thrice. She had to reach him. He will come, I know he will. He must. Jamie is my only hope. My queen, said Kyburn, have you forgotten? Sir Jamie has no sword hand. If he should champion you and lose, we will leave this world together as we once came into it. He will not lose, not Jamie. Not with my life at stake. Jamie. The new lord of River Run was so angry that he was shaking. We have been deceived, he said. This man had played us false. Pink spittle flew from his lips as he jabbed a finger at Edmure Tully. I will have his head off. I rule in River Run by the king's own decree. I. Emmon said his wife. The Lord Commander knows about the King's decree. Sir Edmure knows about the King's decree. The stable boys know about the King's decree. I am the Lord, and I will have his head. For what crime? Thin as he was, Edmure still looked more lordly than Emmon Frey. He wore a quilted doublet of red wool with a leaping trout embroidered on its chest. His boots were black, his breeches blue, his auburn hair had been washed and barbered, his red beard neatly trimmed. I did all that was asked of me. Oh? Jamie Lannister had not slept since River Run had opened its gates, and his head was pounding. I do not recall asking you to let Sir Brynden escape. You required me to surrender my castle, not my uncle. Am I to blame if your men let him slip through their siege lines? Jamie was not amused. "'Where is he?' he said, letting his irritation show. His men had searched River Run thrice over, and Brynden Tully was nowhere to be found. "'He never told me where he meant to go. "'And you never asked. "'How did he get out?' "'Fish swim, even black ones,' Edmure smiled. Jamie was sorely tempted to crack him across the mouth with his golden hand. A few missing teeth would put an end to his smiles. For a man who was going to spend the rest of his life a prisoner, Ed Muir was entirely too pleased with himself. We have oubliettes beneath the casterly rock that fed a man as tight as a suit of armor. You can't turn in them, or sit, or reach down to your feet when the rats start gnawing at your toes. 
Would you care to reconsider that answer? Lord Edmure's smile went away. You gave me your word that I would be treated honorably, as befits my rank. So you shall, said Jamie. Nobler knights than you have died whimpering in those oubliettes, and many a high lord too, even a king or two, if I recall my history. Your wife can have the one beside you, if you like. I would not want to part you. He did swim, said Edmure sullenly. He had the same blue eyes as his sister Caitlin, and Jamie saw the same loathing there that he'd once seen in hers. We raised the portcullis on the water gate, not all the way, just three feet or so, enough to leave a gap under the water, though the gate still appeared to be closed. My uncle is a strong swimmer. After dark he pulled himself beneath the spikes. And he slipped under our boom the same way, no doubt. A moonless night, bored guards, a black fish in a black river, floating quietly downstream. If Rutiger or you or any of their men heard a splash, they would put it down to a turtle or a trout. Edmure had waited most of the day before hauling down the dire wolf of Stark in a token of surrender. In the confusion of the castle changing hands, it had been the next morning before Jamie had been informed that the blackfish was not amongst the prisoners. He went to the window and gazed out over the river. It was a bright autumn day, and the sun was shining on the waters. By now the blackfish could be ten leagues downstream. You have to find him, insisted Emmon Frey. He'll be found. Jamie spoke with a certainty he did not feel. I have hounds and hunters sniffing after him even now. Sir Adam Marbrand was leading the search on the south side of the river. Sir Dermot of the Rainwood on the north. He had considered enlisting the river lords as well, but Vance and Piper and their ilk were more like to help the blackfish escape than clap him into fetters. All in all, he was not hopeful. He may elude us for a time, he said, but eventually he must surface. What if he should try and take my castle back? You have a garrison of two hundred. Too large a garrison in truth, but Lord Emmon had an anxious disposition. At least he would have no trouble feeding them. The blackfish had left Riverrun amply provisioned, just as he had claimed. After the trouble Sir Brynden took to leave us, I doubt that he'll come skulking back, unless it is at the head of a band of outlaws. He did not doubt that the blackfish meant to continue the fight. This is your seat, Lady Jenna told her husband. It is for you to hold it. If you cannot do that, put it to the torch and run back to the rock. Lord Emmon rubbed his mouth. His hand came away red and slimy from the sour leaf. To be sure, River Run is mine, and no man shall ever take it from me. He gave Edmure Tully one last suspicious look as Lady Jenna drew him from the solar. Is there any more that you would care to tell me? Jamie asked Edmure when the two of them were alone. This was my father's solar, said Tully. He ruled the river lands from here, wisely and well. He liked to sit beside that window. The light was good there, and whenever he looked up from his work he could see the river. When his eyes were tired he would have Cat read to him. Littlefinger and I built a castle out of wooden blocks once, there beside the door. You will never know how sick it makes me to see you in this room, Kingslayer. You will never know how much I despise you. He was wrong about that. I have been despised by better men than you, Edmure. Jamie called for a guard. Take his lordship back to his tower and see that he's fed. The Lord of River Run went silently. On the morrow he would start west. Sir Forley Prester would command his escort, a hundred men, including twenty knights. Best double that. Lord Berwick may try to free Edmure before they reach the Golden Tooth. Jamie did not want to have to capture Tully for a third time. He returned to Hoster Tully's chair. 
pulled over the map of the trident, and flattened it beneath his golden hand. Where would I go if I were the blackfish? Lord Commander, a guardsman stood in the open door. Lady Westerling and her daughter are without, as you commanded. Jamie shoved the map aside. Show them in. At least the girl did not vanish, too. Janie Westerling had been Rob Stark's queen, the girl who cost him everything. With a wolf in her belly, she could have proved more dangerous than the blackfish. She did not look dangerous. Janie was a willowy girl, no more than fifteen or sixteen, more awkward than graceful. She had narrow hips, breasts the size of apples, a mop of chestnut curls, and the soft brown eyes of a doe. Pretty enough for a child, Jamie decided, but not a girl to lose a kingdom for. Her face was puffy, and there was a scab on her forehead, half hidden by a lock of brown hair. What happened there? he asked her. The girl turned her head away. It is nothing, insisted her mother, a stern-faced woman in a gown of green velvet, a necklace of golden seashells looped about her long, thin neck. She would not give up the little crown the rebel gave her, and when I tried to take it from her head, the willful child fought me. It was mine, Janie sobbed. You had no right. Rob had it made for me. I loved him. Her mother made to slap her, but Jamie stepped between them. None of that, he warned Lady Sybil. Sit down, both of you. The girl curled up in her chair like a frightened animal, but her mother sat stiffly, her head high. "'Will you have wine?' he asked them. The girl did not answer. "'No, thank you,' said her mother. "'As you will.' Jamie turned to the daughter. "'I am sorry for your loss. The boy had courage, I'll give him that. There is a question I must ask you. Are you carrying his child, my lady?' Janey burst from her chair and would have fled the room if the guard at the door had not seized her by the arm. "'She is not,' said Lady Sybil, as the daughter struggled to escape. "'I made certain of that, as your lord father bid me.' Jamie nodded. Tywin Lannister was not a man to overlook such details. "'Unhand the girl,' he said. "'I'm done with her for now.' As Janey fled sobbing down the stairs, he considered her mother. House Westerling has its pardon, and your brother Rolf has been made Lord of Castamere. What else would you have of us? Your Lord Father promised me worthy marriages for Janey and her younger sister. Lords or heirs, he swore to me, not younger sons nor household knights. Lords or heirs, to be sure. The Westerlings were an old house, and proud, but Lady Sybil herself had been born a spicer from a line of up-jumped merchants. Her grandmother had been some sort of half-mad witch-woman from the East, he seemed to recall, and the Westerlings were impoverished. Younger sons would have been the best that Sybil Spicer's daughters could have hoped for in the ordinary course of events, but a nice fat pot of Lannister gold would make even a dead rebel's widow look attractive to some lord. "'You'll have your marriages,' said Jamie. "'But Janie must wait two full years before she weds again. "'If the girl took another husband too soon and had a child by him, "'inevitably there would come whispers that the young wolf was the father.' "'I have two sons as well,' Lady Westerling reminded him. "'Rollum is with me, but Reynold was a knight,' and went with the rebels to the twins. If I had known what was to happen there, I would never have allowed that. There was a hint of reproach in her voice. Reynold knew not of any of the understanding with your lord father. He may be a captive at the twins, or he may be dead. Walter Frey would not have known of the understanding, either. I will make inquiries. If Sir Reynold is still a captive, we'll pay his ransom for you. Mention was made of a match for him as well. A bride from Casterly Rock? Your lord father said that Reynold should have joy of him, 
if all went as we hoped. Even from the grave, Lord Tywin's dead hand moves us all. Joy is my late uncle Geryon's natural daughter. A betrothal can be arranged, if that is your wish, but any marriage will need to wait. Joy was nine or ten when last I saw her. His natural daughter? Lady Sybil looked as if she had swallowed a lemon. You want a westerling to wed a bastard? No more than I want Joy to marry the son of some scheming turncloak bitch. She deserves better. Jamie would happily have strangled the woman with her seashell necklace. Joy was a sweet child, albeit a lonely one. Her father had been Jamie's favorite uncle. Your daughter is worth ten of you, my lady. You will leave with Edmure and Sir Forley on the morrow. Until then you would do well to stay out of my sight. He shouted for a guardsman, and Lady Sybil went off with her lips pressed primly together. Jimmy had to wonder how much Lord Gawain knew about his wife's scheming. How much do we men ever know? When Edmure and the Westerlings departed, four hundred men rode with them. Jamie had doubled the escort again at the last moment. He rode with them a few miles to talk with Sir Forley Prester. Though he bore a bull's head upon his surcoat and horns upon his helm, Sir Forley could not have been less bovine. He was a short, spare, hard-bitten man. With his pinched nose, bald pate, and grizzled brown beard, he looked more like an innkeep than a knight. We don't know where the blackfish is, Jamie reminded him, but if he can cut Edmure free, he will. That will not happen, my lord. Like most innkeeps, Sir Forley was no man's fool. Scouts and outriders will screen our march, and will fortify our camps by night. I've picked ten men to stay with Tully day and night, my best longbowmen. If he should ride so much as a foot off the road, they will lose so many shafts at him that his own mother would take him for a goose. Good. Jamie would as lief have Tully reach Casterly Rock safely, but better dead than fled. Best keep some marches near Lord Westerling's daughter as well. Sir Forley seemed taken aback. Gawain's girl? She's the young wolf's widow, Jamie finished, and twice as dangerous as Edmure, if she were ever to escape us. As you say, my lord, she will be watched. Jamie had to canter past the Westerlings as he rode down the column on his way back to River Run. Lord Gawain nodded gravely as he passed, but Lady Sybil looked through him with eyes like chips of ice. Janey never saw him at all. The widow rode with downcast eyes, huddled beneath a hooded cloak. Underneath its heavy folds, her clothes were finely made but torn. She ripped them herself, as a mark of mourning. Jamie realized that could not have pleased her mother. He found himself wondering if Cersei would tear her gown if she should ever hear that he was dead. He did not go straight back to the castle, but crossed the tumblestone once more to call on Edwin Frey and discuss the transfer of his great-grandfather's prisoners. The Frey host had begun to break up within hours of River Run's surrender, as Lord Walter's bannermen and free riders pulled up stakes to make for home. The Freys who still remained were striking camp, but he found Edwin with his bastard uncle in the latter's pavilion. The two of them were huddled over a map, arguing heatedly, but they broke off when Jamie entered. "'Lord Commander,' Rivers said with cold courtesy, but Edwin blurted out, "'My father's blood is on your hand, sir!' That took Jamie a bit back. "'How so?' You were the one who sent him home, were you not? Someone had to. Has some ill befallen Sir Ryman? Hanged with all his party, said Walter Rivers. The outlaws caught them two leagues south of Fairmarket. Dondarian? Him or Thoros? Or this woman Stoneheart? Jamie frowned. Ryman Frey had been a fool, a craven, and a sot, and no one was like to miss him much least of all his fellow phrase. If Edwin's dry eyes were any clue, even his own sons would not mourn him long. Still, 
These outlaws are growing bold. If they dare hang Lord Walder's heir, not a day's ride from the twins. How many men did Sir Ryman have with him? he asked. Three knights and a dozen men at arms, said Rivers. It is almost as if they knew that he would be returning to the twins and with a small escort. Edwin's mouth twisted. My brother had a hand in this, I'll wager. He allowed the outlaws to escape after they murdered Merritt and Peter, and this is why. With our father dead, there's only me left between Black Walter and the twins. You have no proof of this, said Walter Rivers. I do not need proof. I know my brother. Your brother is at Seaguard, Rivers insisted. How could he have known that Sir Ryman was returning to the twins? Someone told him, said Edwin in a better tone. He has his spies in our camp, you can be sure. And you have yours at Seaguard. Jamie knew that the enmity between Edwin and Black Walter ran deep, but cared not a fig which of them succeeded their great-grandfather as Lord of the Crossing. If you will pardon me for intruding on your grief, he said in a dry tone, we have other matters to consider. When you return to the twins, please inform Lord Walter that King Toman requires all the captives you took at the Red Wedding. Sir Walter frowned. These prisoners are valuable, sir. His grace would not ask for them if they were worthless. Frey and Rivers exchanged a look. Edwin said, My lord grandfather will expect recompense for these prisoners. And he'll have it, as soon as I grow a new hand, thought Jamie. We all have expectations, he said mildly. Tell me, is Sir Reynold Westerling amongst these captives? The knight of seashells, Edwin sneered. You'll find that one feeding the fish at the bottom of the green fork. He was in the yard when our men came to put the dire wolf down, said Walter Rivers. Whelan demanded his sword, and he gave it over meek enough, but when the crossbowman began feathering the wolf, he seized Whelan's axe and cut the monster loose of the net they'd thrown over him. Whelan says he took a quarrel in his shoulder and another in the gut, but still managed to reach the wall walk and throw himself into the river. He left a trail of blood on the steps, said Edwin. Did you find his corpse afterward? asked Jamie. We found a thousand corpses afterward. Once they've spent a few days on the river, they all look much the same. I've heard the same is true of hanged men, said Jamie, before he took his leave. By the next morning, little remained of the fray encampment but flies, horse dung, and Sir Ryman's gallows, standing forlorn beside that humble stone. His cuz wanted to know what should be done with it, and with the siege equipment he had built, his rams and sows and towers and trebuchets. Davin proposed that they drag it all to Raven Tree and use it there. Jamie told him to put everything to the torch, starting with the gallows. I mean to deal with Lord Titus myself. It won't require a siege tower. Davin grinned through his bushy beard. Single combat, cuz. Scarce seems fair. Titus is an old gray man. An old gray man with two hands. That night he and Sir Illyn fought for three hours. It was one of his better nights. If they had been in earnest, pain only would have killed him twice. Half a dozen deaths were more the rule, and some nights were worse than that. If I keep at this for another year, I may be as good as Peck, Jamie declared, and Sir Ellen made that clacking sound that meant he was amused. Come, let's drink some more of Hoster Tully's good red wine. Wine had become a part of their nightly ritual. Sir Ellen made the perfect drinking companion. He never interrupted, never disagreed, never complained, or asked for favors, or told long, pointless stories. All he did was drink and listen. I should have the tongues removed from all my friends, said Jamie as he filled their cups, and from my kin as well. A silent Circe would be sweet, though I'd miss her tongue when we kissed. He drank. The wine was a deep red, sweet and heavy. It warmed him going down. 
I can't remember when we first began to kiss. It was innocent at first, until it wasn't. He finished the wine and set his cup aside. Tyrion once told me that most whores will not kiss you. They'll fuck you blind, he said, but you'll never feel their lips on yours. Do you think my sister kisses Kettle Black? Sir Illyn did not answer. I don't think it would be proper for me to slay mine own sworn brother. What I need to do is geld him and send him to the wall. That's what they did with Lucamore the Lusty. Sir Osmond may not take kindly to the gelding, to be sure. And there are his brothers to consider. Brothers can be dangerous. After Aegon the Unworthy put Sir Torrance Toyne to death for sleeping with his mistress, Toyne's brothers did their best to kill him. Their best was not quite good enough, thanks to the Dragon Knight, but it was not for want of trying. It's written down in the White Book, all of it, save what to do with Cersei. Sir Ellen drew a finger across his throat. No, said Jamie. Tommen has lost a brother, and the man he thought of as his father. If I were to kill his mother, he would hate me for it, and that sweet little wife of his would find a way to turn that hatred to the benefit of Highgarden. Sir Ellen smiled in a way Jamie did not like. An ugly smile. An ugly soul. You talk too much, he told the man. The next day, Sir Dermot of the Rainwood returned to the castle empty-handed. When asked what he'd found, he answered, Wolves! Hundreds of the bloody beggars. He'd lost two sentries to them. The wolves had come out of the dark to savage them. Armed men in mail and boiled leather, and yet the beasts had no fear of them. Before he died, Jake said the pack was led by a she-wolf of monstrous size. A dire wolf, to hear him tell it. The wolves got in amongst our horse lines, too. The bloody bastards killed my favorite bay. A ring of fires round your camp might keep them off, said Jamie, though he wondered. Could Sir Dermot's dire wolf be the same beast that had mauled Joffrey near the crossroads? Wolves or no, Sir Dermot took fresh horses and more men and went out again the next morning to resume the search for Brynden Tully. That same afternoon, the lords of the Trident came to Jamie, asking his leave to return to their own lands. He granted it. Lord Piper also wanted to know about his son Mark. All the captives will be ransomed, Jamie promised. As the river lords took their leave, Lord Carol Vance lingered to say, Lord Jamie, you must go to Raven Tree. So long as it is Jonas at his gates, Titus will never yield but I know he will bend his knee for you. Jamie thanked him for his counsel. Strongbore was the next to depart. He wanted to return to Derry, as he'd promised, and fight the outlaws. We rode across half the bloody realm, and for what? So you could make Edmore Tully piss his britches? There's no song in that. I need a fight. I want the hound, Jamie. Him or the marcher lord. The hound's head is yours, if you can take it, Jamie said. But Beric Dondarrion is to be captured alive, so he can be brought back to King's Landing. A thousand people need to see him die, or else he won't stay dead. Strongbore grumbled at that, but finally agreed. The next day he departed with his squire and men-at-arms, plus beardless John Batley, who had decided that hunting outlaws was preferable to returning to his famously homely wife. Supposedly, she had the beard that Bedley lacked. Jamie still had the garrison to deal with. To a man they swore that they knew nothing of Sir Brendan's plans or where he might have gone. They are lying, Emmon Frey insisted, but Jamie thought not. If you share your plans with no one, no one can betray you, he pointed out. Lady Jenna suggested that a few of the men might be put to the question. He refused. I gave Edmure my word that if he yielded, the garrison could leave unharmed. That was chivalrous of you, his aunt said, but it's strength that's needed here, not chivalry. Ask Edmure how chivalrous I am, thought Jamie. Ask him about the trebuchet. Somehow 
He did not think the maesters would like to confuse him with Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight when they wrote their histories. Still, he felt curiously content. The war was all but won. Dragonstone had fallen, and Storm's End would soon enough, he could not doubt, and Stannis was welcome to the wall. The Northmen would love him no more than the Storm Lords had. If Roose Bolton did not destroy him, Winter would. And he had done his own part here at River Run, without actually ever taking up arms against the Starks or Tullys. Once he found the Blackfish, he would be free to return to King's Landing where he belonged. My place is with my king, with my son. Would Tommen want to know that? The truth could cause the boy his throne. Would you sooner have a father or a chair, lad? Jamie wished he knew the answer. He does like stamping papers with his seal. The boy might not even believe him, to be sure. Circe would say it was a lie. My sweet sister, the deceiver. He would need to find some way to winkle Tomim from her clutches before the boy became another Joffrey. And whilst at that, he should find the lad a new small council, too. If Cersei can be put aside, Sir Kevin may agree to serve as Tomim's hand. And if not, well, the Seven Kingdoms did not lack for able men. Forley Prester would make a good choice, or Roland Craighall. If someone other than a Westerman was needed to appease the Tyros, there was always Mathis Rowan, or even Peter Baelish. Littlefinger was as amiable as he was clever, but too low-born to threaten any of the great lords with no swords of his own. The perfect hand. The Tully garrison departed the next morning, stripped of all their arms and armor. Each man was allowed three days' food and the clothing on his back, after he swore a solemn oath never to take up arms against Lord Emmon or House Lannister. "'If you're fortunate, one man in ten may keep that vow,' Lady Jenna said. "'Good. I'd sooner face nine men than ten. The tenth might have been the one who would have killed me. The other nine will kill you just as quick.' "'Better that than die in bed, or on the privy.' Two men did not choose to depart with the others. Sir Desmond Grell, Lord Hoster's old master-at-arms, preferred to take the black. So did Sir Robin Riger, Riverrun's captain of guards. "'This castle's been my home for forty years,' said Grell. "'You say I'm free to go, but where? I'm too old and too stout to make a hedge knight. But men are always welcome at the wall.' "'As you wish,' said Jamie, though it was a bloody nuisance. He allowed them to keep their arms and armor, and assigned a dozen of Gregor Clegane's men to escort the two of them to Maidenpool. The command he gave to Rafford, the one they called the Sweetling. "'See to it that the prisoners reach Maidenpool unspoiled,' he told the man. "'Or what Sir Gregor did to the goat will seem a jolly lark compared to what I'll do to you.' More days passed. Lord Emmon assembled all of River Run in the yard, Lord Edmure's people and his own, and spoke to them for close on three hours about what would be expected of them now that he was their lord and master. From time to time he waved his parchment as stable boys and serving girls and smiths listened in a sullen silence, and a light rain fell down upon them all. The singer was listening, too, the one that Jamie had taken from Sir Ryman Frey. Jamie came upon him standing inside an open door where it was dry. "'His lordship should have been a singer,' the man said. "'This speech is longer than a march or ballad, and I don't think he stopped for breath.' Jamie had to laugh. "'Lord Hemon does not need to breathe, so long as he can chew. Are you going to make a song of it?' "'A funny one. I'll call it Talking to the Fish.' Just don't play it where my aunt can hear. Jamie had never paid the man much mind before. He was a small fellow, garbed in ragged green breeches and a frayed tunic of a lighter shade of green, with brown leather patches covering the holes. His nose was long and sharp, his smile big and loose. Thin brown hair fell to his collar, snaggled and unwashed. Fifty if he's a day, 
thought Jamie, a hedge harp, and hard used by life. Weren't you Sir Ryman's man when I found you? he asked. Only for a fortnight. I would have expected you to depart with the phrase. That one up there's a fray, the singer said, nodding at Lord Emmon, and this castle seems a nice, snug place to pass the winter. White Smile Watt went home with Sir Forley, so I thought I'd see if I could win his place. Watt's got that high, sweet voice that the likes of me can't hope to match, but I know twice as many bawdy songs as he does, begging my lord's pardon. You should get on famously with my aunt, said Jamie. If you hope to winter here, see that your playing pleases Lady Jenna. She's the one that matters. Not you? My place is with the king. I shall not stay here long. I'm sorry to hear that, my lord. I know better songs than the reigns of Castamir. I could have played you, oh, all sorts of things. Some other time, said Jamie. Do you have a name? Tom of Seven Streams, if it please, my lord. The singer doffed his hat. Most call me Thomas Evans, though. Sing sweetly, Thomas Evans. That night he dreamt that he was back in the great sept of Baylor, still standing vigil over his father's corpse. The sept was still and dark until a woman emerged from the shadows and walked slowly to the bier. Sister, he said. But it was not Circe. She was all in grey, a silent sister. A hood and veil concealed her features, but he could see the candles burning in the green pools of her eyes. Sister, he said, what would you have of me? His last word echoed up and down the sept. Me, 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 me. I am not your sister, Jamie. She raised a pale, soft hand and pushed her hood back. Have you forgotten me? Can I forget someone I never knew? The words caught in his throat. He did know her, but it had been so long. Will you forget your own Lord Father, too? I wonder if you ever knew him truly. Her eyes were green, her hair spun gold. He could not tell how old she was. Fifteen, he thought, or fifty. She climbed the steps to stand above the bier. He could never abide being laughed at. That was the thing he hated most. Who are you? He had to hear her say it. The question is, who are you? This is a dream. Is it? She smiled sadly. Count your hands, child. One. One hand, clasped tight around the sword-hilt, only one. In my dreams I always have two hands. He raised his right arm and stared uncomprehending at the ugliness of his stump. We all dream of things we cannot have. Tymon dreamed that his son would be a great knight, that his daughter would be a queen. He dreamed they would be so strong and brave and beautiful that no one would ever laugh at them. I am a knight, he told her, and Circe is a queen. A tear rolled down her cheek. The woman raised her hood again and turned her back on him. Jimmy called after her, but already she was moving away, her skirt whispering lullabies as it brushed across the floor. Don't leave me, he wanted to call, but of course she'd left them long ago. He woke in darkness, shivering. The room had grown cold as ice. Jimmy flung aside the covers with the stump of his sword hand. The fire in the hearth had died, he saw, and the window had blown open. He crossed the pitch-dark chamber to fumble with the shutters, but when he reached the window, his bare foot came down on something wet. Jamie recoiled, startled for a moment. His first thought was of blood, but blood would not have been so cold. It was snow, drifting through the window. Instead of closing the shutters, he threw them wide. The yard below was covered by a thin white blanket, growing thicker even as he watched. The merlins on the battlements wore white cowls. The flakes fell silently, a few drifting in the window to melt upon his face. 
Jamie could see his own breath. Snow in the Riverlands. If it was snowing here, it could well be snowing on Lannisport as well, and on King's Landing. Winter is marching south, and half our granaries are empty. Any crops still in the fields were doomed. There would be no more plantings, no more hopes of one last harvest. He found himself wondering what his father would do to feed the realm before he remembered that Tywin Lannister was dead. When morning broke, the snow was ankle-deep, and deeper in the godswood, where drifts had piled up under the trees. Squires, stable-boys, and high-born pages turned to children again under its cold white spell, and fought a snowball war up and down the wards and all along the battlements. Jamie heard them laughing. There was a time not long ago when he might have been out making snowballs with the best of them, to fling at Tyrion when he waddled by, or slipped down the back of Cersei's gown. You need two hands to make a decent snowball, though. There was a rap upon his door. See who that is, Peck. It was River Run's old maester, with a message clutched in his lined and wrinkled hand. Vyman's face was as pale as the new-fallen snow. I know, Jamie said, there has been a white raven from the Citadel. Winter has come. No, my lord. The bird was from King's Landing. I took the liberty... I did not know. He held the letter out. Jamie read it in the window seat, bathed in the light of that cold white morning. Carbon's words were terse and to the point. Circe's fevered and fervent. Come at once, she said. Help me. Save me. I need you now as I have never needed you before. I love you. I love you. I love you. Come at once. Byman was hovering by the door, waiting, and Jamie sensed that Peck was watching, too. Does my lord wish to answer? the maester asked, after a long silence. A snowflake landed on the letter. As it melted, the ink began to blur. Jamie rolled the parchment up again, as tight as one hand would allow, and handed it to Peck. No, he said. Put this in the fire. Samwell. The most perilous part of the voyage was the last. The red wine straits were swarming with longships, as they had been warned in Tyrush. With the main strength of the Arbor's fleet on the far side of Westeros, the Ironmen had sacked Rhymesport and taken Vine Town and Starfish Harbor for their own, using them as bases to prey on shipping bound for Old Town. Thrice long ships were sighted by the Crow's Nest. Two were well astern, however, and the cinnamon wind soon outdistanced them. The third appeared near sunset, to cut them off from whispering sound. When they saw her oars rising and falling, lashing the copper waters white, Coach Jomo sent her archers to the castles with their great bows of golden heart that could send a shaft farther and truer than even Dornish you. She waited till the long ship came within two hundred yards before she gave the command to loose. Sam loosed with them, and this time he thought his arrow reached the ship. One volley was all it took. The long ship veered south in search of tamer prey. A deep blue dusk was falling as they entered whispering sound. Gilly stood beside the prow with a babe, gazing up at a castle on the cliffs. Three towers, Sam told her, the seat of House Costain. Etched against the evening stars with torchlight flickering from its windows, the castle made a splendid sight, but he was sad to see it. Their voyage was almost at its end. It's very tall, said Gilly. Wait until you see the high tower. Donna's babe began to cry. Gilly pulled open her tunic and gave the boy her breast. She smiled as he nursed and stroked his soft brown hair. She has come to love this one as much as the one she left behind, Sam realized. He hoped that the gods would be kind to both of the children. 
The Iron Men had penetrated even to the sheltered waters of Whispering Sound. Come morning, as the cinnamon wind continued on toward Old Town, she began to bump up against corpses drifting down to the sea. Some of the bodies carried compliments of crows, who rose into the air complaining noisily when the swan ship disturbed their grotesquely swollen rafts. Scorched fields and burned villages appeared on the banks, and the shallows and sandbars were strewn with shattered ships. Merchanders and fishing boats were the most common, but they saw abandoned longships, too, and the wreckage of two big drummonds. One had been burned down to the waterline, whilst the other had a gaping splintered hole in her side where her hull had been rammed. "'Battle here,' said Chondo. "'Not so long. Who would be so mad as to raid this close to Old Town?' Chondo pointed at a half-sunken longship in the shallows. The remnants of a banner drooped from her stern, smoke-stained and ragged. The charge was one Sam had never seen before, a red eye with a black pupil, beneath a black iron crown supported by two crows. "'Whose banner is that?' Sam asked. Shondo only shrugged. The next day was cold and misty. As the cinnamon wind was creeping past another plundered fishing village, a war galley came sliding from the fog, stroking slowly toward them. Huntress was the name she bore, behind a figurehead of a slender maiden clad in leaves and brandishing a spear. A heartbeat later, two smaller galleys appeared on either side of her, like a pair of matched greyhounds stalking at their master's heels. To Sam's relief, they flew King Toman's stag and lion banner above the stepped white tower of Old Town, with its crown of flame. The captain of the huntress was a tall man, in a smoke-gray cloak with a border of red satin flames. He brought his galley in alongside the cinnamon wind, raised his oars, and shouted that he was coming aboard. As his crossbowmen and Kojomo's archers eyed each other across the narrow span of water, he crossed over with half a dozen knights, gave Kuhuru Mo a nod, and asked to see his holds. Father and daughter conferred briefly, then agreed. "'My apologies,' the captain said, when his inspection was complete. It grieves me that honest men must suffer such discourtesy. But sooner that than iron men in old town. Only a fortnight ago some of those bloody bastards captured a Taroshi merchantman in the straits. They killed her crew, donned their clothes, and used the dyes they found to color their whiskers half a hundred colors. Once inside the walls, they meant to set the port ablaze and open a gate from within whilst we fought the fire. Might have worked, but they ran afoul of the Lady of the Tower, and her oars master has a Taroshi wife. When he saw all the green and purple beards, he hailed them in the tongue of Tyrosh, and not one of them had the words to hail him back. Sam was aghast. They cannot mean to raid Old Town. The captain of the hunters gave him a curious look. These are no mere reavers. The Iron Men have always raided where they could. They would strike sudden from the sea, carry off some gold and girls, and sail away. But there were seldom more than one or two longships, and never more than half a dozen. Hundreds of their ships afflict us now, sailing out of the Shield Islands and some of the rocks around the arbor. They have taken Stone Crab Cay, the Isle of Pigs, and the Mermaid's Palace, and there are other nests on Horseshoe Rock and Bastard's Cradle. Without Lord Redwine's fleet, we lack the ships to come to grips with them. "'What is Lord Hightower doing?' Sam blurted. "'My father always said he was as wealthy as the Lannisters, and could command thrice as many swords as any of Highgarden's other bannermen.' "'More, if he sweeps the cobblestones,' the captain said. "'But swords are no good against the Ironmen.' unless the men who wield them know how to walk on water. The high tower must be doing something. To be sure, Lord Leighton's locked atop his tower with a mad maid, consulting books of spells. Might be he'll raise an army from the deeps, or not. Bale is building galleys. Gunther has charge of the harbor. Garth is training new recruits. And Humphrey's gone to Lys to hire cell sales. 
If he can winkle a proper fleet out of his whore of a sister, we can start paying back the Iron Men with some of their own coin. Till then, the best we can do is guard the sound and wait for the bitch queen in King's Landing to let Lord Paxter off his leash. The bitterness of the captain's final words shocked Sam as much as the things he said. If King's Landing loses Old Town and the arbor, the whole realm will fall to pieces, he thought as he watched the huntress and her sisters moving off. It made him wonder if even Horn Hill was truly safe. The tarry lands lay inland amidst thickly wooded foothills, a hundred leagues northeast of Old Town, and a long way from any coast. They should be well beyond the reach of iron men and longships, even with his lord farther off fighting in the river lands and the castle lightly held. The young wolf had no doubt thought the same was true of Winterfell until the night that Theon Turncloak scaled his walls. Sam could not bear the thought that he might have brought Gilly and her babe all this long way to keep them out of harm, only to abandon them in the midst of war. He wrestled with his doubts through the rest of the voyage, wondering what to do. He could keep Gilly with him in Old Town, he supposed. The city's walls were much more formidable than those of his father's castle, and had thousands of men to defend them, as opposed to the handful Lord Randall would have left at Horn Hill when he marched to Highgarden to answer his liege lord's summons. If he did, though, he would need to hide her somehow. The Citadel did not permit its novices to keep wives or paramours, at least not openly. Besides, if I stay with Gilly very much longer, how will I ever find the strength to leave her? He had to leave her, or desert. I said the words, Sam reminded himself. If I desert, it will mean my head, and how will that help Gilly? He considered begging Kojimo and her father to take the wildling girl with them to the Summer Isles. That path had its perils too, however. When the cinnamon wind left Old Town, she would need to cross the Red Wine Straits again, and this time she might not be so fortunate. What if the wind died and the Summer Islanders found themselves becalmed? If the tales he'd heard were true, Gilly would be carried off for a thrall or salt wife, and the babe was like to be chucked into the sea as a nuisance. It has to be Horn Hill, Sam finally decided. Once we reach Old Town, I'll hire a wagon and some horses and take her there myself. That way he could make certain of the castle and its garrison, and if any part of what he saw or heard gave him pause, he could just turn around and bring Gilly back to Old Town. They reached Old Town on a cold, damp morning, when the fog was so thick that the beacon of the high tower was the only part of the city to be seen. A boom stretched across the harbor, linking two dozen rotted hulks. Just behind it stood a line of warships, anchored by three big dromons, and Lord Hightower's towering four-decked bannership, the honor of Old Town. Once again the cinnamon wind had to submit to inspection. This time it was Lord Leighton's son Gunther who came aboard. In a cloth of silver cloak and a suit of grey enameled scales, Sir Gunther had studied at the Citadel for several years and spoke the summer tongue, so he and Kurulu Mo adjourned to the captain's cabin for a privy conference. Sam used the time to explain his plans to Gilly. First the Citadel, to present John's letters and tell them of Maester Eamon's death. I expect the Archmaesters will send a cart for his body. Then I will arrange for horses and a wagon to take you to my mother at Horn Hill. I will be back as soon as I can, but it may not be until the morrow. The morrow, she repeated, and gave him a kiss for luck. At length, Sir Gunther re-emerged and gave the signal for the chain to be opened so the cinnamon wind could slip through the boom to dock. Sam joined Code Jumeau and three of her archers near the gangplank as the swan ship was tying up. The summer islanders were splendid in the feathered cloaks they only wore ashore. He felt a shabby thing beside them in his baggy blacks, faded cloak, and salt-stained boots. How long will you remain in port? Two days, ten days, who can say? 
however long it takes to empty our holes and fill them again. Kojja grinned. My father must visit the Grey Maesters as well. He has books to sell. Can Gilly stay aboard till I return? Gilly can stay as long as she likes. She poked Sam in the belly with a finger. She does not eat so much as some. I'm not so fat as I was before, Sam said defensively. The passage south had seen to that. All those watches and nothing to eat but fruit and fish. Summer Islanders loved fruit and fish. Sam followed the archers across the plank, but once ashore they parted company and went their separate ways. He hoped he still remembered the way to the citadel. Old Town was a maze, and he had no time for getting lost. The day was damp, so the cobblestones were wet and slippery underfoot, the alleys shrouded in mist and mystery. Sam avoided them as best he could, and stayed on the river road that wound along beside the honey wine through the heart of the old city. It felt good to have solid ground beneath his feet again, instead of a rolling deck. But the walk made him feel uncomfortable all the same. He could feel eyes on him, peering down from balconies and windows, watching him from the darkened doorways. On the cinnamon wind he had known every face. Here, everywhere he turned, he saw another stranger. Even worse was the thought of being seen by someone who knew him. Lord Randall Tarley was known in Old Town, but little loved. Sam did not know which would be worse, to be recognized by one of his Lord Father's enemies or by one of his friends. He pulled his cloak up and quickened his pace. The gates of the citadel were flanked by a pair of towering green sphinxes with the bodies of lions, the wings of eagles, and the tails of serpents. One had a man's face, one a woman's. Just beyond stood Scribe's Hearth, where old towners came in search of acolytes to write their wills and read their letters. Half a dozen bored scribes sat in open stalls, waiting for some custom. At other stalls, books were being bought and sold. Sam stopped at one that offered maps, and looked over a hand-drawn map of Citadel to ascertain the shortest way to the Seneschal's court. The path divided where the statue of King Daron I sat astride his tall stone horse, his sword lifted toward Dorn. A seagull was perched on the young dragon's head, and two more on the blade. Sam took the left fork, which ran beside the river. At the weeping dock, he watched two acolytes help an old man into a boat for the short voyage to the Bloody Isle. A young mother climbed in after him, a babe not much older than Gillies, squalling in her arms. Beneath the dock some cook's boys waited in the shallows gathering frogs. A stream of pink-cheeked novices hurried by him toward the septry. I should have come here when I was their age, Sam thought. If I had run off and taken a false name— I could have disappeared amongst the other novices. Father could have pretended that Dickon was his only son. I doubt he would even have troubled to search for me, unless I took a mule to ride. Then he would have hunted me down, but only for the mule. Outside the seneschal's court, the rectors were locking an older novice into the stocks. Stealing food from the kitchens, one explained to the acolytes, who were waiting to pelt the captive with rotting vegetables. They all gave Sam curious looks as he strode past, his black cloak billowing behind him like a sail. Beyond the doors he found a hall with a stone floor and high arched windows. At the far end a man with a pinched face sat upon a raised dais, scratching in a ledger with a quill. Though the man was clad in a maester's robe, there was no chain about his neck. Sam cleared his throat. Good morrow. The man glanced up and did not appear to approve of what he saw. You smell of novice. I hope to be one soon. Sam drew out the letters John Snow had given him. I came from the wall with Maester Eamon, but he died during the voyage. If I could speak with the seneschal. Your name? Samwell. Samwell Tarley. The man wrote the name in his ledger, and waved his quill at a bench along the wall. "'Shit! You'll be called when wanted.' 
Sam took a seat on the bench. Others came and went. Some delivered messages and took their leave. Some spoke to the man on the dais and were sent through the door behind him and up a turnpike stair. Some joined Sam on the benches, waiting for their names to be called. A few of those who were summoned had come in after him, he was almost certain. After the fourth or fifth time that happened, he rose and crossed the room again. How much longer will it be? The Seneschal is an important man. I came all the way from the wall. Then you will have no trouble going a bit farther. He waved his quill. To that bench, just there, beneath the window. Sam returned to the bench. Another hour passed. Others entered, spoke to the man on the dais, waited a few moments, and were ushered onward. The gatekeeper did not so much as glance at Sam in all that time. The fog outside grew thinner as the day wore on, and pale sunlight slanted down through the windows. He found himself watching dust motes dance in the light. A yawn escaped him, then another. He picked at a broken blister on his palm, then leaned his head back and closed his eyes. He must have drowsed. The next he knew, the man behind the dais was calling out a name. Sam came lurching to his feet, then sat back down again when he realized it was not his name. "'You need to slip Lorcas a penny, or you'll be waiting here three days,' a voice beside him said. "'What brings the night's watch to the Citadel?' The speaker was a slim, slight, comely youth, clad in doeskin breeches and a snug green brigandine with iron studs. He had skin the color of a light brown ale and a cap of tight black curls that came to a widow's peak above his big black eyes. The Lord Commander is restoring the abandoned castles, Sam explained. We need more maesters for the ravens. Did you say a penny? A penny will serve. For a silver stag, Orcus will carry you up to the seneschal on his back. He has been fifty years an acolyte. He hates novices, particularly novices of noble birth. How could you tell I was of noble birth? The same way you can tell that I'm half Dornish. The statement was delivered with a smile, in a soft Dornish drawl. Sam fumbled for a penny. Are you a novice? An acolyte. Alaris, by some called Sphinx. The name gave Sam a jolt. The Sphinx is the riddle, not the riddler, he blurted. Do you know what that means? No. Is it a riddle? I wish I knew. I'm Samuel Tarley. Sam. Well met. And what business does Samuel Tarley have with Archmaster Theobald? Is he the seneschal? said Sam, confused. Maester Eamon said his name was Norrin. Not for the past two turns. There is a new one every year. They filled the office by lot from amongst the archmaesters, most of whom regard it as a thankless task that takes them away from their true work. This year the black stone was drawn by Archmaester Walgrave, but Walgrave's wits are prone to wander, so Theobald stepped up and said he'd serve his term. He's a gruff man, but a good one. Did you say Maester Eamon? Aye. Eamon Targaryen? Once. Most just called him Maester Eamon. He died during our voyage south. How is it that you know of him? How not? He was more than just the oldest living maester. He was the oldest man in Westeros, and lived through more history than Archmaester Peristan has ever learned. He could have told us much and more about his father's reign and his uncle's. How old was he, do you know? One hundred and two. What was he doing at sea, at his age? Sam chewed on the question for a moment, wondering how much he ought to say. The Sphinx is the riddle, not the Riddler. Could Maester Eamon have meant this Sphinx? It seemed unlikely. Lord Commander Snow sent him away to save his life. He began hesitantly. He spoke awkwardly of King Stannis and Melisandre of Asai, intending to stop at that. But one thing led to another, 
and he found himself speaking of Mance Raider and his wildlings, King's Blood and Dragons, and before he knew what was happening, all the rest came spilling out. The whites at the fist of first men, the other on his dead horse, the murder of the old bear at Craster's Keep, Gilly in their flight, White Tree and Small Paul, Cold Hands and the Ravens, John's becoming Lord Commander, the Blackbird, Darien, Bravos, the dragons Shondo saw in Carth, the Cinnamon Wind, and all that Maester Eamon whispered toward the end. He held back only the secrets that he was sworn to keep. About Brian Stark and his companions, and the babes Jon Snow had swapped. Daenerys is the only hope, he concluded. Eamon said the Citadel must send her a maester at once, to bring her home to Westeros before it is too late. Alaris listened intently. He blinked from time to time, but he never laughed and never interrupted. When Sam was done, he touched him lightly on the forearm with a slim brown hand and said, Save your penny, Sam. Theobald would not believe half of that, but there are those who might. Will you come with me? Where? To speak with an archmaster. You must tell them, Sam. Maester Eamon had said, You must tell the archmaesters. Very well. He could always return to the seneschal on the morrow, with a penny in his hand. How far do we have to go? Not far. The Isle of Ravens. They did not need a boat to reach the Isle of Ravens. A weathered wooden drawbridge linked it to the eastern bank. The Ravenry is the oldest building at the Citadel, Alaris told him, as they crossed over the slow-flowing waters of the Honeywine. In the Age of Heroes, it was supposedly the stronghold of a pirate lord who sat here robbing ships as they came down the river. Moss and creeping vines covered the walls, Sam saw, and ravens walked its battlements in place of archers. The drawbridge had not been raised in living memory. It was cool and dim inside the castle walls. An ancient weirwood filled the yard, as it had since these stones had first been raised. The carved face on its trunk was grown over by the same purple moss that hung heavy from the tree's pale limbs. Half of the branches seemed dead, but elsewhere a few red leaves still rustled, and it was there the ravens liked to perch. The tree was full of them, and there were more in the arched windows overhead, all around the yard. The ground was speckled by their droppings. As they crossed the yard, one flapped overhead, and he heard the others corking to each other. Archmaster Walgrave has his chambers in the west tower, below the white rookery, Alaris told him. The white ravens and the black ones quarrel like Dornishmen and marchers, so they keep them apart. Will Archmaster Walgrave understand what I am telling him? wondered Sam. You said his wits were prone to wonder. He has good days and bad ones, said Alaris, but it is not Walgrave you are going to see. He opened the doors of the North Tower and began to climb. Sam clambered up the steps behind him. There were flutterings and mutterings from above, and here and there an angry scream as the ravens complained of being woken. At the top of the steps, a pale blonde youth about Sam's age sat outside a door of oak and iron, staring intently into a candle flame with his right eye. His left was hidden beneath a fall of ash-blonde hair. "'What are you looking for?' Elleris asked him. "'Your destiny? Your death?' The blonde youth turned from the candle, blinking. "'Naked women,' he said. Who's this now? Samwell, a new novice, come to see the mage. The citadel is not what it was, complained the blonde. They will take anything these days. Dusky dogs and Dornishmen, pig boys, cripples, cretins, and now a black-clad whale. And here I thought leviathans were gray. A half-cape striped in green and gold draped one shoulder. He was very handsome, though his eyes were sly and his mouth cruel. Sam knew him. Leo Tyrell. 
Saying the name made him feel as if he were still a boy of seven, about to wet his small clothes. I am Sam from Horn Hill, Lord Randall Tarley's son. Truly? Leo gave him another look. I suppose you are. Your father told us all that you were dead. Or was it only that he wished you were? He grinned. Are you still a craven? No, lied Sam. John had made it a command. I went beyond the wall and fought in battles. They called me Sam the Slayer. He did not know why he said it. The words just tumbled out. Leo laughed, but before he could reply, the door behind him opened. Get in here, Slayer, growled the man in the doorway. And you, Sphinx, now. Sam, said Alaris, this is Archmaester Marwyn. Marwyn wore a chain of many medals around his bull's neck. Save for that, he looked more like a dockside thug than a maester. His head was too big for his body, and the way it thrust forward from his shoulders, together with that slab of jaw, made him look as if he were about to tear off someone's head. Though short and squat, he was heavy in the chest and shoulders, with a round, rock-hard ale-belly straining at the laces of the leather jerkin he wore in place of robes. Bristly white hair sprouted from his ears and nostrils. His brow beetled, his nose had been broken more than once, and Sourleaf had stained his teeth a mottled red. He had the biggest hands that Sam had ever seen. When Sam hesitated, one of those hands grabbed him by the arm and yanked him through the door. The room beyond was large and round. Books and scrolls were everywhere, strewn across the tables and stacked up on the floor in piles four feet high. Faded tapestries and ragged maps covered the stone walls. A fire was burning in the hearth beneath a copper kettle. Whatever was inside of it smelled burned. Aside from that, the only light came from a tall black candle in the center of the room. The candle was unpleasantly bright. There was something queer about it. The flame did not flicker. Even when Archmaster Marwyn closed the door so hard that papers blew off a nearby table. The light did something strange to colors, too. Whites were bright as fresh-fallen snow. Yellow shone like gold. Reds turned to flame. But the shadows were so black, they looked like holes in the world. Sam found himself staring. The candle itself was three feet tall and slender as a sword, ridged and twisted, glittering black. Is that? Obsidian, said the other man in the room, a pale, fleshy, pasty-faced young fellow with round shoulders, soft hands, close-set eyes, and food stains on his robes. Call it dragon glass. Archmaster Marwyn glanced at the candle for a moment. It burns, but is not consumed. What feeds the flame? asked Sam. What feeds a dragon's fire? Marwyn seated himself upon a stool. All Valerian sorcery was rooted in blood or fire. The sorcerers of the Freehold could see across mountains, seas, and deserts with one of these glass candles. They could enter a man's dreams and give him visions, and speak to one another half a world apart, seated before their candles. Do you think that might be useful, Slayer? We would have no more need of ravens. Only after battles. The archmaster peeled a sour leaf off a bale, shoved it in his mouth, and began to chew it. Tell me all you told our Dornish Sphinx. I know much of it, and more— but some small parts may have escaped my notice. He was not a man to be refused. Sam hesitated a moment, then told his tale again, as Marwyn, Alaris, and the other novice listened. Maester Eamon believed that Daenerys Targaryen was the fulfillment of a prophecy. Her, not Stannis, nor Prince Rhaegar, nor the prince thing whose head was dashed against the wall. Born amidst salt and smoke, beneath a bleeding star. I know the prophecy. Marwyn turned his head and spat a gob of red phlegm onto the floor. Not that I would trust it. Gorgon of old Gis 
once wrote that a prophecy is like a treacherous woman. She takes your member in her mouth, and you moan with the pleasure of it, and think, how sweet, how fine, how good this is. And then her teeth snap shut and your moans turn to screams. That is the nature of prophecy, said Gorgon. Prophecy will bite your prick off every time. He chewed a bit. Still, Alaris stepped up next to Sam. Eamon would have gone to her if he had the strength. He wanted us to send a maester to her, to counsel her and protect her, and fetch her safely home. Did he? Archmaester Marwyn shrugged. Perhaps it's good that he died before he got to Old Town. Elsewise the grey sheep might have had to kill him, and that would have made the poor old dears wring their wrinkled hands. Kill him? Sam said, shocked. Why? If I tell you, they may need to kill you, too. Marwin smiled a ghastly smile, the juice of the sour leaf running red between his teeth. Who do you think killed all the dragons the last time around? Gallant dragon slayers armed with swords? He spat. The world the Citadel is building has no place in it for sorcery or prophecy or glass candles, much less for dragons. Ask yourself why Aemon Targaryen was allowed to waste his life upon the wall, when by rights he should have been raised to Archmaester. His blood was why. He could not be trusted. No more than I can. What will you do? asked Alaris the Sphinx. Get myself to Slaver's Bay, in Aemon's place. The swan ship that delivered Slayer should serve my needs well enough. The grey sheep will send their man on a galley, I don't doubt. With fair winds, I should reach her first. Marwin glanced at Sam again and frowned. You, you should stay and forge your chain. If I were you, I would do it quickly. A time will come when you'll be needed on the wall. He turned to the pasty-faced novice. Find Slayer a dry cell. He'll sleep here and help you tend the ravens. But, 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 Sam sputtered, the other archmaesters, the seneschal, what should I tell them? Tell them how wise and good they are. Tell them that Aemon commanded you to put yourself into their hands. Tell them that you have always dreamed that one day you might be allowed to wear the chain and serve the greater good, that service is the highest honor and obedience the highest virtue. But say nothing of prophecies or dragons, unless you fancy poison in your porridge. Marwin snatched the stained leather cloak off a peg near the door and tied it tight. Sphinx, look after this one. I will, Alaris answered, but the archmaster was already gone. They heard his boots stomping down the steps. Where has he gone? asked Sam, bewildered. To the docks. The mage is not a man who believes in wasting time. Alaris smiled. I have a confession. Always was no chance encounter, Sam. The mage sent me to snatch you up before you spoke to Theobald. He knew that you were coming. How? Alaris nodded at the glass candle. Sam stared at the strange pale flame for a moment, then blinked and looked away. Outside the window it was growing dark. There's an empty sleeping cell under mine in the west tower, with steps that lead right up to Walgrave's chambers said the pasty-faced youth. If you don't mind the ravens corking, there's a good view of the honey wine. Will that serve? I suppose. He had to sleep somewhere. I will bring you some woolen coverlets. Stone walls turn cold at night, even here. My thanks. There was something about the pale, soft youth that he misliked, but he did not want to seem discourteous, so he added, my name's not Slayer, truly. I'm Sam. Samuel Tarley. I'm Pate, the other said. Like the pig boy. 
meanwhile, back on the wall. Hey, wait a minute, some of you may be saying about now. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Where's Danny and the dragons? Where's Tyrion? We hardly saw Jon Snow. That can't be all of it. Well, no. There's more to come. Another book as big as this one. I did not forget to write about the other characters. Far from it. I wrote lots about them. Pages and pages and pages. Chapters and more chapters. I was still writing when it dawned on me that the book had become too big to publish in a single volume. And I wasn't close to finished yet. To tell all of the story that I wanted to tell, I was going to have to cut the book in two. The simplest way to do that would have been to take what I had, chop it in half around the middle, and end with to be continued. The more I thought about that, however, the more I felt that the readers would be better served by a book that told all the story for half the characters rather than half the story for all the characters. So that's the route I chose to take. Tyrion, John, Danny, Stannis and Melisandre, Davis Seaworth, and all the rest of the characters you love or love to hate will be along next year, I devoutly hope, in A Dance with Dragons, which will focus on events along the wall and across the sea, just as the present book focused on King's Landing. George R. R. Martin, June 2005 Appendix The Kings and Their Courts The Queen Regent Cersei Lannister, the first of her name, widow of King Robert I Baratheon, Queen Dowager, Protector of the Realm, Lady of Casterly Rock, and Queen Regent. Queen Cersei's Children King Joffrey I Baratheon, poisoned at his wedding feast, a boy of twelve. Princess Myrcella Baratheon, a girl of nine, a ward of Prince Duran Martell at Sunspear. King Tommen I Baratheon, a boy king of eight years. His kittens, Sir Pounce, Lady Whiskers, Boots. Queen Cersei's brothers, Sir Jamie Lannister, her twin, called the Kingslayer, Lord Commander of the King's Guard. Tyrion Lannister, called the Imp, a dwarf, accused and condemned for regicide and kinslaying. Podrick Payne, Tyrion's squire, a boy of ten. Queen Cersei's uncles, aunt and cousins, Sir Kevin Lannister, her uncle, Sir Lancel, Sir Kevin's son, her cousin, formerly King Robert's squire and Cersei's lover, newly raised to Lord of Darry. Willem, Sir Kevin's son, murdered at River Run. Martin, twin to Willem, a squire. Jani, Sir Kevin's daughter, a girl of three. Lady Jenna Lannister, Cersei's aunt, married Sir Emmon Frey. Sir Cleos Frey, Jenna's son, killed by outlaws. Sir Tywin Frey, called Ty, Cleos' son. Willem Frey, Cleos' son, a squire. Sir Lionel Frey, Lady Jenna's second son. Tyon Frey, Jenna's son, murdered at River Run. Walder Frey, called Red Walder, Lady Jenna's youngest son, a page at Casterly Rock. Tyrek Lannister, Cersei's cousin, son of her father's late brother, Tyget. Lady Ermesand Hayford, Tyrek's child wife. Joy Hill, bastard daughter of Queen Cersei's lost uncle, Garion, a girl of eleven. Serena Lannister, Cersei's cousin, daughter of her late uncle Stafford, her mother's brother. Marielle Lannister, Cersei's cousin, and Serena's sister, daughter of her uncle Stafford. Sir David Lannister, her cousin, Stafford's son. Sir Damien Lannister, a more distant cousin, married Shira Craighall. Sir Lucian Lannister, their son. Lana, their daughter, married Lord Ontario, Jast. 
Lady Margot, a cousin still more distant, married Lord Titus Peake. King Tommen's small council. Lord Tywin Lannister, Hand of the King. Sir Jamie Lannister, Lord Commander of the King's Guard. Sir Kevin Lannister, Master of Laws. Barris, a eunuch, Master of Whisperers. Grand Maester Picel, Counselor and Healer. Lord Mace Tyrell, Lord Mathis Rowan, Lord Paxter Redwine, Counselors. Tommen's King's Guard, Sir Jamie Lannister, Lord Commander, Sir Marin Trant, Sir Boros Blount, removed and thence restored, Sir Balan Swan, Sir Osmond Kettleblack, Sir Loras Tyrell, the Knight of Flowers, Sir Aris Oakheart, with Princess Myrcella in Dorne. Cersei's household at King's Landing, Lady Jocelyn Swift, her companion, Sunel and Dorcas, her bedmaids and serving women, Lum, Red Lester, Hoke, called Horseleg, Short Ear, and Puckins, Guardsmen. Queen Marjorie of House Tyrell, a maid of sixteen, widowed bride of King Joffrey I Baratheon, and with Lord Renly Baratheon before him. Marjorie's court at King's Landing, Mace Tyrell, Lord of Highgarden, her father. Lady Allery, of House Hightower, her mother. Lady Olenna Tyrell, her grandmother, an aged widow called the Queen of Thorns. Arik and Eric, Lady Olenna's guards, twins seven feet tall called Left and Right. Sir Garland Tyrell, Marjorie's brother, the gallant. His wife, Lady Leonette, of House Fossaway. Sir Loras Tyrell, her youngest brother, the Knight of Flowers, a sworn brother of the King's Guard. Marjorie's lady companions, her cousins Mega, Alla, and Eleanor Tyrell, Eleanor's betrothed, Ellen Ambrose Squire, Lady Alison Belwar, a girl of eight, Meredith Crane, called Mary, Lady Tina Merriweather, Lady Alice Graceford, Septa Nesterica, a sister of the faith, Paxter Redwine, Lord of the Arbor, his twin sons, Sir Horace and Sir Haber, Maester Balabar, his healer and counselor, Mathis Rowan, Lord of Golden Grove, Sir William Withers, Marjorie's captain of the guards, Hugh Clifton, a handsome young guardsman, Sir Porterfer Woodwright, and his brother, Sir Lucantine, Circe's court at King's Landing. Sir Osfred Kettleblack and Sir Osney Kettleblack, younger brothers to Sir Osmond Kettleblack, Sir Gregor Clegane, called the Mountain that Rides, dying painfully of a poisoned wound, Sir Adam Marbrand, commander of the city watch of King's Landing, the Gold Cloaks, Jalabar Shaw, Prince of the Red Flower Vale, an exile from the Summer Isles, Giles Rosby, Lord of Rosby, troubled by a cough. Orton Merriweather, Lord of Longtable. Tana, his wife, a woman of Mir. Lady Tanda Stokeworth. Lady Fallis, her elder daughter and heir. Sir Balman Birch, Lady Fallis's husband. Lady Lollis, her younger daughter, great with child but weak of wit. Sir Bron of the Blackwater, Lady Lollis's husband, a former sellsword. Shea, a camp follower, serving as Lawless's bedmaid, strangled in Lord Tywin's bed. Maester Franken, in Lady Tanda's service. Sir Ilan Payne, the King's Justice, a headsman. Runner for Longwaters, chief underjailer of the Red Keep's dungeons. Rugen, underjailer for the Black Cells. Lord Hallen, the pyromancer, a wisdom of the Guild of Alchemists. Noho Dimittis, envoy from the Iron Bank of Bravos. Kyburn, a necromancer, once a maester of the Citadel, more recently of the Brave Companions. Moonboy, the royal jester and fool. Pate, a lad of eight, King Toman's whipping boy. Orman of Old Town, the royal harper and bard. 
Sir Mark Mullendore, who lost a monkey and half an arm in the Battle of the Blackwater. Orain Waters, the bastard of Driftmark. Lord Alessandra Stademan, called Penny Lover. Sir Ronnet Connington, called Red Ronnet, the Knight of Griffin's Roost. Sir Lambert Turnberry, Sir Dermot of the Rainwood, Sir Talad called the Tall, Sir Baird Norcross, Sir Bonifer Hasty called Bonifer the Good, Sir Hugo Vance, Knights Sworn to the Iron Throne, Sir Lyle Craighall called Strongbore, Sir Alan Stackspear, Sir John Betley called Beardless John, Sir Stephen Swift, Sir Humphrey Swift, Knights Sworn to Casterly Rock, Josman Peckledon, a squire and hero of the Blackwater, Garrett Page and New Piper, squires and hostages, the people of King's Landing, the High Septon, father of the faithful, voice of the seven on earth, an old man and frail, Septon Torbert, Septon Raynard, Septon Lucian, Septon Olidor, of the most devout, serving the seven at the great Sept of Baylor. Septa Moel, Septa Aglantine, Septa Hellicent, Septa Unella, of the most devout, serving the seven at the great Sept of Baylor. The Sparrows, the humblest of men, fierce in their piety. Chatea, proprietor of an expensive brothel. Aleia, her daughter. Dancy, Marie, two of Chatea's girls. Brella, a serving woman, lately in the service of Lady Sansa Stark. Tobo Mott, a master armorer. Hamish the harper, an aged singer. Alaric of Aeson, a singer far traveled. Watt, a singer, styling himself the Blue Bard. Sir Theodon Wells, a pious knight, later called Sir Theodon the True. King Toman's banner shows the crowned stag of Baratheon, black on gold, and the Lion of Lannister, gold on crimson, combatant. The King at the Wall Stannis Baratheon, the first of his name, second son of Lord Stephen Baratheon, and Lady Cassana of House Estremont, Lord of Dragonstone, styling himself King of Westeros. Queen Celis of House Florent, his wife, presently at East Watch by the Sea. Princess Shireen, their daughter, a girl of eleven. Patchface, Shireen's lackwit fool. Edric Storm, his bastard nephew, King Robert's son by Lady Delina Florent, a boy of twelve, sailing the narrow sea on the mad Prendos. Sir Andrew Estremont, King Stannis's cousin, a king's man, commanding Edric's escort. Sir Gerald Gower, Lewis, called the fishwife, Sir Tristan of Tally Hill, Omer Blackberry, King's men, Edric's guards and protectors. Stannis's court at Castle Black. Lady Melisandre of Asai, called the Red Woman, a priestess of Rilor, the Lord of Light. Mance Raider, King Beyond the Wall, a captive condemned to death. Raider's son by his wife, Dalla, a newborn as yet unnamed, the wildling prince. Gilly, the babe's wet nurse, a wildling girl. Her son, another newborn as yet unnamed, fathered by her father, Craster. Sir Richard Horp, Sir Justin Massey, Sir Clayton Suggs, Sir Godry Faring, called Giant Slayer. Lord Harwood Fell, Sir Corliss Penny, Queen's Men and Knights, Devon Seaworth, and Brian Faring, Royal Squires. Stannis's court at East Watch by the Sea, Sir Davos Seaworth, called the Onion Knight, Lord of the Rainwood, Admiral of the Narrow Sea, and Hand of the King. Sir Axel Florent, Queen Celis's uncle, foremost of the Queen's men. Salandar San of Lys, a pirate and sell-sail, 
master of the Valyrian, and a fleet of galleys. Stannis's garrison at Dragonstone, Sir Roland Storm, called the Bastard of Nightsong, a king's man, Castellan of Dragonstone, Maester Pylos, healer, tutor, counsellor, Porridge and Lamprey, two jailers, Lords sworn to Dragonstone, Monteris Valerian, Lord of the Tides and Master of Driftmark, a boy of six, Durham Bar Emmon, Lord of Sharp Point, a boy of fifteen years. Stannis's garrison at Storm's End, Sir Gilbert Farring, Castellan of Storm's End, Lord Elwood Meadows, Sir Gilbert's second, Maester Jern, Sir Gilbert's counsellor and healer. Lords sworn to Storm's End, Eldon Estremont, Lord of Greenstone, uncle to King Stannis, great-uncle to King Toman, a cautious friend to both, Sir Eamon, Lord Eldon's son and heir, with King Toman in King's Landing. Sir Alan, Sir Eamon's son, likewise with King Toman in King's Landing. Sir Lomas, brother of Lord Eldon, uncle and supporter of King Stannis at Storm's End. Sir Andrew, Sir Lomas's son, protecting Edric Storm upon the Narrow Sea. Lester Morrigan, Lord of Crow's Nest, Lord Lucas Chittering, called Little Lucas, a youth of sixteen. Davos Seaworth, Lord of the Rainwood. Maria, his wife, a carpenter's daughter. Dale, Allard, Mathis, Marrick, their four eldest sons, lost in the Battle of the Blackwater. Devon, a squire with King Stannis at Castle Black. Stannis, a boy of ten years, with Lady Maria on Cape Wrath. Stephen, a boy of six years, with Lady Maria on Cape Wrath. Stannis has taken for his banner the fiery heart of the Lord of Light, a red heart surrounded by orange flames upon a yellow field. Within the heart is the crowned stag of House Baratheon in black. King of the Isles and the North the great joys of Pike claim descent from the great king of the Age of Heroes. Legend says the great king ruled the sea itself and took a mermaid to wife. Aegon the dragon ended the line of the last king of the Iron Islands, but allowed the ironborn to revive their ancient custom and choose who should have the primacy among them. They chose Lord Vicon Greyjoy of Pike. The Greyjoy sigil is a golden kraken upon a black field. Their words are, We do not sow. Balan Greyjoy's first rebellion against the Iron Throne was put down by King Robert I Baratheon and Lord Eddard Stark of Winterfell. But in the chaos following Robert's death, Lord Balan named himself King once more and sent his ships to attack the North. Balan Greyjoy the ninth of his name since the Grey King, King of the Iron Islands and the North, King of Salt and Rock, Son of the Sea Wind, and Lord Reaper of Pike, killed in a fall. King Balan's widow, Queen Alanis of House Harlaw, their children, Roderick, slain during Balan's first rebellion, Marin, slain during Balan's first rebellion, Asha, their daughter, captain of the Black Wind, and conqueror of the Deepwood Mott, Theon, styling himself the Prince of Winterfell, called by Northmen Theon Turncloak, King Balan's brothers and half-brothers, Harlan, died of grayscale in his youth, Quentin died in infancy, Donal died in infancy, Euron, called Crow's Eye, Captain of the Silence, Victarion, Lord Captain of the Iron Fleet, Master of the Iron Victory. Uragon died of a wound gone bad. Aaron called Dampair, a priest of the drowned god. Russ and Norgen, two of his acolytes, the drowned men. Robin died in infancy. King Balan's household on Pike. 
Maester Windermere, healer and counselor, Helia, keeper of the castle. King Balan's warriors and sworn swords, Dagmar, called Cleftjaw, captain of Foam Drinker, commanding the Ironborn at Tarrant Square. Bluetooth, a longship captain. Uller, Skite, oarsmen and warriors. Claimants to the sea stone chair at the King's Moot on Old Wick. Gilbert Farwind, Lord of the Lonely Light. Gilbert's champions, his sons, Giles, Egon, Jan. Eric Ironmaker, called Eric Anvilbreaker and Eric the Just, an old man, once a famed captain and raider. Eric's champions, his grandsons, Eurek, Thormor, Dagon. Dunstan Drum, the Drum, the Bone Hand, Lord of Old Wick. Dunstan's champions, his sons Dennis and Donal, and Andric the Unsmiling, a giant of a man. Asha Greyjoy, only daughter of Balan Greyjoy, captain of the Black Wind. Asha's champions, Carl the Maid, Christopher Botley, and Sir Harris Harlaw. Asha's captains and supporters, Lord Roderick Harlaw, Lord Baylor Blacktide, Lord Meldred Merlin, Harmond Sharp. Victorian Greyjoy, brother to Balan Greyjoy, master of the Iron Victory, and Lord Captain of the Iron Fleet. Victorian's champions, Red Ralph Stonehouse, Ralph the Limper, and Newt the Barber. Victorian's captains and supporters, Hotho Harlaw, Alvin Sharp, Froleg the Strong, Romney Weaver, Will Humble, Little Lenwood Tawny, Ralph Kenning, Baron Volmart, Gorald Goodbrother. Victarian's crewman, Wolf One Ear, Ragnar Pike. Victarian's bedmate, a certain dusky woman, mute and tongueless, a gift from his brother Euron. Euron Greyjoy, called the Crow's Eye, brother to Balan Greyjoy, and captain of the Silence. Euron's champions, Germond Botley, Lord Arkwood of Orkmont, down a salt cliff. Euron's captains and supporters, Torwald Browntooth, Pinchface John Meyer, Roderick Freeborn, the Red Oarsman, Left Hand Lucas Codd, Quellen Humble, Harren Half Hor, Kemet Pike the Bastard, Carl the Thrall, Stonehand, Ralph the Shepherd, Ralph of Lordsport, Euron's crewman, Craghorn, Balan's bannermen, the lords of the Iron Islands. On Pike, Sir Wayne Botley, Lord of Lordsport, drowned by Euron Crozeye. Harren, his eldest son, killed at Moat Caelan. Christopher, his second son and rightful heir, dispossessed by his uncle. Simon, Carlin, Vicken, and Benarion, his younger sons, likewise dispossessed. German, his brother, made Lord of Lordsport. German's sons, Balan and Quellen. Sargon and Lucimor, Sawain's half-brothers. Wex, a mute boy of twelve years, bastard son of Sargon, squire to Theon Greyjoy. Walden Winch, Lord of Iron Holt. On Harlaw, Roderick Harlaw, called the Reader, Lord of Harlaw, Lord of Ten Towers, Harlaw of Harlaw. Lady Gwynneth, his elder sister. Lady Alanis, his younger sister, widow of King Balan Greyjoy. Siegfried Harlaw, called Siegfried Silverhair, his great uncle, master of Harlaw Hall. Hotho Harlaw, called Hotho Humpback of the Tower of Glimmering, a cousin. Sir Harris Harlaw, called the Knight, the Knight of Grey Garden, a cousin. Bormund Harlaw, called Bormund the Blue, master of Harridan Hill, a cousin. Lord Roderick's bannerman and sworn swords, Baron Volmart, Lord of Volmart, 
Meyer, Stone Tree, and Kenning, Lord Roderick's household, Three Tooth, his steward, a crone. On Black Tide, Bela Black Tide, Lord of Black Tide, Captain of the Night Flyer, Blind Ben Black Tide, a priest of the Drowned God. On Old Wick, Dunstan Drum, the Drum, Captain of Thunderer. Norn Goodbrother of Shatterstone. The Stone House. Tarl, called Tarl the Thrice Drowned, a priest of the Drowned God. On Great Wick, Gorald Goodbrother, Lord of the Hammerhorn. His sons, Graydon, Gran, and Gormund, triplets. His daughters, Gisela and Gwyn. Maester Murnmure, tutor, healer, and counselor. Tristan Farwind, Lord of Sealskin Point, the Spar, his son and heir, Stefarian, Mildred Merlin, Lord of Pebbleton. On Orkmont, Orkwood of Orkmont, Lord Tawny. On Saltcliffe, Lord Donner Saltcliffe, Lord Sunderley. On the Lesser Islands and Rocks, Gilbert Farwind, Lord of the Lonely Light, the Old Grey Gull, a priest of the drowned god. Other houses great and small. House Arryn. The Arryns are descended from the kings of mountain and vale. Their sigil is a white moon and falcon upon a sky-blue field. House Arryn has taken no part in the war of the five kings. Their Arryn words are as high as honor. Robert Arryn, Lord of the Eyrie, Defender of the Vale, styled by his mother Two Warden of the East, a sickly boy of eight years, sometimes called Sweet Robin. His mother, Lady Lysa of House Tully, widow of Lord John Arryn, pushed from the moon door to her death. His stepfather, Peter Baelish, called Littlefinger, Lord of Harrenhal, Lord Paramount of the Trident, and Lord Protector of the Vale. Elaine Stone, Lord Peter's natural daughter, a maid of three and ten, actually Sansa Stark. Sir Lothar Brune, a sellsword in Lord Peter's service, the Eyrie's captain of guards. Oswell, a grizzled man-at-arms in Lord Peter's service, sometimes called Kettle Black. Lord Robert's household at the Eyrie. Marillion, a handsome young singer, much favored by Lady Lysa, and accused of her murder. Maester Coleman, counselor, healer, and tutor. Mord, a brutal jailer with teeth of gold. Gretchel, Maddie, and Mela, serving women. Lord Robert's bannermen, the Lords of the Vale. Lord Nestor Royce, high steward of the Vale, and Castellan of the Gates of the Moon. Sir Albar, Lord Nestor's son and heir. Miranda, called Randa, Lord Nestor's daughter, a widow but scarce used. Lord Nestor's household. Sir Marwyn Belmore, captain of guards. Maya Stone, a mule tender and guide, bastard daughter of King Robert I Baratheon. Ossie and Carrot, mule tenders. Lionel Corbray, Lord of Hearts Home. Sir Lynn Corbray, his brother and heir, who wields the famed blade Lady Forlorn. Sir Lucas Corbray, his younger brother. John Linderley, Lord of the Snakewood. Terence, his son and heir, a young squire. Edmund Waxley, the Knight of Wickenden. Gerald Grafton, the Lord of Gulltown. Giles, his youngest son, a squire. Tristan Sunderland, Lord of the Three Sisters. Godric Borrell, Lord of Sweet Sister. Roland Longthorpe, Lord of Long Sister. Alessander Torrent, Lord of Little Sister. The Lord's Declarant, Bannermen of House Arryn, joined together in defense of young Lord Robert. Jan Royce, called Bronze Jan, Lord of Runestone, of the senior branch of House Royce. Sir Andar, Bronze Jan's sole surviving son, and heir to Runestone. 
Ron John's household, Maester Hellebeg, tutor, healer, counselor, Septon Nucas, Sir Samuel Stone, called Strong Sam Stone, master at arms, Bronze Jan's bannermen and sworn swords, Royce Coldwater, Lord of Coldwater Burn, Sir Damon Shett, Knight of Gull Tower, Ruther Tollett, Lord of the Grey Glen, Anya Wainwood, Lady of Iron Oaks Castle, Sir Morton, her eldest son and heir, Sir Donald, her second son, the Knight of the Gate, Wallace, her youngest son, Harold Harding, her ward, a squire oft called Harry the Heir. Benadar Belmore, Lord of Strongsong. Sir Simon Templeton, the Knight of Nine Stars. Eon Hunter, Lord of Longbow Hall, recently deceased. Sir Gilwood, Lord Eon's eldest son and heir, now called Young Lord Hunter. Sir Eustace, Lord Eon's second son. Sir Harlan, Lord Eon's youngest son. Young Lord Hunter's household, Maester Williman, Counselor, Healer, Tutor. Horton Redfort, Lord of Redfort, thrice wed. Sir Jasper, Sir Creighton, Sir John, his sons. Sir Michael, his youngest son, a new made knight, married Isilla Royce of Runestone. Clan chiefs from the Mountains of the Moon. Shaga, son of Dolph, of the Stone Crows, presently leading a band in the Kingswood. Timit, son of Timit, of the Burned Men. Chella, daughter of Chake, of the Black Ears. Cron, son of Kalor, of the Moon Brothers. House Florent. The Florents of Brightwater Keep are bannermen of Highgarden. At the outset of the War of the Five Kings, Lord Alistair Florent followed his liege lord in declaring for King Renly, while his brother Sir Axel chose Stannis, husband to his niece Celis. After Renly's death, Lord Alistair went over to Stannis as well, with all the strength of Brightwater. Stannis made Lord Alistair his hand, and gave command of his fleet to Sir Imre Florent, his wife's brother. The fleet and Sir Imre both were lost in the Battle of Blackwater, and Lord Alistair's efforts to negotiate a peace after the defeat were regarded by King Stannis as treason. He was given to the Red Priestess Melisandre, who burned him as a sacrifice to R'hllor. The Iron Throne has also named the Florence traitors for their support of Stannis and his rebellion. They were tainted, and Brightwater Keep and its lands were awarded to Sir Garland Tyro. The sigil of House Florent shows a fox head in a circle of flowers. Alistair Florent, Lord of Brightwater, burned as a traitor. His wife, Lady Malara of House Crane, their children, Alakine, a tainted Lord of Brightwater, fled to Old Town to seek refuge at the High Tower. Lady Melissa wed to Lord Randall Tarley. Lady Rhea wed to Lord Leighton Hightower. His siblings, Sir Axel, a Queen's man, in service to his niece, Queen Celis, at East Watch by the Sea. Sir Ryam died in a fall from a horse. Celis, his daughter, wife, and queen to King Stannis I Baratheon. Shireen Baratheon, her only child. Sir Imri, his eldest son, killed in the Battle of the Blackwater. Sir Aaron, his second son, a captive at Highgarden. Sir Colin, Castellan at Brightwater Keep. Delina, his daughter, married Sir Hosman Norcross. Her natural son, Edric Storm, fathered by King Robert I Baratheon. Alistair Norcross, her eldest true-born son, a boy of nine. Renly Norcross, her second true-born son, a boy of three. Maester Omer, Sir Colin's eldest son, in service at Old Oak. Merrill, Sir Colin's youngest son, a squire on the arbor. Rylene, Lord Alistair's sister, married Sir Richard Crane. House Frey The Freys are bannermen to House Tully, but have not always been diligent in their duty. 
At the onset of the War of the Five Kings, Rob Stark won Lord Walter's allegiance by pledging to marry one of his daughters or granddaughters. When he wed Lady Janie Westerling instead, the phrase conspired with Roose Bolton and murdered the young wolf and his followers at what became known as the Red Wedding. Walter Frey, Lord of the Crossing By his first wife, Lady Pera of House Royce, Sir Stephen died after the Battle of Oxcross, married Corinna Swan, died of a wasting illness. Stephen's eldest son, Sir Ryman, heir to the twins, Ryman's son Edwin, wed to Janice Hunter, Edwin's daughter Walda, a girl of nine. Ryman's son Walter, called Black Walter, Ryman's son Peter, called Peter Pimple, hanged at Old Stones, married Melinda Caron. Peter's daughter, Pera, a girl of five. Married Janie Ludden, died in a fall from a horse. Stivron's son, Aegon, called Jingle Bell, killed at the Red Wedding by Caitlin Stark. Stivron's daughter, Miguel, died in childbed. Married Sir Daphne Vance. Miguel's daughter, Marianne Vance, a maiden. Miguel's son, Walter Vance, a squire. Miguel's son, Patrick Vance. Married Marcella Wainwood, died in childbed. Stephen's son, Walton, married Diana Harding. Walton's son, Stephen, called the Sweet. Walton's daughter, Walda, called Fair Walda. Walton's son, Brian, a squire. Sir Emmon, Lord Walter's second son, married Jenna Lannister. Emmon's son, Sir Cleos, killed by outlaws near Maidenpool, married Janie Darry. Cleos's son, Tywin, a squire of twelve. Cleos's son, Willem, a page at Ashmark, ten. Emmon's son, Sir Lionel, married Melissa Craighall. Emmon's son, Tyon, a squire, murdered by Rickard Carstark while a captive at River Run. Emmon's son, Walter, called Red Walter, fourteen, a page at Casterly Rock. Sir Anus, Lord Walter's third son, married Tyanna Wilde, died in childbed. Anus's son, Aegon Bloodborne, an outlaw. Anus's son, Rager, married Janie Beesbury, died of a wasting illness. Rager's son, Robert, a boy of thirteen. Rager's daughter, Walda, a girl of eleven, called White Walda. Rager's son, Jonas, a boy of eight. Perianne, Lord Walter's daughter, married Sir Leslin Haig. Perianne's son, Sir Harris Haig. Harris's son, Walter Haig, a boy of five. Perianne's son, Sir Donald Haig. Perianne's son, Alan Haig, a squire. By his second wife, Lady Serena of House Swan, Sir Jared, Lord Walter's fourth son, married Alice Frey. Jared's son, Sir Titus, slain by Sandor Clegane during the Red Wedding, married Zoe Blaintree. Titus's daughter, Zia, a maid of fourteen. Titus's son, Zachary, a boy of twelve, sworn to the faith, training at the Sept of Old Town. Jared's daughter, Kyra, married Sir Garth Goodbrook, slain during the Red Wedding. Kyra's son, Walter Goodbrook, a boy of nine. Kyra's daughter, Janie Goodbrook, six. Septon Lucian, in service at the Great Sept of Baylor. By his third wife, Lady Amari of House Craighall, Sir Hostine married Bellina Habwick. Hostine's son, Sir Arwood, married Rayella Royce. Arwood's daughter, Rayella, a girl of five. Arwood's twin sons, Andro and Alan, four. Arwood's daughter, Hostella, a newborn babe. 
Blythini, Lord Walter's daughter, married Lord Lucius Viprin. Blythini's daughter, Eliana, married Sir John Wilde. Eliana's son, Rickard Wilde, four. Blythini's son, Sir Damon Viprin. Simon married Betharios of Bravos. Simon's son, Alessandra, a singer. Simon's daughter, Alex, a maid of seventeen. Simon's son, Bradamar, a boy of ten, a ward of Oro Tenderis, a merchant of Bravos. Sir Danwell, Lord Walter's eighth son, married Winifrey Went. Many stillbirths and miscarriages. Merritt, hanged at Old Stones, married Maria Darry. Merritt's daughter, Amari, called Amy, married Sir Pate of the Blue Fork, slain by Sir Gregor Clegane. Merritt's daughter, Walter, called Fat Walter, married Roose Bolton, Lord of the Dreadfort. Merritt's daughter, Marissa, a maid of thirteen. Merritt's son, Walter, called Little Walter, eight, a squire in service to Ramsay Bolton. Sir Jeremy, drowned, married Caroline Wainwood. Jeremy's son, Sandor, a boy of twelve, a squire. Jeremy's daughter, Cynthia, a girl of nine, a ward of Lady Anya Wainwood. Sir Raymond, married Beany Beesbury. Raymond's son, Robert, an acolyte at the Citadel. Raymond's son, Malwin, serving with alchemist in Lys. Raymond's twin daughters, Sarah and Sarah. Raymond's daughter, Circe, called Little Bee. Raymond's twin sons, Jamie and Tywin, newborn. By his fourth wife, Lady Alyssa of House Blackwood. Lothar, Lord Walter's twelfth son, called Lame Lothar, married Leonella Lefford. Lothar's daughter, Tysane, a girl of seven. Lothar's daughter, Walda, a girl of five. Lothar's daughter, Emberley, a girl of three. Lothar's daughter, Liana, a newborn babe. Sir Jamos, Lord Walder's thirteenth son, married Sally Page. Jamos's son, Walder, called Big Walder, eight, a squire in service to Ramsay Bolton. Jamos's twin sons, Dickon and Mathis, five. Sir Whelan, Lord Walder's fourteenth son, married Silva Page. Whelan's son, Hoster, a squire of twelve, in service to Sir Damon Page. Whelan's daughter, Marianne, called Mary, eleven. Mariah, Lord Walder's daughter, married Sir Flemont Brax. Mariah's son, Robert Brax, nine, a page at Casterly Rock. Mariah's son, Walter Brax, a boy of six. Mariah's son, John Brax, a babe of three. Tita, Lord Walter's daughter, called Tita the Maid. By his fifth wife, Lady Saria of House Went, no progeny. By his sixth wife, Lady Bethany of House Rossby, Sir Perwin, Lord Walter's fifteenth son, Sir Benfrey, Lord Walter's sixteenth son, died of a wound received at the Red Wedding, married Jeanna Frey, a cousin. Benfrey's daughter Della, called Deaf Della, a girl of three. Benfrey's son Osmond, a boy of two. Maester Willeman, Lord Walter's seventeenth son, in service at Longbow Hall. Oliver, Lord Walter's eighteenth son, formerly a squire to Rob Stark. Roslyn, sixteen, married Lord Edmer Tully at the Red Wedding. By his seventh wife, Lady Annera of House Firing, Arwen, Lord Walter's daughter, a maid of fourteen. Wendell, Lord Walter's nineteenth son, thirteen, a page at Seaguard. Colmar, Lord Walter's twentieth son, eleven, and promised to the faith. Walter, called Tyre, Lord Walter's twenty-first son, ten. Elmer, Lord Walter's last-born son, a boy of nine, briefly betrothed to Arya Stark. Sheree, Lord Walter's youngest child, a girl of seven. His eighth wife, Lady Joyeuse of House Erinford, 
presently with child. Lord Walter's natural children by sundry mothers. Walter Rivers, called Bastard Walter, Bastard Walter's son, Sir Eamon Rivers, Bastard Walter's daughter, Walter Rivers, Maester Melwis in service at Rosby, Janie Rivers, Martin Rivers, Riger Rivers, Rono Rivers, Malara Rivers, others. House Hightower The Hightowers of Old Town are among the oldest and proudest of the great houses of Westeros, tracing their descent back to the first men. Once kings, they have ruled Old Town and its environs since the dawn of days, welcoming the Andals rather than resisting them, and later bending the knee to the kings of the Reach and giving up their crowns whilst retaining all their ancient privileges. Though powerful and immensely wealthy, the lords of the High Tower have traditionally preferred trade to battle, and have seldom played a large part in the wars of Westeros. The High Towers were instrumental in the founding of the Citadel, and continue to protect it to this day. Subtle and sophisticated, they have always been great patrons of learning and the faith, and it is said that certain of them have also dabbled in alchemy, necromancy, and other sorcerous arts. The arms of House Hightower show a stepped white tower crowned with fire on a smoke-gray field. The house words are, We light the way. Leighton Hightower, voice of Old Town, Lord of the Port, Lord of the Hightower, Defender of the Citadel, Beacon of the South, called the Old Man of Old Town. Lady Rhea of House Hightower, his fourth wife. Lord Leighton's eldest son and heir, Sir Baylor, called Baylor Bright Smile, married Rhonda Rowan. Lord Leighton's daughter, Melora, called the Mad Maid. Lord Leighton's daughter, Allery, married Lord Mace Tyrell. Lord Leighton's son, Sir Garth, called Greysteel. Lord Leighton's daughter, Denise, married Sir Desmond Redwine. Her son, Dennis, a squire. Lord Leighton's daughter, Layla, married Sir John Cups. Lord Leighton's daughter, Alisanne, married Lord Arthur Ambrose. Lord Leighton's daughter, Liness, married Lord Jorah Mormont, presently chief concubine to Tregor O'Morlan of Lys. Lord Leighton's son, Sir Gunther, married Janie Fossaway of the Green Apple Fossaways. Lord Leighton's youngest son, Sir Humphrey. Lord Leighton's bannerman, Toman Costain, Lord of the Three Towers. Alisanne Bulwer, Lady of Black Crown, a girl of eight. Martin Mullendore, Lord of Uplands. Warren Beesbury, Lord of Honeyholt. Branston Quay, Lord of Sunflower Hall. The people of Old Town. Emma, a serving wench at the Quill and Tankard, where the women are willing and the cider is fearsomely strong. Rosie, her daughter, a girl of five and ten, whose maidenhead will cost a golden dragon. The Archmaesters of the Citadel, Archmaester Norrin, seneschal for the waning year, whose ring and rod and mask are Electrum. Archmaester Theobald, seneschal for the coming year, whose ring and rod and mask are lead. Archmaester Ibros, the healer, whose ring and rod and mask are silver. Archmaester Marwyn, called Marwyn the Mage, whose ring and rod and mask are Valerian steel. Archmaester Periston, the historian, whose ring and rod and mask are copper. Archmaester Valen, called Vinegar Valen, the stargazer, whose ring and rod and mask are bronze. Archmaester Ryam, whose ring and rod and mask are yellow gold. Archmaester Walgrave, an old man of uncertain wit, whose ring and rod and mask are black iron. Gallard, Castos, Darabello, Benedict, Garrison, Nymus, Setheries, Willifer, Mollus, Harridan, Gyne, Agravain, Ockley, Archmaesters all. Maesters, acolytes, and novices of the Citadel. Maester Gorman, who oft serves in Walgrave's stead. Armin, an acolyte of four links, called the Acolyte. Alarus, called the Sphinx, an acolyte of three links, 
a devoted archer, Robert Frey, sixteen, an acolyte of two links, Lorcas, an acolyte of nine links, in service to the seneschal, Leo Tyrell, called Lazy Leo, a high-born novice, Molander, a novice, born with a club foot, Pate, who tends Archmaster Walgrave's ravens, a novice of little promise, Rune, a young novice, House Lannister. The Lannisters of Casterly Rock remain the principal support of King Tommen's claim to the Iron Throne. They boast of descent from Lan the Clever, the legendary trickster of the Age of Heroes. The gold of Casterly Rock and the Golden Tooth has made them the wealthiest of the great houses. The Lannister sigil is a golden lion upon a crimson field. Their words are, Hear me roar. Tywin Lannister, Lord of Casterly Rock, Shield of Lannisport, Warden of the West, and Hand of the King, murdered by his dwarf son in his privy. Lord Tywin's children, Cersei, twin to Jaime, now Lady of Casterly Rock, Sir Jaime, twin to Cersei, called the Kingslayer, Tyrion, called the Imp, Dwarf and Kinslayer, Lord Tywin's siblings and their offspring. Sir Kevin Lannister married Dorna of House Swift. Lady Jenna married Sir Emmon Frey, now Lord of Riverrun. Jenna's eldest son, Sir Cleos Frey, married Janie of House Darry, killed by outlaws. Cleos's eldest son, Sir Tywin Frey, called Ty, now heir to Riverrun. Cleos's second son, William Frey, a squire. Jenna's second son, Sir Lionel Frey, Jenna's third son, Tyon Frey, a squire, murdered while a captive at River Run. Jenna's youngest son, Walder Frey, called Red Walder, a page at Casterly Rock. White Smile Watt, a singer in service to Lady Jenna. Sir Tygett Lannister, died of a pox. Tyrek, Tygett's son, missing and feared dead. Lady Ermesond Hayford, Tyrick's child wife. Garion Lannister, lost at sea. Joy Hill, Garion's bastard daughter, eleven. Lord Tywin's other close kin. Sir Stafford Lannister, a cousin and brother to Lord Tywin's wife, slain in battle at Oxcross. Serena and Miriel, Stafford's daughters. Sir David Lannister, Stafford's son. Sir Damien Lannister, a cousin, married Lady Sierra Craighall. Their son, Sir Lucian, their daughter Lana, married Lord Ontario Jast. Lady Margot, a cousin, married Lord Titus Peak. The household at Casterly Rock. Maester Craylin, healer, tutor, and counselor. Villar, captain of guards. Sir Benedict Broom, master at arms. White Smile Watt, a singer. Bannermen and Sworn Swords, Lords of the West. Damon Marbrand, Lord of Ashmark. Sir Adam Marbrand, his son and heir, commander of the City Watch of King's Landing. Roland Craighall, Lord of Craighall. Roland's brother, Sir Burton, slain by outlaws. Roland's son and heir, Sir Tybalt. Roland's son, Sir Lyle, called Strongbore. Roland's youngest son, Sir Merlin. Sebastian Farman, Lord of Fair Isle. Janie, his sister, married Sir Gareth Clifton. Titus Brax, Lord of Hornvale. Sir Flemont Brax, his brother and heir. Quentin Bainfort, Lord of Bainfort. Sir Harris Swift, good father to Sir Kevin Lannister. Sir Harris's son, Sir Stephen Swift. Sir Stephen's daughter, Joanna. Sir Harris's daughter, Shirley. Married Sir Melwyn Sarsfield. Reginard Estrin, Lord of Windhall. Gawain Westerling, Lord of the Crag. His wife, Lady Sybil, of House Spicer. Her brother, Sir Rolf Spicer, newly raised to Lord of Castamere. Her cousin, Sir Samuel Spicer, their children, 
Sir Reynold Westerling, Janie, widowed wife of Rob Stark, Elena, a girl of twelve, Rollum, a boy of nine, Lord Selmond Staxpeer, his son, Sir Stephen Staxpeer, his younger son, Sir Alan Staxpeer, Terence Kenning, Lord of Case, Sir Kenneth of Case, a knight in his service, Lord Ontario Jast, Lord Robin Moreland, Lady Alison Lefford, Lewis Lydon, Lord of the Deep Den, Lord Philip Plum, his sons, Sir Dennis Plum, Sir Peter Plum, and Sir Harwin Plum, called Hardstone, Lord Garrison Prester, Sir Forley Prester, his cousin, Sir Gregor Clegane, called The Mountain That Rides, Sandor Clegane, his brother, Sir Laurent Lorch, a landed knight, Sir Garth Greenfield, a landed knight, Sir Lyman Vickery, a landed knight, Sir Reynard Rutiger, a landed knight, Sir Manfred Yu, a landed knight, Sir Tybalt Heatherspoon, a landed knight, Melara Heatherspoon, his daughter, drowned in a well while a ward at Casterly Rock. House Martell Dorn was the last of the seven kingdoms to swear fealty to the Iron Throne. Blood, custom, geography, and history all helped to set the Dornishmen apart from the other kingdoms. At the outbreak of the War of the Five Kings, Dorn took no part, but when Marcella Baratheon was betrothed to Prince Tristain, Sunspear declared its support for King Joffrey. The Martell banner is a red sun pierced by a golden spear. Their words are unbowed, unbent, unbroken. Duran Nemeros Martell, Lord of Sunspear, Prince of Dorn. His wife, Malario, of the free city of Norvos. Their children, Princess Ariane, heir to Sunspear. Garin, Ariane's milk brother and companion of the orphans of the green blood. Prince Quentin, a new made knight, long fostered by Lord Ironwood of Ironwood. Prince Tristain, betrothed to Marcella Baratheon. Prince Duran's siblings. Princess Elia, raped and murdered during the sack of King's Landing. Rhaenys Targaryen, her young daughter, murdered during the sack of King's Landing. Aegon Targaryen, a babe at the breast, murdered during the sack of King's Landing. Prince Oberyn, called the Red Viper, slain by Sir Gregor Clegane during a trial by combat. Ilaria Sand, Prince Oberyn's paramour, natural daughter of Lord Harmon Uller. The Sand Snakes, Oberyn's bastard daughters. Obara, eight and twenty, Oberyn's daughter by an old town whore. Nymeria, called Lady Nym, five and twenty, his daughter by a noblewoman of Volantis. Tyene, three and twenty, Oberyn's daughter by a scepter. Sorella, nineteen, his daughter by a traitor, captain of the feathered kiss. Ilia, fourteen, his daughter by Ilaria Sand. Obella, twelve, his daughter by Ilaria Sand. Dorea, eight, his daughter by Ilaria Sand. Lorisa, six, his daughter by Ilaria Sand. Prince Duran's court at the Water Gardens. Ario Hota of Norvos, Captain of the Guards. Maester Calliot, Counselor, Healer, and Tutor. Threescore children of both high and common birth, sons and daughters of lords, knights, orphans, merchants, craftsmen, and peasants, his wards. Prince Duran's court at Sunspear. Princess Marcella Baratheon, his ward, betrothed to Prince Tristain. Sir Aris Oakhart, Marcella's sworn shield. Rosamond Lannister, Marcella's bedmaid and companion, a distant cousin. Septa Eglantine, Marcella's confessor. Maestro Miles, counselor, healer, and tutor. Ricasso, seneschal at Sunspear, old and blind. Sir Manfrey Martell, castellan at Sunspear. Lady Alice Lady Bright, Lord Treasurer. Sir Gascoigne of the Green Blood, Prince Tristane's sworn shield. 
Bors, and Timoth, serving men at Sunspear. Belendra, Cedra, the sisters Mora and Mele, serving women at Sunspear. Prince Doran's bannermen, the lords of Dorne. Anders Ironwood, Lord of Ironwood, Warden of the Stoneway, the Blood Royal. Sir Cletus, his son, known for a lazy eye. Maester Kedry, healer, tutor, and counselor. Harmon Uller, Lord of Hellholt, Alaria Sand, his natural daughter. Sir Ulwick Uller, his brother. Delani Alirian, Lady of God's Grace. Sir Ryan, her son and heir. Sir Damon Sand, Ryan's natural son, the bastard of God's Grace. Dagos Manwoody, Lord of King's Grave. Morse and Dickon, his sons. Sir Miles, his brother. Lara Blackmont, Lady of Blackmont. Janessa, her daughter and heir. Peros, her son, a squire. Nimona Toland, Lady of Ghost Hill. Quentin Corgyle, Lord of Sandstone. Sir Julian, his eldest son and heir. Sir Aaron, his second son. Sir Dezeal Dalt, the Knight of Lemonwood. Sir Andre, his brother and heir, called Dre. Franklin Fowler, Lord of Skyreach, called the Old Hawk, the Warden of the Prince's Pass. Janie and Janellen, his twin daughters. Sir Simon Santagar, the Knight of Spotswood. Silva, his daughter and heir, called Spotted Silva for her freckles. Hedrick Dane, Lord of Starfall, a squire. Sir Gerald Dane, called Darkstar, the Knight of High Hermitage, his cousin and bannerman. Trevor Jordane, Lord of the Tor. Miria, his daughter and heir. Tremont Gargallon, Lord of Saltshore. Darren Faith, Lord of the Red Dunes. House Stark. The Starks trace their descent from Brandon the Builder and the Kings of Winter. For thousands of years they ruled from Winterfell as kings in the north, until Torrin Stark, the king who knelt, chose to swear fealty to Aegon the Dragon rather than give battle. When Lord Eddard Stark of Winterfell was executed by King Joffrey, the Northmen forswore their loyalty to the Iron Throne and proclaimed Lord Eddard's son Rob as king in the north. During the War of the Five Kings, he won every battle, but was betrayed and murdered by the Freys and Boltons at the Twins during his uncle's wedding. Rob Stark, King in the North, King of the Trident, Lord of Winterfell, eldest son of Lord Eddard Stark and Lady Caitlin of House Tully, a youth of sixteen called the Young Wolf, murdered at the Red Wedding. Grey Wind, his dire wolf, killed at the Red Wedding, his two born siblings, Sansa, his sister, married Tyrion of House Lannister. Lady, her dire wolf, killed at Castle Darry. Arya, a girl of eleven, missing and thought dead. Nymeria, her dire wolf, prowling the riverlands. Brandon, called Bran, a crippled boy of nine, heir to Winterfell, believed dead. Summer, his dire wolf. Brand's companions and protectors. Mira Reed, a maid of sixteen, daughter of Lord Howland Reed of Greywater Watch. Jojen Reed, her brother at thirteen. Hodor, a simple boy, seven feet tall. Rickon, a boy of four, believed dead. Shaggy Dog, his dire wolf, black and savage. Rickon's companion, Osha, a wildling, once captive at Winterfell. His bastard half-brother, Jon Snow, of the Night's Watch. Ghost, Jon's dire wolf, white and silent. Rob's sworn swords. Donal Locke, Owen Norrie, Daisy Mormont, Sir Wendell Manderley, Robin Flint, slain at the Red Wedding. Hallis Mullen, captain of the guards, escorting Edward Stark's bones back to Winterfell. Jax, Quent, Shad, Guardsman. Rob's uncles and cousins, Benjamin Stark, his father's younger brother, 
lost ranging beyond the wall, presumed dead. Lysa Aaron, his mother's sister, Lady of the Erie, married Lord John Aaron, slain with a shove. Their son, Robert Aaron, Lord of the Erie and Defender of the Vale, a sickly boy. Edmure Tully, Lord of Riverrun, his mother's brother, taken captive at the Red Wedding. Lady Roslyn of House Frey, Edmure's bride. Sir Brendan Tully, called the Blackfish, his mother's uncle, Castellan of Riverrun. The young wolf's bannermen, the Lords of the North. Bruce Bolton, Lord of the Dreadfort, the Turncloak. Domeric, his true-born son and heir, died of a bad belly. Ramsay Bolton, formerly Ramsay Snow, Bruce's natural son, called the Bastard of Bolton, Castellan of Dreadfort. Walter Frey and Walter Frey, called Big Walter and Little Walter, Ramsay's squires. Reek, a man-at-arms infamous for his stench, slain while posing as Ramsay. Arya Stark, Lord Roos's captive, a feigned girl betrothed to Ramsay. Walton, called Steelshanks, Roos's captain. Beth Castle, Kyra, Turnip, Pala, Bandy, Shira, Pala, and Old Nan. Women of Winterfell held captive at the Dreadfort. John Umber, called the Great John, Lord of the Last Hearth, a captive at the Twins. John, called the Small John, the Great John's eldest son and heir, slain at the Red Wedding. Moors, called Crowfood, uncle to the Great John, Castellan at the Last Hearth. Hother, called Horsebane, uncle to the Great John, likewise Castellan at the Last Hearth. Rickard Carstark, Lord of Carhold, beheaded for treason and murder of prisoner. Eddard, his son, slain in the Whispering Wood. Torhen, his son, slain in the Whispering Wood. Harrian, his son, a captive at Maidenpool. Alice, Lord Rickard's daughter, a maid of fifteen. Rickard's uncle, Arnolf, Castellan of Carhold. Galbert Glover, master of Deepwood Mott, unwed. Robert Glover, his brother and heir. Robert's wife, Sybil, of House Lock. Their children, Gawain, a boy of three. Irena, a babe at the breast. Galbert's ward, Lawrence Snow, natural son of Lord Hallis Hornwood, a boy of thirteen. Howland Reed, Lord of Greywater Watch, a Cranach man, his wife, Diana, of the Cranach men, their children, Mira, a young huntress, John Jen, a boy blessed with green sight, Wyman Manderley, Lord of White Harbor, vastly fat, Sir Willis Manderley, his eldest son and heir, very fat, a captive at Harren Hall, Willis's wife, Leona, of House Woolfield, Winifred, their daughter, a maid of nineteen years. Willa, their daughter, a maid of fifteen. Sir Wendell Manderley, his second son, slain at the Red Wedding. Sir Marlon Manderley, his cousin, commander of the garrison at White Harbor. Maester Theomore, counselor, tutor, healer. Mage Mormont, lady of Bear Island. Daisy, her eldest daughter and heir, slain at the Red Wedding. Alison, Lyra, Jarell, Liana, her daughters. Jior Mormont, her brother, Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, slain by own men. Sir Jorah Mormont, Lord Jior's son, once Lord of Bear Island in his own right, a knight condemned and exiled. Sir Helmund Tallhart, Master of Torhen Square, slain at Duskendale. Benfred, his son and heir, slain by iron men on the stony shore. Edera, his daughter, captive at Torhin Square. Leobald, his brother, killed at Winterfell. Leobald's wife, Verena, of House Hornwood, captive at Torhin Square. Their sons, 
Brandon, and Barron, likewise captives at Torin Square. Roderick Riswell, Lord of the Rills, Barbary Dustin, his daughter, Lady of Barrowton, widow of Lord William Dustin, Harwood Stout, her liege man, a petty lord at Barrowton, Bethany Bolton, his daughter, second wife of Lord Bruce Bolton, died of a fever. Roger Riswell, Rickard Riswell, Bruce Riswell, his quarrelsome cousins and bannermen. Clay Kerwin, Lord of Kerwin, killed at Winterfell. Janelle, his sister, a maid of two and thirty. Leessa Flint, Lady of Widow's Watch. Andrew Locke, Lord of Old Castle, an old man. Hugo Wool, called Big Bucket, chief of his clan. Brandon Norrie, called the Norrie, chief of his clan. Tarn Little, called the Little, chief of his clan. The stark arms show a great dire wolf racing across a nice white field. The stark words are, Winter is coming. House Tully Lord Edmund Tully of River Run was one of the first of the river lords to swear fealty to Egan the Conqueror. King Egan rewarded him by raising House Tully to dominion over all the lands of the Trident. The Tully sigil is a leaping trout, silver, on a field of rippling blue and red. The Tully words are family, duty, honor. Edmure Tully, Lord of River Run, taken captive at his wedding and held prisoner by the Freys. Lady Roslyn of House Frey, Edmure's young bride. Lady Caitlin Stark, his sister, widow of Lord Edward Stark of Winterfell, slain at the Red Wedding. Lady Lysa Arryn, his sister, widow of Lord John Arryn of the Vale, pushed to her death from the Eyrie. Sir Brendan Tully, called the Blackfish, Edmure's uncle, Castellan of River Run. Lord Edmure's household at River Run. Maester Vyman, counsellor, healer, and tutor. Sir Desmond Grell, master at arms. Sir Robin Riger, captain of the guard. Long Lou, Elwood, Delp, guardsman. Othorides Wayne, steward of River Run. Edmure's bannermen, the lords of the Trident. Titus Blackwood, Lord of Raven Tree Hall. Lucas, his son, slain at the Red Wedding. Jonas Bracken, Lord of the Stone Hedge. Jason Malister, Lord of Seaguard, a prisoner in his own castle. Patrick, his son, imprisoned with his father. Sir Dennis Malister, Lord Jason's uncle, a man of the Night's Watch. Clement Piper, Lord of Pink Maiden Castle. His son and heir, Sir Mark Piper, taken captive at the Red Wedding. Carol Vance, Lord of Wayfarer's Rest. His elder daughter and heir, Leanne. His younger daughters, Rialta and Emphiria. Norbert Vance, the blind Lord of Atranta. His eldest son and heir, Sir Ronald Vance, called the Bad. His younger sons, Sir Hugo, Sir Ellery, Sir Kurth, and Maester John. Theomar Smallwood, Lord of Acorn Hall, his wife, Lady Ravella of House Swan, their daughter, Carellan. William Mooton, Lord of Maidenpool. Shella Hwent, dispossessed Lady of Harren Hall. Sir Willis Wode, a knight in her service. Sir Hammond Page, Lord Lyman Goodbrook. House Tyrell. The Tyrells rose to power as stewards to the kings of the Reach, though they claimed descent from Garth Greenhand, Gardner King of the First Men. When the last king of House Gardner was slain on the field of fire, his steward, Harlan Tyrell, surrendered High Garden to Aegon the Conqueror. Aegon granted him the castle and dominion over the Reach. Mace Tyrell declared his support for Renly Baratheon at the outset of the War of the Five Kings and gave him the hand of his daughter Marjorie. Upon Renly's death, Highgarden made alliance with House Lannister, and Marjorie was betrothed to King Joffrey. Mace Tyrell, Lord of Highgarden, Warden of the South, Defender of the Marches, and High Marshal of the Reach. His wife, 
Lady Allery, of House Hightower of Old Town, their children, Willis, their eldest son, heir to High Garden, Sir Garland, called the Gallant, their second son, newly raised to Lord of Brightwater, Garland's wife, Lady Leonette, of House Fossaway, Sir Loras, the Knight of Flowers, their youngest son, a sworn brother of the King's Guard, Marjorie, their daughter, twice wed and twice widowed, Marjorie's companions and ladies-in-waiting, her cousins, Mega, Alla, and Eleanor Tyrell, Eleanor's betrothed, Alan Ambrose, Squire, Lady Alison Bulwer, Lady Alice Graceford, Lady Tana Merriweather, Meredith Crane, called Mary, Septa Nesterica, her companions. Mace's widowed mother, Lady Olena of House Redwine, called the Queen of Thorns. Eric and Eric, her guardsmen, twins seven feet tall, called left and right. Mace's sisters, Lady Mina, wed to Paxter Redwine, Lord of the Arbor, their children, Sir Horace Redwine, twin to Haber, called Horror, Sir Haber Redwine, twin to Horace, called Slobber, Desmara Redwine, a maid of sixteen, Lady Jana, wed to Sir John Fossaway. Mace's uncles and cousins. Mace's uncle, Garth, called the Gross, Lord Seneschal of Highgarden. Garth's bastard sons, Garce and Garrett Flowers. Mace's uncle, Sir Morin, Lord Commander of the City Watch of Old Town. Morin's son, Sir Luther, married Lady Ellen Norridge. Luther's son, Sir Theodore, married Lady Leah Serry. Theodore's daughter, Eleanor, Theodore's son, Luther, a squire. Luther's son, Maester Medwick. Luther's daughter, Olene, married Sir Leo Blackbar. Morin's son, Leo, called Leo the Lazy, a novice at the Citadel of Old Town. Mace's uncle, Maester Gorman, served at the Citadel. Mace's cousin, Sir Quentin, died at Ashford. Quentin's son, Sir Olimer, married Lady Lysa Meadows, Olimer's sons, Raymond and Rickard, Olimer's daughter, Mega. Mace's cousin, Maester Normand, in service at Black Crown. Mace's cousin, Sir Victor, slain by the smiling knight of the Kingswood Brotherhood. Victor's daughter, Victoria, married Lord John Bulwer, died of a summer fever. Their daughter, Lady Alison Bulwer, eight. Victor's son, Sir Leo, married Lady Alice Beesbury. Leo's daughters, Alla and Leona. Leo's sons, Lionel, Lucas, and Laurent. Mace's household at High Garden. Mace de Lomis, counselor, healer, and tutor. Eigen Virwell, captain of the guard. Sir Vortimer Crane, master at arms. Butterbumps, fool and jester, hugely fat. His bannermen, the Lords of the Reach, Randall Tarley, Lord of Horn Hill, Paxter Redwine, Lord of the Arbor, Sir Horace and Sir Hubber, his twin sons, Lord Paxter's healer, Maester Balabar, Arwen Oakheart, Lady of Old Oak, Lady Arwen's youngest son, Sir Aris, a sworn brother of the Kingsguard, Mathis Rowan, Lord of Golden Grove, married Bethany of House Redwine. Leighton Hightower, voice of Old Town, Lord of the Port. Humphrey Hewitt, Lord of Oakenshield. Thalia Flowers, his bastard daughter. Osbert Serry, Lord of Southshield. Sir Talbert, his son and heir. Guther Grimm, Lord of Greyshield. Morabold Chester, Lord of Greenshield. Orton Merriweather, Lord of Longtable. Lady Tana, his wife, a woman of Mere. Russell, her son, a boy of eight. Lord Arthur Ambrose, married Lady Alison Hightower. His knights and sworn swords, Sir John Fossaway, of the Green Apple Fossaways, Sir Tanton Fossaway, of the Red Apple Fossaways. The Tyrell sigil is a golden rose on a grass-green field. Their words are, Growing strong.
Rebels and Rogues, Small Folk and Sworn Brothers. Lordlings, Wanderers, and Common Men. Sir Creighton Longbow and Sir Illifer the Penniless, Hedge Knights and Companions. Highbald, a merchant, fearful and niggardly. Sir Shadrick of the Shady Glen, called the Mad Mouse, a hedge knight in Highbald service. Brienne, the Maid of Tarth, also called Brienne the Beauty, a maiden on a quest. Lord Selwyn the Evenstar, Lord of Tarth, her father. Big Ben Bushy, Sir Hyle Hunt, Sir Mark Mullendore, Sir Edmund Ambrose, Sir Richard Farrow, Will the Stork, Sir Hugh Beesbury, Sir Raymond Nayland, Harry Sawyer, Sir Owen Inchfield, Robin Potter, her one-time suitors. Renfred Ricker, Lord of Duskendale, Sir Rufus Leake, a one-legged knight in his service, Castellan of the Dunfort at Duskendale, William Mooton, Lord of Maidenpool, Eleanor, his eldest daughter and heir, thirteen. Randall Tarley, Lord of Hornhill, commanding King Toman's forces along the Trident. Dickon, his son and heir, a young squire. Sir Hyle Hunt, sworn to the service of House Tarley. Sir Alan Hunt, Sir Hyle's cousin, likewise in Lord Randall's service. Dick Crabb, called Nimble Dick, a crab of Cracklaw Point. Eustace Brune, Lord of the Dire Den. Bennett Brune, the Knight of Brown Hollow, his cousin. Sir Roger Hogg, the Knight of Sow's Horn. Septon Maribald, a barefoot Septon, his dog, Dog. The elder brother of the Quiet Isle. Brother Narbert, Brother Gillam, Brother Ronnie, penitent brothers of the Quiet Isle. Sir Quincy Cox, the Knight of Salt Pans, an old man in his dotage. At the Old Crossroads Inn. Janie Hettle, called Long Janie, in keep, a tall young wench of eighteen years. Willow, her sister, stern with a spoon. Tansy, Pate, John Penny, Ben, orphans at the inn. Gendry, an apprentice, Smith, and bastard son of King Robert I, Baratheon, ignorant of his birth. At Harren Hall, Rafford, called Raff the Sweetling, Shitmouth, Dunson, men of the garrison, Ben Blackthumb, a smith and armorer, Pia, a serving wench, once pretty, Maester Julian, healer, tutor, and counsellor. At Darry, Lady Amari Frey, called Gatehouse Amy, an amorous young widow, betrothed to Lord Lancel Lannister, Lady Amari's mother, Lady Maria of House Darry, widowed wife of Merritt Frey, Lady Amari's sister, Marissa, a maid of thirteen, Sir Homwyn Plum, called Hardstone, commander of the garrison, Maester Ottomore, healer, tutor, and adviser. At the inn of the kneeling man, Sharna, the innkeep, a cook and midwife, her husband called husband, boy, an orphan of the war, hot pie, a baker's boy, now orphaned. Outlaws and broken men. Beric Dondarrion, once lord of Blackhaven, six times slain. Edric Dane, lord of Starfall, a boy of twelve, Lord Beric's squire. The mad huntsman of Stony Sept, his sometime ally. Greenbeard, a Tyroshi sellsword, his uncertain friend. Angate the archer, a bowman from the Dornish marches. Merritt, a moon town, Watty the miller, Swampy Meg, John and Nutton, outlaws in his band. Lady Stoneheart, a hooded woman, sometimes called Mother Mercy, the Silent Sister, and the Hangwoman. Lem, called Lem Lemon Cloak, a one-time soldier. Thoros of Mere, a red priest. Harwin, son of Holland, 
a Northman once in service to Lord Edward Stark of Winterfell. Jack be lucky, a wanted man, short an eye. Tom of Seven Streams, a singer of dubious report, called Tom Seven Strings and Tom of Sevens. Likely Luke, Notch, Mudge, Beardless Dick, Outlaws. Sandor Clegane, called the Hound, once King Joffrey's sworn shield, later a sworn brother of the King's Guard, last seen feverish and dying beside the trident. Vargo Hote, of the free city of Cohor, called the Goat, a sellsword captain of slobbery speech, slain at Harrenhal by Sir Gregor Clegane. His brave companions, also called the Bloody Mummers, Erswick, called Faithful, his lieutenant, Septon Ut, hanged by Lord Beric Dondarrion, Timion of Dorne, Fat Zolo, Rorge, Biter, Pig, Shagwell the Fool, Tog Joth of Ibn, Three Toes, scattered in running. At the Peach, a brothel in Stony Sept, Tansy, the red-haired proprietor, Alice, Cass, Lana, Jaisini, Helly, Bella, some of her peaches, at Acorn Hall, the seat of House Smallwood, Lady Ravella, formerly of House Swan, wife to Lord Theomar Smallwood. Here and there and elsewhere, Lord Lyman Lichester, an old man of wandering wit who once held Sir Maynard at the bridge, his young caretaker, Maester Rune, the ghost of High Heart, the Lady of the Leaves, the Septon at Sally Dance, the sworn brothers of the Night's Watch, John Snow, the bastard of Winterfell, 998th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, Ghost, his white direwolf, his steward, Edison Tollett, called Dolorous Ed, the men of Castle Black, Benjamin Stark, first ranger, long missing, presumed dead, Sir Winton Stout, an aged ranger, feeble of wit, Kedge White Eye, Bedwick, called Giant, Mather, Dywin, Garth Greyfeather, Ulmer of the King's Wood, Elron, Pipar, called Pipe, Gren, called Orox, Bernar, called Black Bernar, Godi, Timstone, Black Jack Bulwer, Jeff, called the Squirrel, Bearded Ben, Rangers. Bowen Marsh, Lord Steward. Three Finger Hob, Steward and Chief Cook. Donald Noy, One Armed Armor and Smith, slain at the gate by Mag the Mighty. Owen, called the Oaf. Tim Tangletongue, Molly, Cudgeon. Donald Hill, called Sweet Donald. Left Hand Lou, Jaren, Rick Whittlestick, Stewards. Othel Yarwick, first builder. Spareboot, Halder, Albet, Kegs, builders. Conway, Garen, wandering recruiters. Septon Celador, a drunken devout. Sir Alistair Thorne, former master at arms. Lord Janus Slint, former commander of the city watch of King's Landing, briefly Lord of Harrenhal. Maester Eamon, Targaryen, healer and counselor, a blind man, one hundred and two years old. Amon's steward, Clytus. Amon's steward, Samuel Tarley, fat and bookish. Iron Emmet, formerly of Eastwatch, master at arms. Harith, called Horse. The twins, Aaron and Emmerich, Satin, Hop Robin, recruits in training. The men of the Shadow Tower, Sir Dennis Malister, Commander, Shadow Tower, his steward and squire, Wallace Massey, Maester Mullen, healer and counselor, Corin Halfhand, chief ranger, slain by John Snow beyond the wall, brothers of Shadow Tower, Squire Dalbridge, Egan, rangers slain in the Skirling Pass, Stone Snake, a ranger. Lost a foot in scrolling pass. 
The men of East Watch by the Sea. Cotter Pike, Commander. Maester Harmune, Healer and Counselor. Old Tattersalt, Captain of the Blackbird. Sir Glendon Hewitt, Master at Arms. Brothers of East Watch, Darien, Steward and Singer. At Craster's Keep, the Betrayers. Dirk, who murdered Craster, his host. Olo Lophand, who slew his Lord Commander, Gior Mormont. Garth of Greenaway. Morney, Grubbs, Allen of Rosby, former Rangers. Clubfoot Carl, Orphan Oss, Muttering Bill, former Stewards. The Wildlings, or the Free Folk. Mance Raider, King Beyond the Wall, a captive at Castle Black. His wife, Dalla, died in childbirth. Their newborn son, born in battle, not yet named. Val, Dalla's younger sister, the wildling princess, a captive at Castle Black. Wildling chiefs and captains. Harma, called Dog's Head, slain beneath the wall. Halleck, her brother. The Lord of Bones, mocked his rattleshirt, a raider and leader of a warband, captive at Castle Black. Egrit, a young spearwife, John Snow's lover, killed during the attack on Castle Black. Rick, called Longspear, a member of his band. Ragwile, Lennel, members of his band. Steer, Magnar Fenn, slain attacking Castle Black. Sigorn, Steer's son, the new Magnar of Fenn. Tormund, Mead King of Ruddy Hall, called Giant's Bane. Tall Talker, Horn Blower, and Breaker of Ice. Also, Thunderfist, Husband of Bears, Speaker to Gods, and Father of Hosts. Tormund's sons, Toreg the Tall, Torward the Tame, Dormund, and Drin, his daughter Munda, the Weeper, a raider and leader of a war band, Alfin Crowkiller, a raider, slain by Corin Halfhand of the Night's Watch. Orel, called Orel the Eagle, a skin changer, slain by Jon Snow in the Skirling Pass. Magmar Tundoweg, called Mag the Mighty, a giant, slain by Donald Noy at the gate of Castle Black. Baramir, called Six Skins, a skin changer, master of three wolves, a shadow cat, and snow bear. Jarl, a young raider, Val's lover, killed in a fall from the wall. Grig the goat, Eric, Bodger, Dell, Big Boyle, Hemp and Dan, Hank the Helm, Len, Tofinger, Wandlings and Raiders. Craster, master of Craster's keep, slain by Dirk of the Night's Watch, a guest beneath his roof. Gilly, his daughter and wife, Gilly's newborn son, not yet named. Daya, Fernie, Nella, three of Craster's nineteen wives. Beyond the Narrow Sea The Queen Across the Water Daenerys Targaryen, the first of her name, Queen of Meereen, Queen of the Andals, and the Rhoynar, and the First Men, Lord of the Seven Kingdoms, Protector of the Realm, Khaleesi of the Great Grass Sea, called Daenerys Stormborn, the Unburnt, Mother of Dragons. Her dragons, Dogon, Viserion, Rhaegal. Her brother, Rhaegar, Prince of Dragonstone, slain by Robert Baratheon on the Trident. Rhaegar's daughter, Rhaenys, murdered during the sack of King's Landing. Rhaegar's son, Aegon, a babe in arms, murdered during the sack of King's Landing. Her brother, Viserys, the third of his name, called the Beggar King, crowned with molten gold. Her lord husband, Drogo, a cow of the Dothraki, died of a wound gone bad. Her stillborn son by Drogo, Rego, 
slain in the womb by the Magi Mary Mazdur. Her queen's guard, Sir Barristan Selmy, called Barristan the Bold, once Lord Commander of King Robert's King's Guard. Jogo, Co and Blood Rider, the Whip. Ago, Co and Blood Rider, the Bow. Rakharo, Co and Blood Rider, the Arak. Strong Belwas, eunuch and former fighting slave. Her captains and commanders, Dario Naharis, a flamboyant Taroshi sellsword, commanding the company of storm crows. Ben Plum, called Brown Ben, a mongrel sellsword, commanding the company of second sons. Grey Worm, a eunuch, commanding the unsullied, a company of eunuch infantry. Grolio of Pentos, formerly captain of the great Cog Sandulian, now an admiral without a fleet. Her handmaids, Iri and Jiqui, two Dothraki girls, sixteen. Missandei, a Nathi scribe and translator. Her known and suspected enemies, Grazdan Mo Eras, a nobleman of Yunkai, Kal Pono, once co to Kal Drogo, Kal Jaco, once co to Kal Drogo, Mago, his blood rider, the Undying of Karth, a band of warlocks, Piat Pri, a Quarthine warlock, the Sorrowful Men, a guild of Carthine assassins, Sir Jorah Mormont, formerly Lord of Bear Island, Miri Maz Dur, God's wife and Magi, a servant of the great shepherd of Lazar. Her uncertain allies, past and present, Saro Shoan Daxos, a merchant prince of Karth. Quayithi, a masked shadowbinder from Ashai. Illyrio Mopatis, a magister of the free city of Pentos, who brokered her marriage to Khal Drogo. Cleon the Great, butcher king of Astapor. Khal Moro, sometime ally of Khal Drogo. Rogoro, his son, and Kalaka. Kal Jomo, sometime ally of Kal Drogo. The Targaryens are the blood of the dragon, descended from the high lords of the ancient freehold of Valyria, the heritage marked by lilac, indigo, and violet eyes, and hair of silver gold. To preserve their blood and keep it pure, House Targaryen has oft wed brother to sister, cousin to cousin, uncle to niece. The founder of the dynasty, Aegon the Conqueror, took both his sisters to wife and fathered sons on each. The Targaryen banner is a three-headed dragon, red on black, the three heads representing Aegon and his sisters. The Targaryen words are fire and blood. In Bravos, Ferigo and Tarion, Sea Lord of Bravos, Caro Volentin, First Sword of Bravos, his protector. Belegary Authoris, called the Black Pearl, a courtesan descended from the pirate queen of the same name. The Veiled Lady, the Merling Queen, the Moonshadow, the Daughter of the Dusk, the Nightingale, the Poetess, famous courtesans. Ternesio Terris, merchant captain of the Titan's Daughter. Yorko and Denio, two of his sons. Morido Prestain, merchant captain of the Vixen. Lotho Lornell, a dealer in old books and scrolls. Azelino, a red priest, oft drunk. Septon Eustace, disgraced and defraught. Taro and Orbello, a pair of bravos. Blind Becco, a fishmonger. Brusco, a fishmonger, his daughters, Talia and Brea. Marilyn, called Mary, proprietor of the Happy Port, a brothel near the Ragman's Harbor. The sailor's wife, a whore at the Happy Port. Lana, her daughter, a young whore. Blushing Bethany, I know one eye, Asadora of Ibn, 
the horrors of the happy port. Red Rago, Ganoro Dothare, Gagano Dothare, a scribbler called Quill, Cosimo the Conjurer, patrons of the happy port. Taganaro, a dockside cut purse and thief. Caso, king of the seals, his trained seal. Little Narbo, his sometime partner. Miramello, Joss the Gloom, Quince, Alaquo Sloe, Mummers performing nightly on the ship. Savrone, a dockside whore of a murderous bent. The drunken daughter, a whore of uncertain temper. Canker Janie, a whore of uncertain sex. The kindly man and the waif, servants of the many-faced god at the house of black and white. Uma, the temple cook. The handsome man, the fat fellow, the lordling, the stern face, the squinter, and the starved man, secret servants of him of many faces. Arya, of House Stark, a girl with an iron coin, also known as Ari, Nan, Weasel, Squab, Salty, and Cat. Kuhuru Mo, of Tall Trees Town in the Summer Isles, master of the merchantman Cinnamon Wind. Kojja Mo, his daughter, the Red Archer. Shondo Doru, mate on the Cinnamon Wind. Acknowledgements This one was a bitch. My thanks and appreciation go out once again to those stalwart souls, my editors, Nita Toblib, Joy Chamberlain, Jane Johnson, and especially Anne Leslie Groel, for her counsel, her good humor, and her vast forbearance. Thanks also to my readers, for all their kind and supportive emails, and for their patience. A special tip of the helm to Lodi of the Three Fists, Pod the Devil Bunny, Trubla and Dadge the Trivial Kings, Sweet Caress of the Wall, Lannister the Squirrel Slayer, and the rest of the Brotherhood Without Banners, that half-mad drunken fellowship of brave knights and lovely ladies who throw the best parties at Worldcon year after year after year. And let me sound a fanfare, too, for Elio and Linda, who seem to know the Seven Kingdoms better than I do, and help me keep my continuity straight. Their Westeros website and concordance is a joy and a wonder." And thanks to Walter John Williams for guiding me across more salty seas, to Sage Walker for leeches and fevers and broken bones, to Patty Nagel for HTML and spinning shields and getting all my news up quickly, and to Melinda Snodgrass and Daniel Abraham for service that was truly above and beyond the call of duty. I get by with a little help from my friends. No words could suffice for Paris who has been there on the good days and the bad ones for every bloody page. All that needs be said is that I could not sing this song without her. End of A Feast for Crows, A Song of Ice and Fire, Book Four, by George R. R. Martin, G-E-O-R-G-E-R-R-M-A-R-T-I-N. Read by Ted Stoddard in the studios of Potomac Talking Book Services, Incorporated, for the Library of Congress, October 2006. Published by Bantam Books, Bantam Dell, a division of Random House, Incorporated, New York, New York. Further reproduction or distribution in other than a specialized format is prohibited. End of book.